President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? President, I table documents as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees to lodge proposals as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I will call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day No. 1, Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020, an associated bill, resumption of debate on the second reading and on the amendment moved by the Leader of the Opposition, Senator Wong. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to make a brief contribution on the debate about this bill because I consider the merits of this bill to be fairly self-evident. And I think that's been reflected so far in the debate around the chamber. And I want to place on the record my appreciation for the offer of bipartisan support that opposition senators have made for this bill. Uh, I think it is a very important signal that Australia sends at a time like this that we are all united on ensuring that, this, that the aims of this bill are reflected in our legislation. And that is that Australia's national interest will be set by Canberra on behalf of the nation and not to be undermined by any sub-national entity. What this bill does is what most Australians think is already the case. When they were told that it wasn't the case that Canberra had control over Australia's foreign relations and its external affairs, it came as a surprise to many of them. They think that it is just common sense that the government here in Canberra should be in charge of Australia's national, international relations, and they think it is bizarre that a state government, a territory government, a local council or indeed a university could in any way undermine Canberra's view of our national interest and detract from it. Of course, this bill does not seek to prevent international engagement by subnational entities in a way that it is harmless or indeed positive, as most of our international engagements are by state, territory, governments, local councils and universities. What it does ensure to do, that we do, though, is that the federal government is firstly at least aware of every instance of international engagement by these subnational entities. Second, that the federal government retains the power to veto any of those agreements that it believes is not in our national interests. And thirdly, that we have the opportunity to speak on the global stage with one voice. In the geopolitical environment that we are now operating in, that is more crucial than ever. And so it's vitally important that this parliament stand together this week, hopefully today, and send that message. Unfortunately, in recent years, our united international position has been undermined. It has been sadly undermined, in my view, by my home state of Victoria and the, and the Andrews government, which unwisely, which against advice, which in contradiction of his own party's platform at the federal level, signed up to the Belt and Road Agreement with the Chinese Communist Party. No other state, no other territory, no other leader in our country, Labor or Liberal, has sought to do that. In fact, they have all made clear that they would not to do so. And Despite the calls from many in this place on a bipartisan basis for the Andrews government to change direction on the BRI, they have refused to do so. And That is one of the reasons why this bill is necessary. If a state refuses to consult, refuses to see sense, refuses to consider our national interest, then they must be forced to do so. There has been one other group that has objected to their inclusion in this bill, and that is our higher education sector. And in particular, I want to draw attention to a remarkable contribution to the debate 
by Vicky Thompson, the head of the Group of Eight, our elite universities. Writing in an opinion piece for the Australian newspaper on the 12th of November, she said, Australia's leading research intensive universities, the Group of Eight, have been saying for months that national security threats are a lot like COVID-19. You can try and eliminate them and devastate your economy, or you can focus on the areas of greatest risk, suppress them and learn to live with it by quickly picking up weak points and putting a stop to them. Uh, essentially, what our elite universities are saying through Ms Thompson is that we should learn to live with foreign interference. We should tolerate a little bit of foreign interference, that it is an inappropriate public policy goal to seek to eliminate foreign, foreign interference in our democracy. There are, have been few other more powerful examples of exactly why this bill is necessary and exactly why our universities must be included in it than that. Sadly, many of our universities have demonstrated a lack of prudence in their international engagements and, in particular, their engagements with China. They have demonstrated an over-reliance on international students from China and they have demonstrated an inability to manage the financial, uh, reputational uh, and standards risks that it exposes them to. Uh, it is sadly necessary for the federal government to have oversight of those relationships, as has been clearly demonstrated. Uh, by the university's contribution to this debate. This was one of those very unfortunate, uh, what appeared to be pithy lines that you come up with as a lobbyist trying to influence public policy debate, an awkward analogy uh, that unfortunately reveals more than I think it intended to about the view of our universities. So to return to where I began, uh, the merits of this bill are self-evident. That's why I hope it will shortly pass this chamber with bipartisan support uh, from across the chamber. Uh, Australians agree that Australia's national interest should be set from Canberra, should be set by the federal government, and that there should be no capacity for any subnational entity to undermine it. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to contribute to the debate on Australia's Foreign Relations uh, Bill 2020. And I'm glad to be uh, presenting this bill because it's about time Australia stops taking its sovereignty for granted. Um, before I talk about the bill in particular, what I would like to talk about is how exactly we've got here and the history of what to me has happened in Australia uh, for the last 35 years where I feel like we've lost uh, control of our economic sovereignty uh, and to point out that you know, really this all came about thanks to the uh, neoliberal ideology of the Hawke-Keating government uh, and uh, some of the what I would call uh, quite bewildering decisions of the High Court of Australia, and in particular the Franklin Dam decision, that has given greater powers to uh, international treaties than our own state governments in regards to our natural resources. Now, you know, to me, that was the start of a slippery slope, this idea that uh, you know, uh, we should sign away our sovereign rights to a treaty, and by all means, I'm happy to sign up to some of these things uh, if it's going to facilitate uh, cooperation. But in terms of actually giving up our uh, sovereign uh, uh, rights over how we manage our resources, I have to say I, I totally disagree. And of course, you know, many many of those on the left look at Paul Keating as being the economic Jesus of Australia's um, economic success. Um, I would totally disagree with that. I would call him the economic Judas of uh, Australia's economy. And uh, the first uh, reckless thing that he did was allow foreign banks into this country. Um, in 1985, Australia had about $10 billion, or the, the four major banks had about $10 billion in foreign debt. By 2008, we had $800 billion in foreign debt. Now, nearly all of that credit was pumped into the housing markets in Sydney and Melbourne, uh, and that has inflated house prices to, in some places, 13 times average earnings. Um, and in the same year Paul Keating's uh, put those levers in to inflate house prices, he's also brought in a capital gains tax, uh, but then left housing out of it. So, of course, all the uber wealthy in Sydney and Melbourne have been making millions and millions and millions of dollars on housing gains and don't pay a cent in tax. Meanwhile, the workers, the battlers, who work hard for a living, have to start paying uh, income tax in today's dollars at least. I mean, it was a lot less than it used to be about an income tax threshold of around $5,000. It's been lifted up to $18,200. They start paying 19 cents on the dollar. Um, and 
So these things have basically diminished our productive capacity because you know, we've got an RBA that's allowed foreign banks to lend to domestic banks, to then lend to, how, to, you know, to the workers to pay heaps and heaps of money for a house even though they can't necessarily afford it. Um, but the uh, diminishment of our economic sovereignty didn't stop there. There was then the, the reckless button plan that basically uh, reduced tariffs without. And I'm not against, you know, I'm not in favour of tariffs either. But you've got to be realistic about what other countries are doing. There's no point us reducing tariffs if every other country in the world is still protecting their agriculture and manufacturing sector. So we've gone off on this neoliberal crusade, and you know, uh, you know that. All markets are efficient, and if we lower our uh, tariffs, we're going to become more productive. Well, no, we haven't actually become more productive. What we've done is we've destro destroyed the great manufacturing state of Victoria, uh, because all those manufacturing businesses that used to exist in Victoria have now basically been unable to compete with the rest of the world, because the rest of the world, they may have gone off fiscal tariffs, many of them would have boasted that they have, but they also then started using monetary tariffs through currency manipulation, and let me tell you that is rampant. Um, you know, they started money printing to keep their currencies down, which has given them a competitive advantage. And of course, while we all talk about fiscal tariffs and we're looking over here, in the background there's all these monetary tariffs that no one really talks about or understands. Um, and that, of course, was also facilitated by the Hawke County government. But while you know they've gone and destroyed our manufacturing base. They've then unleashed the beast, what we call the higher education sector, by the Dawkins plan in 1990. And of course, that's basically commoditised our children's future. We basically now it's all about making money for the sake of those uh, inner, inner urban elite academics who are now getting paid, you know, the chancellors are getting paid or vice chancellors over a million dollars a year. A million dollars a year uh, to basically teach a lot of neoliberal ideology. And I, I know, I can remember sitting in Abel Smith, the Abel Smith Lecture Theatre in 1988. Uh, a bloke by the name of Ted Hook was teaching me about efficient market hypothesis and how somehow, you know, by the time the news was announced on the stock market, the, the, the price, you know, that good news would be fully factored into the price. And I can remember thinking, hmm, that seems a lot like insider trading to me. It's not really what I'd call efficient because I don't see how, if, if, if you know, there's no leaking going on, the price would actually move at all to recognise that news. But this is the sort of stuff we're taught that all markets are efficient and that we just let the market rip. Uh, and everything's going to be OK. And I'm sure if you know, that was the case around the rest of the world, we let the market rip, that may be OK. But the reality is you need fair and efficient markets, and we need a level playing field. And of course, all, you know, we need, you know, and, and our role as governors, as politicians who represent the people, is to protect the people. Okay? And I happily stood up here in my maiden speech and came out of the closet and said I was a loud and proud protectionist. And I am a loud and proud protectionist, so I make no apologies for defending this great country country's great values, our children and our prosperity, and to make sure that our children get the same opportunities that our forefathers gave to us. And in order to do that, and we need to control our economy. And you cannot control our economy if you've merely got control of the taxation system, but you don't have any control of your monetary system or your infrastructure system. Which then brings me uh, to the next uh, point about that wonderful Hawke Keating government, is that they privatised everything. They privatised Qantas. C CSL and CBA. You know, so we sold CSL, or so we sold the Hawke Keating uh, government sold CSL for $200 million. We now pay the federal government, the taxpayer, pays $3.4 billion uh, for a nine-year contract, so almost $400 million a year, twice of what we sold it for 25 years ago, to get our blood cleaned by uh, when it gets donated to the Red Cross. Um, now that was all set up by the Australian government, paid for by the Australian people, and we just gave the rights to that away for next to nothing. And now we pay, you know, twice as much as that every year. Well, that was a great economic model, wasn't it? Really well done. And of course, we also privatised CBA. CBA was sold for eight billion. Um, that's about what it makes now. It certainly made more than that pre-COVID. I'm not sure it's going to come in that this year. Um, and of course, CBA has gone from uh, lending two-thirds business and one-third housing to lending about 70 per cent housing and about 30 per cent business. So when all those businesses are out there trying to look for cheap credit, uh, it's very hard to find cheap credit uh, compared to the housing market because it all goes into the housing market. So that's another example of how we've undermined our economic sovereignty. But perhaps the worst thing that was ever done—well, actually, the superannuation, and that's a whole other story because 
$600 billion of superannuation is invested offshore. Meanwhile, don't worry about investing in any infrastructure here. We'd rather, you know, well, those on the left over there would rather create jobs in other countries uh, by building infrastructure in other countries and investing in other foreign companies rather than using that $600 billion here to build infrastructure here. Uh, but the worst thing that was ever done by the hawke government was give independence to the RBA. And the idea was that by giving independence to the RBA, that they would be able to make decisions outside the political spectrum that they wouldn't sort of fall, fall for any populism or anything like that. Well, here we are, 25 years later, and interest rates are at 0.15 per cent. They're at 0.15 per cent. The RBA has destroyed the retiree, the incomes of retirees. They have got nowhere to go except to invest in a highly volatile stock market. Um, which they're supposed to believe you know, conforms to the efficient market hypothesis. Um, you know, it's amazing what these you know, ideologies will get away with and the dreams they peddle. Um, but uh, what's, what's so annoying about the RBA, because they've been treated with this reverence that they know what they're doing, that they know what they're doing. And of course, they haven't known what they're doing, because if they knew what they were doing, interest rates wouldn't be at 0.15%. You see, they've only ever used qualitative easing, i.e. manipulated interest rates, um, and this is the hypocrisy again, because we have supposedly live in a free market and everything, yet we've got a central bank that can change the price of money on the first Tuesday of every month. Right? Well, you know, I mean, if that's not socialism, totalitarianism, I don't know what is, because if you can control the price of money every month, you're basically changing the price of every other goods and service in the market. Um, so, you know, if that's not central planning 101, I don't know what is. But what they've totally neglected in all of this is actually using quantitative uh, easing as a constructive, productive tool. Now, the, the, the best example of where they'd been found wanting was with the Victoria's Belt uh, uh, Road Initiative, whereby, um, and it's not just mine, it's not just China, it's plenty of other countries here, other central banks have been investing in Australia's infrastructure. Right, so the RBA has sat there and allowed other central banks to print money, uh, lend it to their corporations or their quasi-semi-government corporations, and then those corporations come here and buy our infrastructure with money printed off their printing press. Their printing press. Now everyone stood by and gone, well, it's all free markets, but unfortunately we should have had capital controls there. Because all these other countries, and Japan's another one, you know, they, they've been printing since 89. And then they get this cheap money that they pay no interest on, and they come here and they buy our infrastructure. Another great example is the ECB. The ECB loves to issue corporate bonds uh, at negative yields. So they basically lend money to European corporations at a negative interest rate. So they say you don't even have to pay it back. And then those European corporations come out and they can buy assets anywhere in the world. Um, and they've been coming to Australia and we've been welcoming them with open arms. Um, and then we wonder why all of our domestic companies are closing down. Um, well, how can our domestic companies compete with foreign countries when those, uh, or, or, or companies when those co uh, companies don't have a cost of capital? They're given free capital. Okay, I mean, you want to talk about a free market? I don't believe in a free market. I believe in profitable markets um, so that our, our people uh, can earn an income, to have a roof over their head, some food on the table, um, and, and provide for their children. Um, but you know, these guys are coming into the country with free capital and they're buying up all our resources, and, and not just our resources, sorry, all of our infrastructure and many of our uh, manufacturing industries. Now, I remember great companies when I first started, when I first was at university, BTR, Nilex, uh, Adelaide Steamship, uh, Elders IXL, uh, with some of the few great Australian conglomerates that have basically gone the way of the dodo uh, because we've not been smart with our capital management. Uh, we've just opened the doors up to foreigners and said, come on in, you know, you guys, we won't look at what your central banks are doing and you can print all this money. And of course, I come back to the RBA here because these people should have understood monetary policy. I don't expect everyone in this chamber or the people out there to understand monetary policy. But they have been given the responsibility to control our currency. And they have failed abysmal, uh, uh, shockingly in, in doing that. Um, and what's worse is we don't have a national bank. And, and people often get confused between national banks and central banks. Central banks control the currency. National banks build infrastructure. And you know, as we come out of COVID, we've got to ask ourselves, how are we going to come out of COVID? People, you know, people I see on the street say to me, how are we going to come out of COVID? 
Well, we've got to go back to basics. If we ended up on a desert island, tell me this. Would you go to the bank? Would you go to a bank on a desert island? Don't think so. Or would you look to control the means of production? You would immediately look to control the means of production. You'd go and you'd want to find some water. You know, you'd go and look for some uh, food sources. Hopefully, you know, if you're on a desert island, there's some coconut trees or whatever, and you can maybe climb a tree and get. But you've got to feed yourself. You've got to be able to stand on your own two feet. And that's what true wealth is. That's what true economic sovereignty is. Is the ability to produce goods and services so that you can stand on your own two feet. And let's get real here. You know, Australia relies on a foreign military. We rely on foreign capital. We rely on foreign labour. We rely on foreign manufacturing. Uh, and it's about time we started to stand on our own two feet again. And in particular, we have to make sure our children can stand on their own two feet. It is much better to teach a man how to fish rather than feed him fish. And I've got to be honest, I think we've lost the art of the deal here. I'm not sure that I'll be honest here. I mean, my old man in many respects is much wealthier than me because you know, I know he, he knows how to run a farm. He is an ex-butcher. He can do some fencing and all that stuff. Well, I used to be able to do it, and I've sort of lost a touch after 30 years. But you know, the important thing is, is that we need to get our children back into those blue-collar trades. Um, we need to get control of our infrastructure, control of our agricultural land, so that we can make sure that our children get the same opportunities that our for forefathers gave to us. Um, so, with that in mind, uh, I'll just finish off to say that you know, it is important that all levels of government sink from the same hymn sheet when it comes to foreign affairs and trade. This legislation reaffirms Australia's constitution that the responsibility lays with the federal government uh, in regards to foreign affairs, and I'm glad that this bill is being put through. There is a uh, few matters more critical than a robust, coherent foreign policy that places our national interest at the fore and I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Thank you Senator Rennick. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to speak on Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020 and the related bill. This legislation is based upon the premise that Australia, at a Commonwealth level, should be responsible for foreign relations. Indeed, this is what our Constitution envisages. This is a reasonable and largely uncontroversial proposition and not one that Labor disagrees with. And in fact, as a reminder to those in the chamber, it is the Labor Party in its long and illustrious history that has always supported the Commonwealth having power, and certainly uh, to the placita of Section 51. Our, our foreign relations, the way in which we engage with our external partners and other countries, should be set from the top at a federal government level so as to put forward and pursue strategic policy, diplomatic and economic objectives, but also do this in a way that is true to our values as a nation. That is, the values of a Western liberal democratic nation. And despite recent forays onto social media from those uh, representing another country, we should be very proud of our history and very proud of what we stand for. Throughout the past 100 years and what has been a century of turmoil, Australia has been and remains one of a handful of nations to retain liberal democratic institutions without serious challenges from the left or from the right. Although we tend to think of Australia as a new country, we are in fact one of the oldest democracies in the world, a tradition of democratic, democratic government, government stretching back to the 1850s with state or then colonial level governments. We should be proud of our inheritance of Westminster institutions and traditions and not apologetic about them. And any attempt to strengthen these, as this bill does, should be welcomed. However, this is not entirely the case, and I will get to where the Labor Party um, has some uh, amendments uh, to the legislation. In the 20th century, the Liberal Democratic world won the major set pieces uh, one major set piece engagements, the two world wars and the Cold War, and it was Social Democrats who played a critical role here. But the period also saw constant relapses into authoritarianism. After the Soviet collapse, some writers in the West hailed these years as the end of history or the unipolar moment. This, commentators said, was the final triumph of the liberal democratic ideal. 
the number of functioning democracies rose rapidly, particularly in Latin America and East Asia, but also in Africa. It was only in other parts of the world, particularly in the Middle East, where there was seemed to be a sort of a, a veering towards authoritarianism. Sadly, this has not remained true. There has again been a tendency to retreat, retreat towards authoritarians and populism. The rise of belligerent, belligerently undemocratic powers, the rise of ethnic nationalism and protectionism, the decline in the leadership of the democracies, the need for cooperative global climate action, transnational criminality such as human trafficking, trafficking and undermining cyber security, and now the COVID-19 pandemic, are all placing unprecedented strain on the rules-based global order, which, for all its faults, has kept the peace and allowed seven decades of increasing prosperity for most, if not quite all, the people of the world. At this juncture, we badly need a global, global cooperation capable of rising to these challenges. And frankly, we need rules and guidance as to how we, as a nation, can speak with one voice when pursuing our international aims. This is why a foreign relations bill, which sets out to place the national government um, at the helm of this, is a good idea in principle. Australia is placed in the most dynamic region in the world, the Asia-Pacific. Asia in recent years, it has been home to many successful stories of democratic triumph. <clears throat> Since the 1990s, South Korea, Taiwan and Indonesia have established and successfully maintained stable and increasingly prosperous democracies. And I say that these are all independent countries. It would have been a bold prophet who predicted in 1990 that Indonesia would become the most successful democracy in the ASEAN grouping. But that is now the fact. Even Myanmar, after decades of enforced isolation under the Burmese way to socialism, has shown it can hold successful democratic elections, although the army there still retains effective control. The experience of these countries shows entrenched authoritarian systems can evolve without revolution or civil war into stable, prosperous, liberal democracies. And we can only hope, Deputy President, that that becomes the way of all countries in the Indo-Pacific and in Asia. Unfortunately, it isn't uniform. The most consequent, consequential strategic and economic question that Australia and the world will have to deal with in the coming years is how to maintain normalised relations with a rising and assertive China. And this is important when, discuss when discussing what we are here to consider today. This legislation, from its drafting to how it has been discussed in the media, by the public and in this place, has often been framed around protecting Australia's democratic and private institutions from political influence by, and let's be frank, by the Chinese Communist Party. No longer can China be seen through the prism of a benign actor more interested in its domestic matters. China is a great power and entitled to the respect that goes with great power status. I want to see a strong, stable, united, prosperous and peaceful China with a natural sphere of influence that should be resolving regional problems and not stoking them. But there is a broad consensus in Australian politics that the recent expansionist and irredentist tendencies in Chinese foreign policy must be confronted, along with serious human rights abuses within its borders. Not to do so would be an affront to our own values. And I believe, Madam Deputy President, that where there are human rights abuses, no matter where they occur, we are all the poorer, we are all the worse for those human rights abuses. While, yes, some in the public space could better moderate their language so as not to deliberately stoke tensions, the deterioration in China's relations with the West, including with Australia, is largely the CCP's neo-Stalinist domestic policies and a belligerent and hegemonic behaviour in the international arena, particularly in our immediate region. An expert in international law and a former DFAT official, Malcolm Jorgensen, has noted that China's rhetorical def deference to international law masks a more subversive consequence of its actions, redrawing the boundaries between law and politics in a way that overturns foundational parts of the global order from within. He goes on to say that it is equally clear, however, that advocates for the rules-based order must take more seriously 
their own appeals to the foundational authority of international law. Seemingly, legalistic challenges will ultimately transform into political challenges to a more secure and normatively desirable world. Yes, our mutual beneficial bilateral relationship with China has always been predicated on the assumption that it would be a rational player in the field of trade, would abide by the rules set down by the World Trade Organization, and would act in the interests of the growth and prosperity of all in an increasingly interconnected region. That assumption held good to a large extent until the reformist rule of Deng Xiaoping and his successors Jing Zhenmiao and Hu Jintao. But China, under the leadership of Xi Jinping, has shown a willingness to use trade, investment, tourism, foreign aid and diaspora communities as weapons in its drive to establish a regional hegemony in the Asia-Pacific and challenge the liberal democratic world order. But when addressing any of these legitimate concerns, we must reject arguments which can be construed as xenophobic and racist, and we have to con combat these evils wherever they may lurk, because they are evil. Doing this in a way which is not seen as an attack on the Chinese people or on China's legitimate national interests will not be easy, but is a necessary discipline. I want to see. Sorry, I'll just... Under successive Labor governments, we've promoted three vital pillars of Australian foreign policy. One, support for the Western Alliance, and in particular our alliance with the United States. Two, engagement with the countries of our region, most obviously China and Indonesia and three, support the United Nations multilateral system. Throughout the committee's inquiry, we heard from many witnesses, both as to the need for the legislation and as, as to how this legislation would achieve its stated aims. And there were a variety of views on that. Now, my colleagues, Senator Wong and Senator Ayres, yesterday evening in their second reading speeches, went into detail of both the committee process and the amendments that Labor will be moving in order to uh, improve the stated aims of this legislation. I just want to add a few, address a few concerns we had. It's Labor's view that the legislation should form part of the suite of existing legislation and guidelines that work to safeguard Australia's sovereignty. This would build domestic institutional resilience and regulate international engagement, including foreign investment legislation to countering foreign interference legislation, defence export controls, the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act, the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme and the University's Foreign Interference Task Force. There is no doubt that more needs to be done in this regard. But in recent days we have seen an assertive Chinese Communist Party become more than assertive and one might say even aggressive. On a platform ironically not allowed in his own country, and that is Twitter, a spokesperson of the CCP put out a fake photograph. The week before, there was a list of 14 grievances. To try to comply with those 14 grievances would offend all of the pillars of a democracy. It would offend the free, the, our right to a free press, a, our rule of law, the rights of minorities, freedom of association, and frankly, it would also offend the right to disagree with your government and the right to have an alternate view. Australia is a wonderful country and should be looked at as an exemplar in our region, not as, some, not as a country that is being attacked. Thank you. Senator Hanson. Mr Acting Deputy Chair, let me say One Nation supports this bill, but I have a few things to say. For decades, I've warned that the policies of both Labor and the Coalition have left Australia dangerously exposed to the whims of a hostile, communist Chinese government. <clears throat> I would encourage every Australian to look carefully at the origin of everything you buy now. Please try hard to buy Australian-made and produced. Think carefully about buying products made in China. I support the intent of the legislation proposed by the government, but really the government needs to put its own backyard in order first. The government wants to have a narrow debate about foreign relationships by confining the debate to agreements made by the states, territories, local government and universities. I want a broader debate. Foreign relationships are also about trade and foreign investment. We cannot talk about foreign relationships without also talking about trade and foreign investment. The government hopes that this bill will distract me from its own agreements with other countries, but we cannot ignore what is happening today with our relationship with China. 
China's position of my way or the highway leaves us with a free trade agreement with China which is not worth the paper it is written on. Under this agreement, Chinese interests can spend over a billion dollars in a single transaction without the government testing whether Chinese control of those assets or businesses is in the national interest. It has always been open to the federal government to recognise an Australian asset or business as being in the category of national security. This recognition would trigger the national interest test for sales from the first dollar, but the government didn't want to upset China. History instructs us that appeasement never works. While the government is looking at everyone else, it can look at agreements made by federal agencies. They can start with the strategic partnership agreement with the Shanghai Institute of Applied Physics, signed by the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation in 2019. What is the justification for jointly working with the Chinese government on future energy sources, materials under extreme conditions and accelerator science when nuclear power reactors are prohibited under Australian law? The government needs to look at a host of issues related to China, including sustained cyber attacks on Australia. Are we so desperate for Chinese money that we want to graduate the students attempting to blackmail university lecturers to pass those who would otherwise fail? Is it not possible to talk about relationships with foreign countries without also talking about trade relationships and investment by those same foreign countries and their citizens in Australia? Let's look at our trading relationship with China. China takes 40 per cent of our exports. We have no market other than China for 30 per cent of Australia's exports and no alternative market for 20 per cent of Australia's imports. We are hopelessly dependent on China. We all experienced that dependence when personal protective equipment or PPE was not available. Australia has had a golden trading period with China, but it seems it has come to an end. It has been reported a dossier reporting grievances was handed over by the Chinese Embassy in Canberra to news outlets. The purpose of this exercise was to pressure the Morrison government to reverse Australia's position on key policies such as academic visa cancellations, calling for an independent inquiry into COVID-19, banning Huawei from the 5G network and blocking 10 Chinese foreign investment deals. The consequence of these grievances is that several categories of Australian commodities have been subject to rejection. The decision to delay and then reject 21 tonnes of live Australian lobsters was an act of bastardry because they died on the hot tarmac of a Chinese airport. This year, the Chinese government has directed power stations and steel mills to stop using Australian coal and ports have been directed to stop unloading coal from 80 bulk carriers with a billion dollars of Australian coal on board. Almost every week brings news of another commodity subject to a new tariff or placed on a blacklist. China wants to damage our economy. The blacklisting of Australian commodities, including barley, beef, coal, wine and lobsters, means private businesses are being punished to send a message to the Australian government to stop saying and doing things the Chinese government does not like. There is an easy way to get back the goodwill of China. We simply have to say sorry and then change our policies to make them consistent with China's foreign policy. We have been warned to keep out of the South China Sea dispute despite Beijing being found in contravention of international law by building artificial islands within waters claimed by its neighbours. We can regain some favour with China if we stop participating in freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. Putting so many trading eggs in the China basket was always a risk because China has a long history of import and export restrictions as a means of gaining compliance with its foreign policy. While we have played our part in making China become the factory to the world, we have allowed our manufacturing, our own manufacturing industries to decline as a matter of policy for both um, major parties. It's a stain on both parties that we have not invested in manufacturing in Australia and provided globally competitive electricity prices. Instead of encouraging manufacturing jobs in this country, the government and Labor have subsidised foreign-owned wind and solar companies which produce an intermittent electricity which is no use to manufacturing that requires power 24 hours a day. 
Once manufacturing accounted for 40 per cent of the Australian economy—40 per cent—but today it is 6 per cent. When long supply chains are disrupted, the just-in-time approach leaves Australia without essential goods. Countries with more manufacturing capacity than Australia were able to manage better through the COVID pandemic because they were able to change production from producing A to producing B. The Australian government has few options today because it has failed comprehensively to understand the way China thinks about itself. This brings me to the connection between trade and foreign investment in, in China. It is common ground that China has been our largest trading partner. We have sold more in dollar terms to China than they have sold to us. Our recent prosperity has largely been due to China buying iron ore, coal, natural gas and high-quality protein foods. In practice, our economic reliance on China means that we have been unable to say no to foreign investment from China, including massive investment in residential homes in our major cities. In the past decade or more, Australia has been the second largest recipient of Chinese investment, second only to the United States. The problem with Chinese ownership of Australian assets is that Chinese companies borrow from the communist state and consequently every loan forms part of China's political and economic strategy. When China or any foreign country buys our assets and businesses for political military purposes, we should think carefully whether it is also in Australia's interests. Still, the third-term Liberal government has actively approved or passively consent to 99.9 per cent of all Chinese investments in Australia. The view that all foreign investment in Australia is good is the mindset of dinosaurs. The world has changed. Today, foreign investment can be used to hide another purpose. The sale of the Darwin port is one such case. China provides no reciprocal arrangements in terms of foreign investment. A long list of industries is off lim limits to foreign investment in China, as well as specific provinces and whole cities. In the limited areas where Australians can invest in China, the Australian investor must be, as a majority, a minority shareholder. The Chinese think we are stupid for allowing them to buy up in Australia when Australians cannot buy up in the same way in China. Public servants who advise government on, in Treasury and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade have let Australians down because the current trade war with China was foreseeable and therefore preventable. To put it plainly, our public servants are not up to the task of advising the government. They tell me they can do a, do a trace and source the billions of dollars of Chinese investment in Australia so they are confident the money is not borrowed by Chinese state banks. What a load of rubbish. China is the largest owner of food producing land in Queensland. Unlike Treasury officials, China understands they're not making land anymore and has been investing in Australian agribusinesses and food producing land. Prior to the arrival of the Chinese virus COVID-19, the dollar thresholds were so high that few sales of Australian businesses were tested against the national interest test. After representation from me, the government reduced the dollar thresholds to zero for the COVID period to prevent foreigners buying distressed Australian assets. With one permanent member of the Foreign Investment Review Board, or FERB, and a few part-time members, foreign buyers can be assured of cursory consideration before approval is rubber-stamped on their file by the FERB. In the past decade, less than a handful of proposed sales have been rejected out of 10,000. The Security of Critical Infrastructure 2018 legislation details categories of Australian assets and businesses already in foreign hands, including electricity assets, pipelines and ports like the Darwin Port, Brisbane Port, Melbourne Port, Newcastle Port, the largest coal port in the world. This legislation, like the legislation in the government pipeline, is all too little and too late. The ownership of our water entitlements by foreign countries should set off the smoke alarm in every household. The Liberals are wrong to believe that assets bought by foreigners cannot leave Australia. Has the government done the water maths? Because I have. With 20 per cent of our water in foreign hands and migration increasing our population at the rate of a million people a year every four years, <coughs> there must come a tipping point when our own food security is at risk. In 2015, we signed the free trade agreement with China. We have kept our promises. China has not. 
Just days ago, a tariff of up to 200 per cent on wine was imposed, making exports of Australian wine to China uneconomic and leaving some companies in deep trouble. The government now says it will take China to the World Trade Organisation, but any remedy will take years and years. It is virtue signalling at best, meaning it makes the government look like it's doing something without doing something. They have been spending too much time learning from Labor and the Greens. Australians are fed up with the decisions of elites and politicians managing our foreign affairs. The 2020 Lowry Institute poll found nine out of ten Australians, or 94 per cent of the participants, want the Australian government to find other markets to reduce our economic dependence on China. Is anyone in the government listening to the Australian people? Clearly, our foreign policy and our foreign investment regime is not working for us in relationship to China. Simply listing the reasons would take another speech. Every time Australian assets or businesses are sold to a foreign company, foreign pension fund or multinational company, there is a real danger the tax base of this country will be eroded and the tax burden fall to the individual Australian workers. The Van Diemen's Land Company, with 25 dairies and 18,000 dairy cows, was sold to a Chinese businessman. 100 per cent of the money was borrowed, and none of the conditions of the sale have been met since 2016, and yet the government has not acted to enforce the conditions of sale or issue a disposal notice. In fact, Treasury officials could not remember a single disposal notice being issued since the introduction of the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Act of 1975. This is not surprising because the Treasury does not follow up to see if the conditions of approval are met. Does anyone wonder why I am so, I am so frustrated with the government? The government lacks a spine to do what is right for Australia. Well, where to from here? We need to permanently lower dollar value thresholds to trigger review of proposed foreign ownership. We need an independent authority to make decisions which approve the acquisition and control of Australian assets and businesses. Perhaps they can find some people with experience in business who have lived some of their life outside the Canberra bubble. Reforming the foreign investment regime is going to take a new mindset by government. It is going to mean policy makers and government needs to step up out of the past and face the new reality of China. China uses trade and foreign investment to advance its foreign policy. We can never just talk about foreign relations without also talking about trade and foreign investment. In the interest of reform of the foreign investment regime, I propose an amendment to the Australia's Foreign Relations, State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020, which would see the benefits to Australia's test. Replace the contrary to the national test in the Foreign Investment Takeovers Act of 1975. China is a non-market economy. They have been open and consistent about their use of trade and investment to further their political and economic aims. There is nothing wrong with that. It all goes wrong when we have weak politicians and poor advice from the public servants who think they can have their own cake and eat it too with China. Senator Griff. The Deputy President. On the face of this, this it, this bill attempts to do something sensible. It seeks to give the federal government oversight of foreign arrangements made by state and territory governments, as well as those made by local governments and public universities, to ensure they do not contradict Australia's foreign policy or infringe on the national interest. Frankly, I am not surprised the government has done this after its criticism of Victoria for signing an agreement under China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is well understood to be China's soft diplomacy approach at buying influence in the region, and also given the ongoing concern over the Darwin Ports Agreement. Most Australians would agree that we need to be able to run a yardstick over foreign agreements because we need to protect Australia's interests. However, this bill is incredibly unbalanced. It doesn't give the Commonwealth the final say over foreign investments and arrangements. It gives it the only say. It gives the minister broad powers to approve or veto foreign arrangements both before they are made and at any time after they are made. State and territory governments will be prohibited from either negotiating or entering core arrangements with foreign governments unless they notify the minister first. The minister has 30 days in which to grant or deny approval, and if no decision is made in that time, 
this can be taken as approval to proceed. However, approvals can also be revoked later. And the Minister is under no obligation whatsoever at any time to provide reasons for any decision. Non-core arrangements, which are those made with uh, provincial governments or state-controlled foreign universities, for instance, will be subjected to a notification scheme. This will capture arrangements made by LGAs and public universities. The Minister must be notified of non-core arrangements in writing and must be provided with a copy of the proposed deal. The Minister must then make a declaration about whether or not this non-core arrangement can proceed or whether it must be varied or terminated. The difference here is that the Minister's approval is not required at the outset, as with core arrangements. But this still does not provide the certainty that state and territory entities need to make arrangements with confidence. Clause 5.2 of the Bill states that the foreign policy guiding the Minister's decisions does not have to be written or publicly available, or have been formulated, decided upon or even approved by any particular member or body of the Commonwealth. It could be a finger in the air, a vibe, whatever the minister likes. But unfortunately, this provides no guidance to people trying to negotiate foreign agreements, however innocuous they may be. What can they rely on if there's nothing on the public record? Clause 58 of the Bill states that the Minister is not required to observe any requirements of procedural fairness. Not required to observe any requirements of procedural fairness. So hence there is no requirement for the Minister to provide reasons for his or her decision. The fallout from all of this was summed up neatly by constitutional expert Professor George Williams, who told the inquiry, and I quote, it means that an agreement may be overturned, but the parties will have no idea why. They won't know whether they can make a new agreement, if it is just one term in the agreement. If it was many terms, they will be left uncertain as to how to respond." End of quote. According to the explanatory memorandum, excluding procedural fairness recognises that the provision of reasons itself could adversely affect Australia's foreign relations, especially to the extent that the decision may disclose Australians, Australia's foreign policy or position in relation to particular issues, which may disadvantage Australia's position in international forums or negotiations. Now, I understand why the government would need to keep its cards close to its chest. I appreciate that the approvals process will ensure state and territories and their entities undertake due diligence before embracing foreign arrangements. But it is still not clear why the Commonwealth needs to take this blanket approach, an approach that allows it to keep its options open while undermining the ability of states and territories to act quickly and surely. Why isn't there a process for engagement and discussion? How will states know what to avoid when the bill doesn't provide for any consultation? And why can't the minister at least specify what aspects of arrangements are problematic or provide reasons on a confidential basis? The Commonwealth has all the power in this Act, and the states and territories have very little right of reply, little certainty and practically no guidance. But they don't have the courtesy of an explanation because the minister is under no obligation to provide one. States and territories which submitted to the inquiry all agreed with the broader intent of the bill, but they raised concerns about their ability to proceed with certainty. Even parts of the bill designed to make the process administratively simple, such as the 30-day approvals turnaround for core arrangements, is problematic, as there's no fast-track process for urgent matters and no exemptions whatsoever for low-risk arrangements. The arrangements states and territories negotiate cover a range of areas – trade, education, tourism and research collaboration, for example – and they are not always a result of formal or premeditated processes. 
Many of the arrangements are a result of ministerial visits, trade missions, and even as the Tasmanian government submissions put it, chance meetings at marketing events. They are often negotiated in a matter of days or weeks and not months. New South Wales gave the example of a 2017 trade mission to Japan in which an MOU on teacher and student exchange was renegotiated and renewed in five days. It also negotiated a technology cooperation partnership with India in 2018 during a three-day visit. The Northern Territory government submission to the inquiry said that the bill deprives states and territories of the agility and procedural certainty they require to successfully negotiate international arrangements. It recommended a shorter and more active approval process for low-risk, high-value foreign investments. And I think this is very much a fair recommendation, given that the minister can subsequently overturn agreements that don't meet Australia's foreign policy objectives. The minister has indicated that the only exempt arrangements will be those that deal with an emergency while that emergency is happening or that deal with minor administrative logistics such as accommodation arrangements or conference states. Universities have also raised a number of concerns, including the significant uncertainty created by the Minister's ability to revisit and vary arrangements in the future, regardless of earlier decisions. They say it could deter international partners from making collaborative arrangements or funding commitments. The Scrutiny of Bills Committee also expressed concern over what it called the unfettered discretionary power of the Minister, especially as it is coupled with the lack of procedural fairness of merits review and the limitation of judicial review. We do note that the Government has amended the bill to provide definitional clarity of institutional autonomy for foreign universities and to ensure a review of the Act in three years to establish what improvements can be made. But these amendments do not go to the heart of the concerns raised by many submitters. And they don't address all of the recommendations put to it by even the government-led Senate inquiry. For instance, the government has not acted on the Senate report's recommendation to include hospitals in the bill, to ensure arrangements are not made with foreign research hospitals engaged in unethical genetic or medical practices or organ harvesting. The government agreed with this principle, or agreed with this in principle, but said this would be considered in a legislative review. Senator Alliance supports the intent of this bill, but agrees with many submitters that it is heavy handed. We commend Labor and the Greens for their amendments, which seek to put some balance into the bill. We don't agree with all of the proposed amendments, including the blanket exemption for universities, as they are an obvious target for foreign interference. However, I indicate we will support those amendments that seek to redress some of the imbalances in the bill so that state and territory stakeholders can operate with more certainty and fairness when they seek to make foreign arrangements in their interests. Senator Muller. President. I rise to speak today to support the passage into law of Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bill, uh, both a welcome and necessary step to ensuring Australia's sovereignty into the future. I have spoken here before about the importance of sovereignty. It is an old-fashioned word, but it is still relevant. To me, sovereignty is the ability to act in our own interests as a nation. It means that the Australian people as a collective are the ultimate authority about what is good for Australia. So when individual states, either via their government or institutions like their universities, start making arrangements that affect the interests of all Australians, we have a problem. I was disappointed by the trite political hacks taken by the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate regarding this bill. Senator Wong, we know you are far better than this. You must realise that this bill shows that the Morrison government is indeed taking responsibility for Australia's foreign relations. The bill does exactly what you, Senator Wong, say is so important. This bill takes control by saying that we need to act as a nation. 
We need to present a unified front. We need to stop those who would try to divide us. We need to block those who use seemingly innocuous agreements to exploit our openness so they can steal, incite, manipulate. The only way to do this is for the Commonwealth Government to carefully consider the implications of all international agreements proposed by the Australian government. Proposed by Australian governments, I should say. Only the Commonwealth Government can identify the national interest and use its experts to advise the Minister about the concordance of each prospective agreement with our national interests. This bill provides an important plank in our government's broad-based efforts to protect Australia's sovereignty. Control of foreign policy is vital. It's a core Commonwealth responsibility enumerated in section 51 of the Constitution. Commonwealth leadership provides consistency. It provides an assessment of Australian interests using information and perspectives that institutions like local universities or state government bodies simply do not have. Yet, to my, amaze, to my amazement, Labor cannot see a public policy rationale for this bill. I say maintaining coherence in our foreign policy is an imperative and so a rationale. If you want to know why this bill is needed, look no further than this. This legislation will also shine sunlight on the agreements made with foreign countries. We know for a fact that the Andrews government uh, uh, BRI agreement, Belt and Road Initiative agreement, was negotiated in secret. They did not want expert advice or national interests intruding on their plans. As uh, we also know, I should say, we also know that the BRI uh, can be the Chinese Communist Party's way to interfere with their partners, apply economic coercion, coercion and give advantages to Chinese companies, as Senator Griff said, buying influence. These are aspects of the overall BRI picture that the Victorian government either did not realise or they knew and thought they could outsmart the Chinese Communist Party. Either way, the Victorian BRI agreement highlights exactly why this bill before us today is necessary. We cannot accept the Victorian government's assurance that they will consider the national interest before committing to any activity. I say simply they cannot possibly do that because there is no way that the Victorian government understands the national interest. The Victorian government does not and cannot speak for all of us. I cannot be anything but appalled by the Greens' excuse for opposing this bill. In their view, the universities are too busy to do due diligence on these agreements. So in the curious green logic, we should not be making them inform the Commonwealth before they start negotiations. The Greens will just let these ill-equipped universities go on making agreements and excuse them of any need to actually consider the implications of their actions. There's Mr Acting Deputy President. Theirs is a parallel university. No, I should say theirs is a parallel universe. Let universities run free with things they don't understand. Two particular comments by those from this side of the House are worth reinforcing before we conclude this debate. My friend Senator Van from Victoria spoke about the need to maintain public confidence in our international relationships. He is spot on. I think the public would rightfully ask why we are not doing this already, given their expectation that Australia would have a consistent and interest-focused foreign <coughs> policy. The remarks by Senator Ferravanti-Wells was also particularly perceptive. We cannot follow business as usual in this changed world. The Defence Strategic Update, launched on 1 July this year, clearly explains how the strategic environment has deteriorated more rapidly than anyone expected. The Indo-Pacific region is now the centre of strategic competition. While we don't want this, it is happening and we must prepare. We need to make changes to the way we operate, uh, not only in defence—and this bill addresses just one. 
Not only in defence do we need to do this, but across all sectors of the economy and across the nation. We need to prepare ourselves to meet challenges to our interests in whatever shape they come and through whatever vector they may follow. Countering foreign interference is just as important as physical defence when it comes to maintaining our sovereignty. That's why we need this bill. So I give this bill and the amendments proposed by the government my wholehearted support. I also hope that it shows us all the importance of having a coordinated strategic approach to protecting and promoting our sovereignty. As one last note, this approach should be articulated through a national security strategy. Such a strategy would explain our goals and ways to coordinate activities like this and explain this bill in context. It would provide benchmarks for success. It would help guide and explain how the measures proposed in this legislation will act in concert with others to promote Australia's future. Mr Acting Deputy President, I support this bill. Thank you, Senator Molan. Uh, Minister, we do have two second reading amendments to deal with. But, uh, Minister, you have a call. Can I do my summing up speech? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. And let me begin by thanking those senators who have uh, contributed to the debate on Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020 for their contributions to this important debate. Mr Acting Deputy President, the government recognises that internationally Australia's strength is greatest when we are united, consistent and speaking with one voice. This is the purpose that this bill serves. The bill will assist in ensuring a consistent approach to Australia's international relations and help to ensure that Australia is able to speak with one voice internationally. The bill reflects the Commonwealth Government's fundamental role in conducting Australia's foreign relations, negotiating treaties and representing our nation internationally. Importantly, in terms of uh, addressing the question of speaking with one voice, as governments, particularly internationally, it remedies a gap in our existing system by implementing a formalised method by which states and territories must consult with the Commonwealth on their arrangements with foreign governments. The mechanisms set out in the legislation will protect our national interests and address the consistency of our foreign policy across all levels of Australian governments. Mr Acting Deputy President, this bill is the next step in a number of measures the government has taken forward in recent years to protect our national security and our sovereignty. These measures are complementary, but they cover different issues. For example, the Foreign Investment Review Board regime, the FERB, regulates significant foreign investments to ensure they are in the national interest. FERB reforms announced earlier this year will strengthen this regime with a new test addressing national security concerns arising from individual investment proposals which would otherwise be below screening thresholds. It is this regime that applies to the acquisition or leasing of critical infrastructure such as ports. Separately, the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme FITS, is designed to provide the public with visibility of the nature and extent of foreign influence on Australia's government and politics. Individuals acting on behalf of foreign governments are therefore not dealt with under this bill. Those matters are covered by the FITS. Further, the investigation of foreign interference against Australia and our democratic institutions is also dealt with under our foreign interference and espionage laws, passed indeed with cross-parliamentary support in 2018. The coalition government has also made decisions and, take and uh, implemented reforms to protect our telecommunications sector and cyber security. These reforms together protect Australia's interests in relation to issues that this bill is not intended to cover. This bill is not intended to regulate purely commercial arrangements by corporations, even where a corporation is wholly or partly state-owned. Arrangements by or with corporations are only within scope where they are entered into pursuant to a foreign arrangement with a state or territory entity, and if the minister has deemed that arrangement is likely to be or is inconsistent with Australia's foreign policy, or is likely to or adversely affects our foreign relations. Corporate arrangements are also in scope if entered into pursuant to a state or territory arrangement with a foreign government that was not notified to the minister. 
While each piece of legislation addresses distinct processes, these reforms taken together demonstrate the government's very clear and strong commitment to protecting and preserving Australia's interests and our liberal democratic values. I thank the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee for their review of the bill and their recommendations. The government has made amendments to the bill to define when foreign universities do not have institutional autonomy and to require a statutory review of the legislation after three years of operation uh, in response to a number of the committee's recommendations. The rules allow the government to respond to changing circumstances without the need to amend the Act, to minimise regulatory impact where necessary, including by exempting arrangements less likely to impact on foreign policy. The draft rules to be made under the bill have been published on the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade's website. These rules exempt core foreign arrangements which solely deal with the sharing of information or resources for the management of a declared emergency in Australia, foreign arrangements that deal solely with minor administrative or logistical matters, and minor variations of foreign arrangements that do not alter the substance of the arrangement. Mr Acting Deputy President, I acknowledge the significant contribution that states, territories, local government and universities make to Australia's international engagement, including through arrangements with foreign governments. The bill does not seek to prevent these arrangements, nor does it seek to interfere in state and territories' business. What it does do is to put in place a robust, proportionate process to assist states and territories in undertaking effective, appropriate and informed international engagement with foreign governments, so that everyone can be confident that the arrangements they take forward are consistent with Australia's foreign policy. The vast majority of arrangements will remain unaffected by this bill because they will be consistent with our foreign policy and in Australia's national interest. However, if an arrangement is inconsistent with Australia's foreign policy or adverse to our foreign relations, then it is our view that it should not proceed. Only the Commonwealth is empowered to make these judgments. The bill, through the public register, will allow greater visibility of these judgments and will enable states, territories, local governments and universities to work in partnership with the Commonwealth when they engage internationally. Following the bill's introduction, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has conducted consultations with more than 60 stakeholders, including representatives from state and territory governments, local governments and Australian public universities. Prime Minister, the Minister for Education and I have also each engaged with stakeholders in respect of the bill. Detailed fact sheets for stakeholders have been published on the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade website. The government has also established and funded a foreign arrangements task force in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. That task force will work closely with stakeholders on the implementation of the bill, including to ensure its efficient and effective administration. Mr Acting Deputy President, I commend the bill to the Senate, and I recall that this is fundamentally about engagement and collaboration with due diligence. It is vital that the Commonwealth has oversight of arrangements concluded at all levels of Australian government with all foreign countries. Thank you, Minister. Senators, we have two second reading amendments. Uh, Senator Wong, I understand you have already moved the amendment on sheet 125. So the question is that the amendment moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. Point Senator Ciccone, tell if the ayes. Senator Davey, tell if the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 34. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Rice, I understand you foreshadowed a second reading amendment, so I just ask you to move that. Senator Rice. Move my second reading amendment that's been distributed in the chamber as on sheet 1111. So the question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Oh, oh sorry, Senator Wong um, is seeking the call. Leave? Um, yes, you need to seek leave to speak, Senator Wong. This was well. It was not moved when I was um, on my feet, and obviously the minister's closed debate. So I'd appreciate if I, I could seek leave to make a very short statement. Is leave is granted, um, Senator Wong. Thank you. The the substance of this amendment deals in. Um, uh, to some extent, with, a, with some of the concerns that we have raised in our second reading amendment, but of course uh, the difference is the Greens amendment is operative and it would essentially close the second reading debate. Um, we are of the view we want the opportunity to seek to have the committee stage to seek to amend the legislation. And whilst we have concerns uh, which I detailed and other senators detailed uh, in the second reading debate about the way in which this bill was rushed the failure to consult uh, and the demonstrable failure by the government and the minister to engage with the entities covered by it. Uh, the principle that is behind the bill is one that Labor supports. So for that reason, we are um, not minded to support the Green Second Reading Amendment, which would effectively uh, dispose of the legislation. I appreciate that. Thank you. So I'll now put the amendment moved by Senator Rice. Um, those in support of that second reading amendment say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. I'll ask senators to take their seats for the division. The question is that the second reading amendment of Senator Rice be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt Teller for the ayes, Senator Ciccone Teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 46. The matter is resolved in the negative. I'll now put the question that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I'll call the clerk and ask for a temporary chair to take the chair for Australia's the committee stage. Foreign Relations, State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020. Australia's Foreign Relations, State and Territory Arrangements Consequential Amendments Bill 2020. Can I ask senators who are not participating in the committee stage to please uh, leave the chamber or resume your seats quietly? Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Wong. Thank you. Um, how do I address you? You're, we're in committee, but you're sitting there. Chair? Chair will be fine. <laughs> Acting chair or just chair? <laughs> chair will do. Uh, I have a question to the minister. It's one that I've been asking for some time, and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade were going to ask, answer it, but then uh, they went away and they came back and they started to talk about iterative processes, which is always a pretty clear indication that uh, they don't want to answer a question. So I'm now going to ask the minister. When were Australian universities added to the bill? Thank you, um, Senator Wong. I don't have that uh, detail with me today. No, I don't have that detail with me today. Uh, but as uh, the uh, indications I have made in my uh, in my uh, summing up speech, there have been uh, discussions with universities uh, through this process, including a uh, meeting Minister Tian and I had with uh, universities uh, uh, in the break between sitting weeks. Uh, and uh, the consultations that the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has had regularly. I have dates of those consultations, um, I think, in, uh, in my notes here, uh, but they go through uh, the period of time um, since the, uh, the bill um, was uh, introduced. And, of course, I have to confirm and advise, Mr Acting Deputy sorry, Chair, uh, that uh, the uh, inclusion of universities in the bill uh, in one way or another was uh, a matter that was always in contemplation. Senator Wong. Well, uh, with respect, Minister, that's simply not true. And if you if you speak to well, it isn't. If you speak, if you well, uh, well, you can interject from back there, but you weren't in the committee, and you weren't you weren't at estimates. Well, and the reality Wong, is, Senator the reality Wong, is, please ignore the interjections. Well, you know, how about you tell her not to interject as well as telling me to ignore it? That would at least be even-handed, yeah. I make this point that it is not true to say they were always in contemplation unless the government simply thinks that blindsiding, uh, refusing to talk to stakeholders is appropriate. Universities of Australia have said they were blindsided. They, did, they didn't receive information that they did, were not told they were in the bill. Uh, they didn't receive a copy of the bill. They found out in the announcement. So I find it hard to accept the minister's assertion that they were always in contemplation. That is simply at odds with the evidence uh, that the Senate committee um, heard, but also, importantly, uh, at the Senate estimates. I'd also make this point. I, I actually think there is a meritorious argument uh, to include uh, universities. Uh, I uh, think that the way in which this was done lacked the sort of engagement which you would want if you're actually serious about enhancing the nation's resilience. I mean, resilience to foreign interference, resilience to the sorts of challenges Australia faces is not simply uh, engendered uh, by a veto power that rests in a minister. It's also engaging with the entities, with you know, institutions that are important to our democracy, whether it's parliamentarians, the parliament, uh, the university sector about what they both should and should not do in order uh, to safeguard our sovereignty. So there's a, you know, a positive as well as a negative uh, responsibility on government, not just veto, but actually helping people do the right thing in the first place. Now, that was the logic behind the university's foreign interference task force. That is the process in which they were engaged. And then they end up in legislation uh, which they had no um, foresight of which they had no consultation around. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I think that really does undermine the minister's assertion to this chamber that they were always in contemplation. 
If she's telling the truth there, why didn't she tell them? Order. <coughs> Senator Wong. If she's Senator accurate, Wong, what would you like me to say? Point of order. Accurate would be a yeah, better sure. Word. If she's accurate there, if she's if her assertion is accurate, uh, why do, why didn't she tell them? Well, surely you'd actually engage with our fourth largest uh, export industry uh, and institutions which are important to our democracy. They're about uh, they're not just about you know professional training. They're about ideas. Uh, and, they, you know, and research. Surely we would engage with them. The government would engage with them. So I, I think, you know, why didn't the minister engage with them personally um, uh, before announcing that they'd be covered by this legislation? Is the question, Minister? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And uh, I think the expectation, given that Australian public universities are. Uh, publicly funded institutions established by state and territory law with a fundamental role in international research and partnerships is that they would be included. They enter arrangements with foreign entities that do have the potential to affect Australia's foreign relations uh, and foreign policy. But uh, as has been said uh, in discussions, uh, including those that I have had and Minister Tian has had, we do expect the majority of routine engagement between Australian universities and their foreign counterparts to continue, notwithstanding the requirements of the bill, to notify the minister of uh, certain arrangements, as um, we have said uh, previously, uh, uh, Chair. And importantly, I think I want to reassure those opposite and those in the chamber that the bill is not intended to impede the beneficial business of universities with their foreign counterparts. Let me reinforce that it is expected that much of the routine business of universities will proceed as normal. Senator Ayres. Senator Wong's question carefully, um, but I, I don't accept uh, that the level of care and attention to the inclusion of the university sector is uh, as the, the way that the minister has characterised it. Um, the evidence provided to the committee and the evidence provided during the estimates process clearly sets out that the university sector was never consulted uh, during the process of the bill being established. Now, the Australian university sector is a critical national institution. Uh, our university sector is perhaps more important to us as a country than university sectors in other comparable countries overseas. It's critical uh, because it's our third or fourth, depending on the year, largest exporter. Our export effectively of education services to people around the world is of enormous material benefit uh, to Australia. But it also has enormous soft power and soft diplomacy potential, uh, a potential that has never been taken seriously by this government. Uh, the, the potential to have thousands of people who have had a good experience in Australia, of their education in Australia, in a liberal democracy, uh, in institutions that value teaching and learning, to spend the rest of their professional careers in countries all over the globe, uh, in countries that Australia hopes to have a good relationship with as advocates for Australia, uh, as people who have relationships, deep relationships with Australians in the public service and in business. Uh, and, Chair, we have squandered that capacity. Uh, and we have squandered that soft diplomacy capacity no more than at any other time than we have over the course of the last 12 months. Universities are profoundly important uh, as a country that occupies a big continent with a growing population uh, that is reliant upon for its future prosperity and security. Uh, our universities are fundamental as the places where innovation and research, product development, the development of ideas, the development of ways of managing our economy more effectively and more efficiently, uh, ways of developing, making sure that when we improve the economy it lifts the living circumstances of every Australian and the strength and resilience of our democracy, universities are deeply important. 
but there is a profound hostility on behalf of some members of the coalition to the university sector. And you may shake your head, Minister, but at every opportunity, some of these characters are out there denigrating our universities, driving a completely hostile and wholly negative government approach to the university sector. How else could you explain what has happened to the university sector this year that's culminated in this zero consultation bill that seeks to regulate the operations of the universities in terms of their research work with overseas institutions? The beginning of the year, when the coronavirus pandemic implications for Australia became clear, the Prime Minister's message to foreign students was go home. It was go home. Not we're going to look after you, not we're going to support you, uh, not we're going to include you in the government's package to make sure that you are looked after and that you've got some decent access to work. The message was go home. And when I walk through the inner suburbs of Sydney, I'm fortunate enough to live in a university district sandwiched between the University of Sydney and the University of Technology Sydney. And what I saw in my suburbs was two things that should never have been seen. Furniture tossed out on the street as overseas students were pushed out of rental accommodation. And I saw food queues. Food queues in Australia for overseas students. Now, how, how could this be? Because our contract as a country uh, is not uh, educating young people in Australia is not just a commercial transaction. It should be if we've got an eye to our soft diplomacy and relationship issues with other countries. It should be a solemn contract between us and the parents of those young people that we will look after your kids. Can you imagine if you'd sent your kids to an overseas jurisdiction and that was the treatment that was meted out to them? Well, that's what happened in terms of the coronavirus and the university sector, and it's done untold damage to the capacity of the sector to be able to market its services around the world. We saw a botched and mismanaged approach to university fees with an, with an absurd set of propositions. Absurd set of propositions you'd think the party of the free market would be on top of. If you make it more expensive to do, or sorry, if you make it cheaper to do the courses that you want people to do and deliver the income, less income, to the, to the people who deliver the courses that you say you want students to do, well, guess what that means? Cut classes, less tutors, less resources, bleeding universities dry and bleeding the very parts of the universities that you say, because of some misplaced hostility that some of the creatures on the coalition backbench have to the liberal arts uh, and to uh, some of the courses that are pursued. I know some of them probably turned up to their first tutorial and got talked over uh, by somebody who had actually done the reading that week. There's a bitter humiliation for them. I understand there's a hostility to the arts and a series of these important things. Uh, and so that was the second wave of hostile change. Now we've got this. No package for the universities in terms of coronavirus. Terrible message sent to uh, overseas students. Terrible message sent to people in the sector. And now we've got this zero consultation. Now I agree with Senator Wong. There is absolutely room for more improvement, effective regulation of the university sector, because universities are global institutions. They require for effective research, whether it's sequencing the coronavirus genome, developing the Gardasil vaccine, whatever that work is, 
That requires global collaboration. And in many cases, it will require collaboration with universities uh, in the People's Republic of China. That is no excuse for zero consultation with the university sector, because that sends a message not that the Commonwealth is here to help, here to enable more institutional resilience, here to support academics and university administrations to make sure that they get their engagement right, that there is probity, that there is a regard for the national interest, that there is transparency. Uh, none of those things have happened. The message instead is a punitive one. It's about a veto, not a process, and it completely flies in the face of all of the other efforts that the government has made. Uh, to improve the resilience and the effectiveness. So my question is, does the minister support more or less collaboration between Australian universities and overseas universities? Does the minister believe that the amount of collaboration, research collaboration between Australian universities and overseas universities will increase or decrease uh, as a result of the legislation? And how will that, over the coming 12 months, two years and three years, with the review provisions of the proposed legislation, how will that work be supported and evaluated? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, um, Chair. And uh, uh, Senator Ears has uh, um, waxed uh, widely. Uh, on uh, matters uh, of uh, education policy, but to be very specific about, uh, about this bill, I want to be clear and to repeat that the bill is not intended to impede the beneficial business of universities with their foreign counterparts, which is strongly valued by this government uh, and, uh, as indicated by uh, in fact, a number of the examples that the senator has referred to, particularly in relation to, uh, to vaccine development. Indeed, it's expected that much of the routine business of universities will proceed as normal. Not all the university-to-university -university arrangements will be within scope. The bill addresses only certain arrangements between Australian public universities and foreign universities that are an agency or department of a foreign government, for example, a military university that does not have institutional auto autonomy. And in addition to that, uh, the Foreign Minister uh, will make rules that exempt arrangements that deal solely with uh, minor administrative or logistical matters uh, and variations to arrangements uh, that don't alter the substance of the arrangement. So what the bill does is to categorise arrangements that are in scope into two tiers uh, to ensure the less burdensome uh, notification process applies to arrangements that have less potential to impact Australia's foreign policy. Uh, and for that reason, uh, Chair, the universities are subject to the notification scheme and may proceed with foreign arrangements without specifically awaiting the minister's approval, enabling them to get on with the sort of business that, uh, in part, in his uh, wide-ranging comments, uh, Senator Ayres referred to. Uh, Senator Rice, I think, was uh, on her feet first. Thanks, Chair. Um, Minister, I've been listening very carefully to your comments and your speech so far today, where you talk of having a collaborative approach, that this is not intended to impede the work of universities, that it will only affect things that are within scope. What I want to ask is when are the universities going to know whether things are within scope or not? Because the way that this legislation is currently drafted, Essentially, it talks about arrangements, and the definition of arrangements in the, in the bill is any written arrangement, agreement, contract, understanding or undertaking, essentially. The universities at this stage they don't know which of their arrangements are going to be, in your words, within scope. What they can see is that there's going to be this massive regulatory burden of them having to report on every um, arrangement, every agreement, every um, agreement that they have with any foreign university or any foreign um, agency of a government um, without knowing whether it is, to use your words, in scope. 
You talked before also of that there would be things exempted. So can you also tell me what is your intention at the moment? As what is the definition of things? What do you intend to exempt? And we've got the universities, I understand, um, according to the legislation, they've got to report on all of their arrangements within six months. Is that six months going to start when they know, you know what is exempt, what is within scope? Or when are they going to know? Minister. Thank you, um, uh, Chair. Um, Senator Rice, as has been uh, discussed and as was, uh, uh, as I understand it, discussed, uh, in the context of, uh, of the committee hearings, um, the uh, arrangements which uh, are not in scope that I referred to in relation to the rules, so exempt arrangements, be those that deal with minor administrative or logistical matters, for example, um, travel visa applications, accommodation, the submission of paperwork, timing of conferences or conference sessions. Uh, and variations to arrangements that don't alter the substance uh, of the arrangement. Uh, part of the process, Senator, will be using the task force uh, established within the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and, uh, and established for this purpose to work with uh, state and uh, territory governments and, uh, and their uh, respective uh, and local governments, their respective uh, agencies, uh, universities as well, uh, to uh, inform, as this process uh, gets underway, the six-month period uh, during which universities will be required to bring forward those, uh, those arrangements that they have with universities which fall within the definition. Um, uh, Senator, uh, those which don't have institutional autonomy. So I think it is important to remind ourselves that we are not talking about every arrangement that a university has with another university. It is arrangements that universities have with universities that don't enjoy institutional autonomy. And so those are the discussions which we have been having, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Minister for Education and myself, uh, through this process with universities. Senator Rice. Follow-up question from that: You talk about minor logistical arrangements, you know, the timing of of workshops, conferences. Um, how about if the, if it was, you know, a change of who was going to be appearing at a conference, which researchers were going to be at, you know, at a at a workshop or a conference that was being organised by these universities jointly? Senator Patterson. Th thank you, Chair. I just want to rise to make a brief contribution on this discussion about universities' involvement uh, in this bill. And I note, listening carefully to the contributions made by Labor senators, but both Senator Wong and Senator Ayres noted that they agreed that universities should be included in this agreement. And I think that's an important bipartisan consensus, which uh, recognises Senator that. Senator Patterson, can you resume your seat? Senator uh, Patrick, um, Senator point Rice, of order. Yeah, just Senator Rice asked a question, and I, I would have thought it would uh, be. Uh, appropriate to get a response before. That's Senator not a point of order, Senator Patrick. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Chair. And I would have thought, given his long experience in this chamber, Senator Patrick would know that any senator has a right to stand up to contribute to the committee debate. But nonetheless, um, there is bipartisan consensus across the chamber that universities should be included in this bill, and that is an important thing, which I think is in recognition of the fact that universities have not always prudently managed their international relations. Indeed, there is a bipartisan uh, agreement that the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security should be inducting, conducting an inquiry right now into foreign interference at our universities, which stems out of widespread concerns held by senators from across the chamber uh, about incidents at a number of our universities, to take one example, the University of Queensland, uh, who have acknowledged themselves that the agreement that they struck with Hanban over their Confucius Institute initially did not have sufficient safeguards for academic freedom and autonomy of the university, and they themselves have set about renegotiating that agreement to include those better protections. That is one of many examples that we could go into that demonstrate why universities do indeed, indeed need to be included in this bill. The disagreement that appears to exist across the chamber is about the extent of consultation about this issue. And in my short time in this place, I've observed that there's a lot of disagreement about what constitutes consultation. And sometimes when people say a group was not adequately consulted, what they really mean is a group has not, had, has not consented to their involvement in this bill, has not been given a veto power about their involvement in this bill, has not been uh, given the right to dictate whether they should be involved in that bill or not. 
Whereas in this case, Senators, whereas in this case, Senator Senators. Wong, thank you. I'll take your interjection. Thank you, Senator Wong. I'll take your interjection. Whereas in this case, what occurred is that universities were appropriately informed of their inclusion in this bill. Were then, in, 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 and thank you, Senator Wong. I, it's interesting that you think that universities should have privileged access to government policy announcements before they are made. Before they are made. Thank you, Senator Wong. And indeed, they were told that they were included, as they should be, and then had the opportunity to have their input both directly to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade about the provisions of the bill, and indeed through a Senate inquiry of, of the very committee uh, that this Senate has formed to consider the bill. So the universities have been consulted. They didn't have privileged access to a government announcement before it was made, as indeed I think is appropriate. Uh, and as the minister observed, as publicly funded institutions established under state and territory legislation, it would be absurd if they were not included in this bill, which I think is a point of agreement across the chamber. Senator Rice. Thank you, Chair. Can I again ask the minister? Um, my question was regarding: Okay, we are going to not include minor administrative arrangements. When a university is going to know, you know what falls into that category, um, and with, would something like a change of um, personnel on a workshop or a conference would that have to be notified? Minister, thank you very much, uh, Senator Rice. And the DFAT website has been um, updated with information that is. Meant, uh, which is intended on assisting stakeholders to understand their compliance obligations. That currently includes fact sheets. It will soon include uh, Q&A documents uh, subject to the passage of the legislation. It will also include information such as on the means for notifying the minister uh, of arrangements, further to that which is already on the website. And we will be working very closely with stakeholders on the implementation of the scheme. That is the purpose of establishing the Foreign Relations Task Force within the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. It's the purpose of the uh, engagements, um, Senator, that uh, DFAT has had uh, with uh, the um, sector. Uh, with the sector in uh, the consultations and discussions uh, on the provisions uh, of the bill. Um, and what we are doing is making sure that the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is working very closely with uh, those key uh, entities, both the representative bodies and the universities themselves, to ensure the smoothest uh, introduction of the scheme uh, as we possibly can, Senator. Senator Kitching. Could I ask just about the Port of Darwin? Is the leasing for 99 years of the Port of Darwin to a Chinese company against Australia's national interest? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Senator, um, Chair and Senator. Uh, that matter has, of course, been ventilated uh, regularly since the decision was taken, uh, if I recall correctly, in, uh, in 2015. And what this government has done is to ensure that we have uh, implemented uh, legislative provisions that now enable government to address those sorts of, uh, of issues and to consider them appropriately in the context of foreign relations, foreign policy, the Foreign Investment Review Board uh, as well, Senator. Uh, and I think uh, a retrospective looking glass uh, is not a uh, piece of, uh, of kit that uh, I have in my repertoire, uh, Senator. I don't know about you. Uh, but uh, these things obviously are subject to uh, circumstances at the time and considered by governments uh, at the time. If such a proposition was to be put to government now, Senator, most importantly what I will say is that this government has in place legislation which allows government to address it. Senator Kitching. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Could I ask the Minister to guarantee that if that deal or that agreement was to take place today, it would be captured by this legislation. Minister. Uh, Senator, as I have said in relation to other similar questions which have been asked um, publicly in discussions on this issue, and I will repeat in the chamber, uh, I actually don't think it's appropriate to preempt um, the implementation of this legislation and then the processes which will be required of the foreign minister to examine um, such issues under it. Uh, I'm not privy to, uh, for example, the, uh, the details of such an arrangement, such a commercial agreement between the Northern Territory government uh, and the, uh, the business concerned. 
Uh, I would expect that a responsible approach to uh, a matter such as this and others which have also been asked of me would be to ensure that in the uh, st uh, stock take process, uh, as the uh, Commonwealth Government receives from state and territory governments uh, in this case, uh, advice of those arrangements into which they have entered and the details of those are provided, the context in which they are provided, uh, then that enables the Foreign Minister, whoever he or she is at the time, to make those decisions. But preempting that uh, consideration is, I think, inappropriate. Senator Patrick, I'll just firstly comment on um, uh, on my remarks in relation to Senator Patterson. Um, I wasn't seeking to stop or prevent him from raising a particular issue. I just note that uh, normally in the committee stage we work together, allow a question to be asked and then answered, uh, and we give everyone a fair shot. I know that this is not a usual process for a government backbencher to appear in the committee stage. Normally that's a, a signal of filibustering, but uh, um, so it wasn't a, uh, in any way seeking to fetter you from uh, making a contribution, but just uh, the orderly manner in which we normally conduct this. Um, the, um, uh, I note there's, there's very little time here, so I'll just foreshadow to the minister uh, when I come back. I'm, there is a concern I have in relation to lack of judicial review in respect of this bill, and so uh, perhaps uh, uh, after question time, when we get finally get back to dealing with this bill, uh, I'll just foreshadow that I, I I note that the judicial review is is prohibited through the consequential bill in respect of the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act, but of course can't restrict uh, can't restrict uh, a constitutional writ being brought up brought against the minister. So. Um, I will be interested after uh, the conclusion, uh, after we reconvene, in understanding the different thresholds in uh, associated with uh, a constitutional writ appeal versus a, uh, a, an appeal under the uh, Judicial Re Review Act. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Chair. Um, what did, could I ask the Minister what advice were you given during the drafting of the legislation in relation to the Port of Darwin? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. I'm not going to comment on the specific advice uh, on a matter such as that which was provided to me uh, as the Minister in the drafting process. The drafting process is a very long and uh, complex one. Uh, it has considered uh, a broad range of implications uh, of the Act. Uh, and uh, Clearly, uh, the Port of Darwin, uh, in and of itself, per se, that agreement, a commercial arrangement, is one which would now be covered by the Foreign Investment Review Board. That is a reform that this government has introduced, a commitment that this government made to address those concerns, uh, and one which is an important part, as I said in my, uh, in my uh, summing up speech, of uh, the government's initiatives to protect our national security uh, and to, uh, to protect Australia's Minister, interests. It being two o'clock, the committee will report progress. Thank you, Senator Brown. It being 2 p.m., we will go to questions without notice, and I call Senator Gallagher. Oh God, I nearly had a heart. To the minister representing the Minister for Government and Services, Senator Rushton. In question time yesterday, the minister claimed that, and I quote, "As soon as we became aware that the method of debt collection was not valid, the Morrison government quote." immediately ceased the robo-debt scheme. When did the government first become aware that the Hon. Scott Morrison's robo-debt scheme was not valid? The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Gallagher. Um, I'll have to take on notice the exact dates so that I can give you the exact dates. Well, Senator, I'll take the interjection from Senator Wong. Senator Wong, um, that I, I do not keep my diary with me. However, I can, t I can stand by the comments. You are asking me for a specific date. That date uh, I, I will take on notice and I will provide that date to the chamber of, uh, of the exact date that I became aware that the method by which we were uh, determining uh, debts through the income compliance program was not valid. I think Senator Rustin's concluded her answer. Um, Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and my uh, supplementary is: On what date did the government first seek legal advice 
On what date was the government first advised robo-debt was not valid? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I, I'm assuming they're two separate questions in relation to legal advice and the date at which we were advised that income compliance um, and uh, uh, income matching uh, was not a valid means by, by which uh, by which, and I will stand by uh, the assurance that I gave to the chamber, and I have taken on notice the exact date, and I will provide back that back to the chamber at my soonest convenience. In relation to, well, as soon as I have, as soon as I have had the opportunity, Senator Wong, as soon as I have the opportunity to find the exact date, I was not asked yesterday for the exact date. Uh, I would also like to put on the record, despite those interjecting opposite, in relation to legal advice. As is the normal practice, um, Senator Gallagher, the practice that you undertook when you were in government, um, we do not provide advice in relation to legal advice. It is a long-standing practice of this chamber and the other chamber of successive governments. Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. The question did not go to the content. It went to the date on which legal advice was sought. Um, I think the minister was, has the minister concluded her answer. There was only there was three seconds remaining. She has. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Rustin claims the government was, and I quote, very, very quick and responsive. When the government stubbornly persisted with the program in spite of 76 warnings from the AAT between 2017 and 2019 and losing hundreds of appeals, why should Australians believe this minister? Senator Rustin. Well, thank you, thank you very much, and I stand by the comments that I made yesterday, Senator to Gallagher, and, and I said I'll provide you with that advice. And once again, I would point out, as I did yesterday, each and every case that goes before the AAT is a unique case. Some of those cases found in one direction, some of the cases found uh, an alternative outcome. So to come in here and suggest that, that the outcomes of an AAT form the basis of legal advice to government, I think, is a misrepresentation of what the AAT process actually does. But uh, as I said yesterday, um, as soon as I, the government was aware that income compliance was uh, the program was not collecting or determining its debts on a valid basis, which was income matching, we acted very quickly, and I stand by that. We acted very quickly to cease that program and put in place a program to enable the repayment of those debts. Order. Before I come to you, Senator Antich, I'd just like to acknowledge in. Order. Before we move to the next question, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge members of the ADF Parliamentary Exchange Program who are joining us in the Senate Gallery today. Uh, welcome to Parliament House, and I hope you find your experience here valuable on behalf of the Senate. <laughs> Senator Antich. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting small and medium businesses to keep apprentices in training through the economic impacts of COVID-19 and how the government is delivering on these commitments to ensure Australia has the skilled workforce it needs to build a stronger and more secure post-pandemic Australia? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Antic for his question. And as Senator Antic knows, the Prime Minister has made it very clear. Australia's economic recovery from COVID-19 will be a skills-led recovery. And that is why, as a government, we have put vocational education and training at the forefront of our economic agenda. Order. And in fact, Mr. President, this year alone, this year alone, we will invest almost seven billion dollars in vocational education and training. That's right, almost seven billion dollars. Mr. President, when COVID-19 first impacted us earlier this year, the government understood that trainees and apprentices they are the first to go in an economic downturn, and we needed to put in place the policies to ensure that employers, and in particular our small businesses, were able to keep their apprentices and trainees on the job where we need them. And we did this through our supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy. It commenced in April this year and it runs through until March next year. And Senator Rantic, as at the 27th of November 2020, the wage subsidy has now assisted 
56,000 businesses, 98 per cent, Mr President, of which are small businesses in Australia, to keep now over 103,000 apprentices and trainees on the job, and we do this by covering 50 per cent of their wages. Mr President, this now includes over 20,000 bricklayers they have been kept on the job because of the wage subsidy. 15,000 electricians kept on the job because of the wage subsidy. 10,000 plumbers kept on the job because of the wage subsidy. 5,000 hairdressers again kept on the job because of the wage subsidy. And 8,000 automotive mechanics and electricians. And for those from rural and regional Australia, over 35,000 of the apprentices and trainees and over 20,500 small and medium businesses Order. have utilised the wage subsidy. Cash. Time for the answers expired. Order. Order. Senator Antich, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how will the government's job trainer fund build on this success to support out-of-work Australians to undertake training, fuel skills shortages and find employment following the economic in impacts of COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, access to free or low-cost training in areas of skills demand is so important as Australians in our economy recover from the impacts of COVID-19. And that's why, as you know, the government has partnered with the states and territories, all of the states and territories. The Commonwealth Government has put half a billion dollars on the table, and the states and territories have matched this funding with another half a billion dollars, and we have the $1 billion job trainer fund. As you know, all states and territories, in fact, now including your home state of Victoria, have signed on to the Job Trainer Fund. The fund itself, once up and running, will provide around over 300,000 additional training places. And in fact, in six jurisdictions, Senator Keneally, it is now live. In six jurisdictions, it's now live with over 263 thousand additional training places they are already available and on the market free or low cost training in areas of actual Order. demand senator antich a final supplementary question minister as we emerge from the economic impacts of covid-19 how will the government's job maker budget build on the record of skills reform and support new apprentices into training senator cash Mr President, as I noted in my first answer, we put in place the Supporting Apprentices and Trainees wage subsidy because we recognise that small businesses in particular impacted COVID-19, needed assistance to keep the apprentices and trainees they had in training on the job. But we also recognise as a government that we need to assist businesses to bring on new apprentices and trainees to ensure that employers have the pipeline of skilled workers that they need. And that's why we've announced a $1.2 billion boosting apprenticeship commencement subsidy. That, Mr President, will create 100,000 new apprentices and trainees. And what it does is really highlight the importance of skills and training uh, to Australia's economic recovery. The subsidy, again, it's available to employers of any size, in any region, uh, in any location, to sign up a new apprentice or trainee and claim up to 50 per cent of their wages through to the 30th of September next Order, year. Order, Senator Cash. We are going to Senator Billick remotely. We'll just give it a second to kick in for her to ask her question. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. The COVID-19 report of the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect exploitation of people with a disability found the Morrison government's failures led to it, and I quote, neglecting to develop policies specifically addressing the needs of people with disability. Why? Um, there was trouble hearing you there, Senator Billick. Um, uh, uh, if I could ask another Labor senator to read it, um, that would be handy. Thank you. Senator Wong? If you don't mind, Senator Billick, we had um, some difficulty hearing, so I might just repeat it. Um, the COVID-19 report of the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability found the Morrison government's failures led to it, and I quote, neglecting to develop policies specifically addressing the needs of people with disability. Why? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator Wong on behalf of Senator Billick for reading out the question. Uh, Mr President, as uh, the government has said, we have welcomed the release of the Disability Royal Commission's interim report. Uh, we acknowledge that we all have a role to play in stamping out violence, abuse, neglect or exploitation of people with a disability. It is completely unacceptable. 
We also thank Senator Billick, the Disability Royal Commission, for its important work, and we will carefully consider the findings in relation to COVID-19, as well as other issues and recommendations that emerge as part of this inquiry. The government is committed to ensuring our response to the global pandemic properly takes into account the needs of people with disability, and we will carefully consider all of the recommendations as part of this process. I can also advise that the Australian government will work across relevant portfolios and ministers to respond to the Commission's recommendations as a matter of priority. Now, I'll go to Senator Billick again and I'll ask the controllers to see if they can max up the volume. Um, Senator Billick. Thank you. Disability Royal Commission Chair Ronald Sackville was clear in identifying that the federal government was responsible, and I quote, it was the absence of that consultation that led to significant failures in the responses of the Australian government. Why was the Morrison government willing to leave Australians with a disability behind? Senator Cash. Well, as Senator Billick, I'm going to uh, reject the premise of the way in which you've put the question. And you'd be aware that the government has consulted widely uh, in relation to this. But again, the Australian government, we Order. welcome, Mr. President, Order. the interim report of the Disability Royal Commission. And as I've also said, we will now work across portfolios and across ministers to respond to the Commission's recommendations as a matter of priority. Senator Billick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The report found the Morrison government failed to provide PPE to people with disability and their support workers, failed to provide access to essential food and medications, and left people with disability feeling forgotten and ignored. Why does the Morrison government keep leaving vulnerable Australians behind? Senator Cash. Uh, well, again, Mr. President, in relation to the premise of your question, uh, I will again reject it. And as I've said, we Order. have welcomed the interim report of the Disability Royal Commission. And again, as I've already stated, Mr. President, one of our most important tasks during the course of COVID-19 has been protecting people with disability. And as we have also stated, we all have a role to play in stamping out violence, abuse, neglect or exploitation of people with disability. The government has acted swiftly and decisively to help protect Australians with disability in response to the involving impact of COVID-19. And as I've said, we will now work across portfolio and across ministers in relation to the recommendations. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is to the leader of the government, Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister. Today, former president of Kiribati, Anote Tong, has written in the Sydney Morning Herald highlighting the climate change remains the single most pressing security threat to their region. He says that without radical action, deadly disasters will become more intense and severe. Kiribati will become uninhabitable and there will be a wider global apocalyptic disaster. He calls for serious action on climate, including moratoriums on coal and gas. In this piece, Mr. Tong has asked our Prime Minister if he is now willing to listen to his specific family and take steps to protect all of us, and said that courage and leadership are what's needed here. Will the Prime Minister have the courage to listen and act on the climate crisis? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Faruqi for her question regarding the, uh, the uh, media comments of the former Prime Minister of Kiribati. Uh, I, uh, I note the comments. I haven't read the uh, opinion piece in full, but I have heard some commentary in relation to it, and, uh, and obviously uh, you have quoted from it to a degree, Senator Faruqi. Uh, what, I, uh, what I would say in that regard is that uh, our government certainly takes our engagement with the Pacific Island family uh, of nations uh, very, very uh, carefully and importantly in terms of the approach we take including on issues of climate change that we know uh, are of very real and genuine concern uh, to our Pacific Island family. Uh, it is why uh, we have taken every possible step to ensure that as a country uh, we, time and time again, when we make commitments in relation to emissions reductions, 
meet those commitments and exceed those commitments. Uh, it's why, unlike some other nations, we haven't sought to outsource activities in relation uh, to the meeting of those commitments either. Uh, indeed, yesterday, I think, when I gave some figures in to, uh, to Senator Waters uh, about um, Australia's rate of emissions reduction uh, relative to other countries that have not achieved uh, comparable rates, uh, those countries, generally speaking, when it comes to meeting their Kyoto 1 or Kyoto 2 obligations, uh, rely upon international credits purchased elsewhere to be able to offset uh, the emissions within their own country. In Australia, what we have been able to do through our uh, work over many years uh, and through the technological change and investments that have occurred across the Australian economy uh, is to be able to meet and exceed the targets that we have set. Uh, and it's through that continued investment in relation to technology uh, that we will continue and to be able to meet and exceed our targets, to build upon those targets, but to do so in a way that also protects Australian jobs and indeed job opportunities for the many Pacific Island workers who come and enjoy opportunities Order. in Australia Senator too. Birmingham. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, in an open letter to the Prime Minister published today, 15 Pacific leaders, including Mr Tong, described their homelands and cultures as facing certain devastation from climate change. Does the government acknowledge that the worst impacts of climate change are being felt and will continue to be felt in poorer countries, including many in the Pacific region? Senator Birmingham. As Mr President, well, the government does, uh, does certainly uh, acknowledge uh, the severity that Pacific Islanders uh, see in relation to climate change issues, and it's why uh, we engage very seriously and thoughtfully with them on those issues. It's also why uh, we believe that the first responsibility for a country like Australia in making commitments as we have in relation to emissions reduction is to meet those commitments, indeed to strive to exceed those commitments, uh, and why we are pleased that Australia has consistently done that, uh, unlike some others. We also acknowledge that it is therefore then a global responsibility uh, that you don't get uh, outcomes in terms of emissions reduction that Pacific Island leaders may wish to see unless other nations also not only make commitments but then also deliver on those commitments. And the delivery is a key part that seems to often be put aside in the virtue signalling aspects of some of this debate. For our government, we see delivery as essential, and that's where our focus is when it comes to emissions Order. reduction. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, amongst the calls in this open letter are for new and additional funding beyond the current aid budget to finance climate mitigation and adaptation under the Paris Agreement, including contributing to the Green Climate Fund. Will the government commit to this? And if not, why not? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, uh, well, our government has put great priority in terms of uh, delivering specific assistance and support to Pacific Island nations, and we see that as important across uh, a range of different areas of policy import. Climate change, adaptation and resilience is one of those, uh, and we support work with our Pacific Island family uh, in that regard. Uh, equally, we have scaled up support for Pacific Island nations in response to COVID. Uh, and delivered additional support focused very directly in terms of uh, the Pacific Island countries. Uh, and there, in building on that COVID support in a financial sense, has also been our acknowledgement of our responsibility in working with those less developed nations, those smaller micro nations within our region, uh, for their access to vaccines and to ensure their safety and their economic well being. So we take the responsibility in working with those nations across all of those areas and other development considerations very, very seriously. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister outline how the Australian government has responded to the threat of COVID-19 to senior Australians in aged care? Order. 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 Senator Wong. Senator Wong, that is not helpful before the ministers started answering a question. Senator Wong, interjections are always disorderly. Um, I, before we be disorderly, I'd like to at least hear from the minister. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you to Senator Henderson for your question. Uh, Mr President, from the very beginning, 
responding to the COVID-19 pandemic has been a top priority for this government. We know that our most vulnerable senior Australians were at most at risk, and we have acted at every stage to prepare Order. for a worst-case scenario. Should this virus enter our aged care facilities, Mr. President, we closed Order. our borders, Mr. President. We planned for an emergency response with our medical professionals. We negotiated hospital agreements. Order we increased the left. capacity of our providers, and we resourced a surge workforce for residential aged care. We secured and distributed a substantial national stockpile of PPE, all at a time of global shortage, Mr. President. We have invested to date over $1.7 billion to plan, prepare, act and recover, Mr. President. There are no countries, Mr. President, where there has been widespread community transmission that have been able to avoid outbreaks in residential aged care. Here in Australia, we have seen the devastating loss of 693 Australians, Mr. President, in aged care. Our condolences will always be with their friends and families, Mr President. When community outbreaks occurred and COVID-19 hit Victoria and New South Wales, we came together with a collaborative response between federal government agencies, state governments, providers, professionals, families and senior Australians, hospital networks and others to do what we could to manage the outbreaks, to keep it out of the homes of our most vulnerable. As I noted yesterday, Mr President, in our response to the Royal Commission, we've been able to stop the spread of COVID-19 to senior Australians in 97 per cent Order, of Senator our aged Colbeck. care facilities. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. What is the government Order. doing to ensure? Order, Senator Polly. Senator Polly, I'd like to hear the question, please. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Colbeck, what is the government doing to ensure COVID-19 is kept out of aged care facilities into the future? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. It's, it's very pleasing to Order. note, Mr. President, that there have been no cases of residents in aged care since the 28th of October, Mr. President. While the rest of the world continues to battle this terrible virus, we mostly have it under control here in Australia and now have the capacity to recover in time and get on the front foot so that we are ready for any future threats. Mr. President, the government accepted and is acting on all six recommendations from the Royal Commission's special report on COVID-19. And yesterday, I announced an additional $132.2 million of measures to help our senior Australians to ensure we even are even stronger into the future as we recover. We are committed, Mr President, to strengthening infection prevention control in facilities, including working with state jurisdictions to do so. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Can the minister provide a comparison of Australia's aged care response compared to the rest of the world? Order. I'll call. I'll, I'll, order, so I'll, I'll wait till there's silence, Senator Colbeck. We're wasting time, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As I outlined to the Senate yesterday, one of the leading geriatricians in Australia's response to fight COVID-19, Associate Professor Michael Murray, said. Australia was as well prepared for a significant aged care outbreak as any country or jurisdiction in the world, Order. with the probable exception of Hong Kong. Senator Keneally. Mr. President, we have learnt the lessons Senator from Rennick. Hong Kong, including Senator the adoption Watt. of their model of infection control leads in each of our facilities. Globally, Mr. President, the impact of COVID-19 has tragically been felt in aged care. Australian, Australia has had fewer deaths, both in total and in care homes, than many other countries in the world, including those that we know are going through a second wave of infections. Senator Urquhart. Order. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Last night, the Morrison government tabled its formal response to the Royal Commission's special report on COVID-19. 
The document failed to state that 685 older Australians died from COVID-19 in the Morrison government's residential aged care system. Why? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, uh, I quite clearly stated in my statement to the Senate yesterday afternoon Order. Uh, that 693 Australians have died as a result of COVID-19 in respect of COVID-19. Uh, it's an absolute tragedy in every single circumstance, and I've just repeated that a moment ago myself, Mr. President. The response that we tabled yesterday to, was to the measures that were requested by the Royal Commission, and it was our response to the Royal Commission report, Mr. President. That's what we tabled yesterday. And in my statement yesterday to this chamber, I acknowledged, as order. I have done Senator, on many Senator occasions— Senator Colbeck, I've got Senator Urquhart on a point of order. Senator Urquhart. Point of order is relevant. Um, the minister was asked why the document failed to state that 685 older Australians had died from COVID-19. I'd okay. like that question answered. Wait, I've allowed you to restate the question there, Senator Urquhart. While the minister is talking about the number you referred to and the content of the report, I can't instruct him to answer a question in that form. I think he is being directly relevant to that, but I've allowed you to restate it and remind him of it. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I'm not interested in the political games that the Labor Party seek to play with respect to this issue. As I've said order, a moment ago— Order. Senator as Col said, order, Senator, order. I'll call se Senator, Senators on my left. Senator Wong is on her feet. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Direct relevance. Uh, we asked you why your report did not include a reference to 685 Australians who died in your system. I would ask you to have the decency to respond to that. Senator Birmingham on the point of order. Mr President, on the point of order, Senator Colbeck has been consistently directly relevant in his response to this question. Senator Colbeck, in responding to this question, has ide indeed identified this was a government response to the specific recommendations of the Royal Commission. He has equally identified that in tabling that response from the statement made, the number that was referenced was cited. I fail to see how a senator could be any Order. clearer and any more Order. relevant, directly relevant, in responding to an answer than Senator Colbeck is being. I Order. Senator Wong, your point of order was substantively the same to Senator Urquhart's. I allowed you as leader to make the point again uh, and to restate uh, that concluding part of the question. Um, Senator Colbeck, in my view, while he is talking about the report that was tabled and while he is talking about the number um, of Australians who have passed away um, due to this, I don't, I don't think I can instruct him as to how to answer a question that specifically. He is being directly relevant to the question at the moment. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr President. As I said, the, the report that I tabled yesterday responded directly to the recommendations of the Royal Commission's COVID-19 special report. In my statement that I gave in tabling that document, I directly referenced, I directly referenced all of those, all of the 693 who have passed away as a result of COVID-19 in aged care. 685 in residential aged care, eight in home care. Uh, and acknowledged again, as I have done on many occasions in this chamber, the individual tragedy it is for each of those families and their friends and communities. And we continue to work in the interests of all senior Australians in aged care in responding to the virus uh, and managing its effects in the community, Mr President. Uh, this government, as I've outlined a moment ago, since the outbreak of the COVID-19, has been working closely with the aged care sector to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. We have continued to develop our plan as that process has Order. continued. Order. Senator Urquhart, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Last week, the minister tabled the annual report of the Aged Care Act. Again, the report failed to state that 685 older Australians had died from COVID-19 in the Morrison government's residential aged care system. Why? Good Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, that report directly referenced the impact that COVID-19 had had on senior Australians. 
and putting a date at a point in time when that number when order. When, when, when when well order. I'll, take, I'll take senator Keneally's senator, I'll take senator, senator Keneally's Keneally. objection because the date of the report was at the 30th of senator June Watt. last year and at that point in time the date of the number of deaths had changed and unfortunately unfortunately senator mr Keneally. president uh, the number Keneally. of deaths continued to escalate through July, August and September, uh, through into October, when until the 28th of October we got to the fantastic circumstance where there are no cases of COVID-19 in residents in aged care in this country. Because Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales, Queensland, Western Australia and the the Tasmania and the Territories have managed to control the community transmission of the virus. And when there is community transmission of COVID-19, there is a risk to residential aged care. Order. Senator Urquhart, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Today in the Senate Gallery, we have nurses who have been at the front lines of this pandemic and cared for older Australians in this minister's broken aged care system. What will it take for the Morrison government to stop denying the 685 deaths on its watch, to take responsibility and to ensure that this never happens again? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And can I completely Senator reject Keneally. the premise of the question? Because at no point in time have we, had to not, to, had, have we denied, at no point in time have we denied the tragic circumstances of COVID-19 in aged care. And it's quite dishonest, Senator, for you to actually frame your question in that way, Mr President. Can I say I pay tribute and give thanks to every aged care worker, not just the nurses, the personal care workers, the therapists, everybody who has worked on the front line in aged care. And thank Order. you for being here today, Mr President. I, I pay tribute to everyone. And while this opposition at the last Senator election Keneally. refused to give any additional resource to staff in residential aged care, Mr President. We have on three occasions provided additional resources and payment to staff in residential aged care in the form of retention payments, Mr President. This government is Order. the only one Senator who's Colbeck. actually in Time material for your terms has recognised. Expired. Order on my left. Order. Senator Davey. Thank you, Mr. President. My question, uh, turning from aged care to health care, is for the minister representing the Minister for Regional Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Liberals and Nationals in government are building our investment in regional and rural Australia through the 2020 to 21 budget to ensure that our regions have access to the most effective health care possible? The Minister representing the Minister for Regional Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Davey Order. for her question. And I acknowledge, like all of us on the government side of the chamber, her commitment to Australians who reside in rural and regional Australia, but in particular also to our commitment as a Liberal national government to improving the health standards of those who reside in rural and regional Australia. And in fact, Mr. President, in this year's budget, regional Australians will actually get benefit from improved access to health services, and that's because we are, have invested a $1.2 billion investment to booth health care in the bush. And Mr President, this significant investment, $1.2 billion investment, it builds on the reforms that the government has already put in place to expand, as we know, rural training opportunities, but also to address the complex workforce challenges that actually occur in rural communities. Mr President, in terms of the focus uh, of our reforms, they're focusing very much on addressing the distribution challenge. Um, and we are now investing in new approaches and localised solutions. Uh, we understand as a government that one size uh, does not fit all, and in particular when you look at a country that is the size of Australia. So in terms of the investment and the policies that we're putting in place, we are very much breaking new ground by investing in unique sub-regional models of primary care delivery. We're trialling different approaches uh, to addressing the unique challenges to regional health care. Uh, Mr President, these regional models, as I've said, they move beyond the one-size 
fits all approach. And what we're looking at doing is empowering local communities with the tools to integrate the services that they already have, to increase their support in essential services, but also to find localised solutions. And in addition to that, we have a $3.3 million investment that is actually going to support the delivery of the primary care across five sub-regions, as Senator Order. Davey knows, Senator Cash, in New South Senator Wales. Davey, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you. And to support this initiative, how is the government securing better training for rural GPs, which makes rural health practice more appealing to our regional medical practitioners? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, again, the government understands that rolling out health policies that are uniform across regional Australia, it hasn't always worked. When you have a country the size of Australia, one size fits all is not always the way to go. So what we're looking at doing as a government is we're looking at drilling down into more innovative and collaborative ways of supporting our regional health workforce. Um, and as Senator Davey would know, evidence shows that when students actually undertake their training uh, in the regions, they are more likely to stay in the regions. And that's why, in terms of the funding that we've provided in the 2020-2021 budget, we're providing an additional $50.3 million to enhance the rural training pipeline through the long-standing rural health multidisciplinary training program. Mr President, we understand that providing the funding to ensure that we can extend training into smaller rural communities and rural residential aged care facilities will assist Order. those Senator in Cash. rural and regional Senator Australia. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Um, thank you. Um, finally, as we emerge from this pandemic, and thankfully there hasn't been much of an outbreak in the regions, but how is the government continuing to support our regional communities and our regional health systems to remain alert to the risks of COVID-19? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, I think we all acknowledge that we all need to remain alert uh, in relation to COVID-19. And certainly, though, uh, whilst cases in rural and regional Australia and rural and regional communities uh, remain relatively low, it is important that we do remain vigilant, uh, but also be ready to respond in the event that there is transmission in any part of our regional communities. And again, in terms of the recent budget, the 2020-2021 budget. Importantly, it continues to fund the government's COVID-19 health response to manage the impact of the pandemic in rural Australia. Uh, Mr President, in terms of some of the policies that we have implemented, we've fast-tracked, as you know, the expansion of temporary MBS telehealth items, including for rural and remote Australians. Uh, and in fact, Senator Davey would be pleased to know that there have now been over 10 million telehealth services delivered to more than 3.2 million people in regional Australia. Uh, and that Order. is why the Senator Cash. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister Payne. Yesterday it was announced that the former Liberal Premier of Tasmania, Will Hodgman, would be Australia's next High Commissioner for Singapore. Mr Hodgman replaces Bruce Gosper, the former Deputy Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Mr Gosper replaced Philip Green, the first Assistant Secretary in DFAT's International Security Division. Mr Green replaced Doug Chester, Deputy Secretary of Defence, Foreign Affairs and Trade. And Mr Chester replaced Miles Cooper, the former Deputy Secretary of DFAT. Mr Cooper replaced Gary Quinlan, the former Deputy Secretary of DFAT. And Mr Quinlan replaced Murray McLean, former Deputy Secretary of DFAT. So I'd like to know, Minister, did you run out of DFAT deputy secretaries, or is the Liberal Party just a deeper talent pool these days? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And I am very pleased to acknowledge the strong service of former High Commissioners for Singapore that uh, Senator Lambie has been kind enough to read into the Hansard record. Uh, and in, in fact, uh, if I may say particularly, uh, Mr President, uh, if I may acknowledge uh, Mr Bruce Gosper, the incumbent High Commissioner in Singapore, he and his team have been doing an exceptional job in the context of the COVID-19 challenge in particular, including supporting my most recent visit to Singapore, which is one of the very few international visits that uh, we have been able to make as a government in the context of COVID-19. 
I would say, uh, Mr. President, in response to, uh, to Senator Lambie's question, uh, which, uh, which uh, notwithstanding her uh, humour, I will uh, assume goes to the appointment of the former Premier of Tasmania, Mr. Will Hodgman, that Mr. Hodgman is a highly, highly qualified very appropriate appointment to be Australia's High Commissioner in Singapore, one of the most important regional partners, key Order. member of ASEAN, a country which, with whom we have a very important strategic partnership, Senator, a digital engagement that, uh, that, uh, that is uh, one of the most significant that Australia uh, has undertaken in recent years. And what, Premier, for, what former Premier Hodgman and old habits die hard, I still call Arthur Sinodin a senator, what former Premier Hodgman will bring to this role is a, uh, is a view of Australia as a, as a uh, key partner in the Indo Pacific, particularly in ASEAN and particularly with Singapore. He is well known for putting Tasmania in particular on the world stage putting Australia first in everything that he did, everything that he has done, and he is eminently well qualified. I look forward to working with him into the future Order as he leads left. Australia's representation Order. in Singapore. It will be welcomed by Prime Minister Lee and it will be welcomed by Foreign Minister Vivian Balakrishna. It is a recognition Order. of Senator the important Payne, time for the answer we have with has Singapore. Expired. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Order. Senator well, Lambie, I'll, I'll wait till I can hear your question. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm glad you mentioned that Will Hodgman was highly qualified. So, if he's so highly qualified, what was the selection process you followed for his appointment? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President and uh, uh, Senator Lambie. The government has a range of uh, a range of order order. Order on my left. I'm going to ask people to take a breath after I call for order before they start being disorderly again. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Let me say that uh, Mr. Hodgman has extensive experience across key sectors of importance to the uh, Australia-Singapore relationship, particularly trade and tourism. Uh, he will be an outstanding advocate of Australia's interests in Singapore and an outstanding advocate for our engagement through Singapore and with ASEAN in particular. He will, he will complement the extensive work done by the incumbent, Mr Gosper, uh, who, as I said, has been a fine High Commissioner uh, in Singapore and continues to be so. Uh, it is important to note that Mr Gosper does not include his term uh, until uh, January of next year. When our ambassadors and our high order. commissioners— Order. Um, Senator Lambie on a point of order. Uh, sorry, um, Mr President. I'm just wondering. Um, I did ask what the selection process was. I haven't quite got to that yet. You reminded the minister of, of, of the question. She has, well, I, I thought four seconds, eight seconds according to the clerk. Um, Senator Payne, have you concluded your answer or you'd like to? Yes. Senator, Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Besides being a job for a mate, what professional or personal relationship does Mr. Hodgman have with Singapore that could possibly qualify him for this role? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I think it is important for uh, for uh, Senator Lambie and for uh, those opposite, it would seem, from the uh, cacophony uh, opposite, um, to really appreciate the importance that we place on growing our relationship in priority areas, continuing our nations, Australia's and Singapore's work together in responding to in the, particularly the health and the economic challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr Hodgman's extensive experience in government, his extensive experience in trade and in tourism, it's which are key of aspects order. of Senator our— Senator Payne, I have Senator Lambie on a point of order. Um, Mr President, I'm simply asking what professional or personal relationship did Mr Hodgman have with Singapore that could possibly qualify him? I just want to know what professional or personal relationships Senator, he had to qualify Senator him for Senator Lambie, that. I, I think with respect, um, order. Senator Payne is being directly relevant. She's answering the question, if not necessarily in the form requested. Um, she is being directly relevant to the question. Senator Payne. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I have spoken to um, Mr. Hodgman's particular expertise as an outstanding leader of government in Australia, an outstanding leader of government who really moved Tasmania into a place on not just the Australian stage but the world stage in trade and tourism terms, uh, which, which those opposite may wish to decry and which Senator Lambie may not accept, but with, with, but which. This government, Mr. President, sees Order. as Senator Payne. Time for the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister confirm that as early as the 8th of March 2017, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal held that no debt could be founded on the basis of a robo debt letter? The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. No, I can't. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Will, will the Minister commit to taking that question on notice and providing us with an answer? Sen is that the sub I, I can't instruct the Minister. You've got. No. Well, Senator O'Neill, um, the Minister's concluded her answer. You have an opportunity now to ask a supplementary question. Senator O'Neill. Can the minister confirm that, in addition to the decision handed down on the 8th of March 2017, the AAT held that the robo debt scheme was illegal on a further 75 occasions? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, as I have said on a number of occasions in this place, um, the AAT plays a very important role in um, making decisions and providing independent merits review to a wide range of different uh, decisions. Um, but in doing so, I would note that each case is unique and turns on its own facts and circumstances. And in this situation, Order. there have been decisions of the AAT um, that have uphold, um, upheld uh, the debt decisions calculated using income averaging, and equally, there have been those that have not. Um, and what I would say is that you cannot unilaterally come in here and make a, a determination on the basis of a specific case and make a general, a general assumption that the Order. decisions that are made on particular cases, and as I said, some of the cases before the AAT, some of the unique and individual cases before the AAT um, have been found not to have been upheld and others have been upheld. Senator O'Neill, final supplementary question. Hasn't the Morrison government known for years that the robo-debt scheme was illegal? Yes. Senator Rustin. No. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister update the Senate on how the development of the Greenvale Training Centre training area is boosting jobs in North Queensland and helping to build a stronger and more secure Australia? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Macdonald for that question. The Morrison government is resolutely committed to supporting Australian jobs and boosting the economy during COVID-19, and I'm so proud that Defence is significantly contributing to this economic recovery. Since the beginning of COVID-19, we've been working with Australian industry to progress defence projects uh, to both deliver essential defence capability and also to provide much needed cash flow uh, throughout our economy. And I'm pleased to, uh, to announce to the Senate that we are proceeding with all of the scheduled work under the $2.25 billion Australian Singapore Military Training Initiative. Last month, I was delighted to announce that the Australian company, CPB Contractors, have been awarded a contract for works on the new defence training area in North Queensland. This $800 million investment near Greenvale will create long-term local jobs and support local industry in North Queensland. The construction workforce is expected to peak at 350, with 90 per cent of the workers drawn from the local area. This advanced new training area will provide significant long-term local economic opportunities for North Queensland and particularly Townsville. When the Australia-Singapore Military Training Initiative reaches maturity, up to 14,000 Singapore Armed Forces personnel will train in Queensland for 18 weeks a year. This will provide enduring economic and social benefits uh, to Queensland for at least the next 25 years. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. 
Can the minister advise the Senate of the economic and local industry benefits the Australia-Singapore Military Training Initiative will deliver in central Queensland? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, in addition to Greenvale, the Morrison government is further investing in the Shoalwater Bay training area in central Queensland. Together, both of these investments in north and central Queensland coincide very happily with the 30th anniversary of Singapore Armed Forces training right here in Australia. This $2.25 billion Australian-Singapore military training initiative will meet the future needs of both our own Australian Defence Forces and also the Singapore Armed Forces. And as part of this initiative, we're investing $800 million into the central Queensland Capricorn region. The Shoalwater Bay investment will support 47 local companies and 450 workers at the peak of construction. This is further evidence that Queenslanders can trust the Morrison government to bolster regional growth and also to support local jobs. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. How does the development of this training area benefit the ADF and our key bilateral relationships with Singapore? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you again, Mr President. Singapore is a highly capable and very, very close defence partner of Australia, with a shared commitment to regional security and also to stability. In October, I made my second official visit to Singapore, where I met with the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Lee, and also my defence counterpart, Dr Ung. It was very, very clear to me during this visit how much Singapore values its deep engagement with Australia, particularly so this year in our 30th anniversary of Singaporean training here in Australia. And they appreciate this relationship just as much as Australia does. As close and enduring defence partners, these training areas support our interoperability right across the Indo-Pacific, and it also ensures Singapore's ability to generate a force that provides strategic weight in the region. As Australian-owned and managed training areas, they also support a more Order. capable Senator and Reynolds, agile time ADF. The answer has expired. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. My question is to a Minister Birmingham representing the Prime Minister. Minister. The Australian public, indeed the world, has been shocked by allegations of war crimes, criminality and human rights violations committed by Australian Special Forces in Afghanistan. And can I take this opportunity to acknowledge the Defence Force personnel in here that I'm sure few people have been more shocked than them at these allegations. Does the minister agree that the Australian community has a right to know about such things. Does the minister agree that the victims of these alleged crimes have a right to the truth being told? In short, does the minister agree that these allegations being made public is a good thing? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Wish Wilson for his question. And let me too uh, acknowledge the serving men and women of our Australian Defence Forces who are in the gallery today and say to all of you, thank you for your service and thank you indeed for the contribution you make to our nation. And I extend that around this chamber to the various colleagues who are veterans uh, of the Australian Defence Forces and thank all of them as I do any of those listening for their service and contribution. Uh, and in doing so, it is crucially important when we uh, discuss matters of the IGADF report that first and foremost we acknowledge the vast and overwhelming majority of the men and women who have served Australia's Defence Forces with distinction and with honour. And in doing so, we say to all of them that you should be proud of your service and that we are proud of you and what you have contributed. And part of the pride that Australians should take in the way we conduct ourselves as a nation and our defence forces operate is that we hold ourselves to a high standard. We hold ourselves to a high standard as a country and to all those who go out under the flag of our country and serve under that flag. That we expect in doing so they operate with the type of distinction that the vast, vast majority have done so. But in holding ourselves to that high standard, we also apply a degree of accountability and transparency that is unmatched by many other nations of the world and unrivalled by many others. 
Order. Senator Wish Wilson. Um, I ask whether the minister, in three different ways, agrees that the disclosure of these reports is a good thing and in the public interest. Senator Wish Wilson, it was a question, multiple questions with a substantial preamble. I've said before that uh, no, the preamble is part of the question, Senator Wish Wilson. Um, I've mentioned before that where people seek very specific answers, very short specific questions, constrain what is directly relevant. This, in this case, the minister is being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. And as I was just saying, as a country that holds ourselves to such high standards, there comes with that an element of transparency and accountability. And indeed, that is what the IGADF inquiry report uh, has undertaken. It has ensured the measure of accountability is in place and it has been transparent through the release of the findings in the summary report of the IGADF. Order. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. The Brereton report made strong recommendations about protecting whistleblowers in bringing information on war crimes to light. Indeed, it recommended uh, not only protecting them, uh, but also uh, promoting them. David McBride is the only whistleblower facing criminal charges and a potential lengthy jail sentence in relation to these disclosures that the Australian public now have. Minister, will your government rule out the prosecution of Army lawyer and whistleblower David Order, McBride? Senator Rich Wilson. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, and the government is indeed grateful for the cooperation of many in relation to uh, the conduct of this inquiry, uh, and we have responded uh, in relation to this inquiry uh, by establishing the Office of the Special Investigator uh, to handle matters that relate to potential criminal conduct and to investigate those and to ensure that proper judicial processes, including presumption of innocence, are followed quite appropriately. Uh, we have equally put in place an implementation oversight panel to review Defence's response to the recommendations into the report to ensure that in doing so there is again appropriate accountability to the leaders of the Australian Defence Force as they respond to order. this report. Senator Wish Wilson on a point of order. Senator point of relevance, President, will you rule out prosecuting whistleblower David Senator McBride, Wish Wilson, Minister? Um, again, um, that was the conclusion of your question. Um, the preamble forms part of the question, and a minister can be directly relevant addressing part of a question. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I am not in this chamber going to make decisions uh, from a political pulpit that are rightly the matters of proper legal processes. Senator Mitch Wilson, a final supplementary question. So I'll take that as a no, Minister. Um, along with David McBride, your government has aggressively pursued lawyer Bernard Caleri and witness Kay and has demonstrated a chilling complicity in the extradition trial and political witch hunt of Walkley Award-winning Australian journalist Julian Assange. Minister, why is your government waging a war against whistleblowers and transparency? Order. Now, Senator Wish Wilson, I have sought some advice from the clerk. The substantive question at the commencement was about another matter. The second supplementary needs to be relevant to the substantive question, not just the second question. So I'm going to allow the minister to address assertions made because I don't want to have a situation where questions can be asked and then ministers not have the opportunity to address them, even though questions might be ruled out of order. But I encourage people to make sure both their follow-ups are, are, follow are within the standing orders with respect to the substantive question. Senator Birmingham. Or Senator Wish Wilson. Point of order. I'm happy to talk to you about this afterwards. Are you actually ruling my question out of order? Uh, no. Well, my, my, my practice on this form, Senator Wish Wilson, um, I'm happy to speak to you afterwards. Um, my practice on this is that I am reluctant to rule questions out of order I do, uh, so that ministers don't have a chance to respond, because quite frankly, I don't want to create an incentive for misbehaviour in questions that then cannot be addressed in the chamber by assertions being made and then preventing ministers respond to them. So I'm urging all senators, and in this case Senator Wish Wilson, saying this question I think could be ruled out of order, but I'm allowing the minister to respond to it. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, I will make three observations in response to Senator Wish Wilson's attempted supplementary question. Number one is uh, that I will not, on such a sensitive issue, 
seek to politicise it in any way, unlike the Australian Greens. Number two is that I will not, as a politician Order. or a minister, seek to overturn what are appropriately the decisions of the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecution or those in whom Order. such authority to make Order. legal determinations is vested. And number three, I would note again, Mr President, that our country has held itself to a standard of accountability and transparency on this highly sensitive matter, the likes of which I struggle to think of any other nation holding itself to. Yeah. Senator Birmingham. Oh, Senator Pratt. Oh. Aged care and senior Australians. Senator Colbert. In August, the minister promised that he was requiring residential aged care facilities to, and I quote, have a designated infection control officer on site. In the government's response to the Royal Commission's special report on COVID-19, it's revealed the practitioners the minister promised in August will only be in place today. Why has it taken three months for the minister to deliver this protection for older Australians in aged care and support aged care workers? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, uh, Senator, Senator Pratt is correct. On the 31st of August, we announced that we would require all aged care providers in this country to have a nominated IPC lead within each facility, Mr. President. Uh, and just because we say it doesn't mean it magically happens, we had to give the sector the time for it to occur. And so, Mr. President, I wrote. I wrote to all aged care providers, Mr. President. I wrote to every aged care provider in this country, and told them that they were required to nominate their infection control lead by the 1st of December, Mr. President. And that's why what I expected they will have done, Mr. President. So uh, we, in fact, moved ahead of the Royal Commission on this particular issue by announcing at the end of August that we would require every aged care facility in this country to nominate an infection control lead. We gave them a reasonable period of time for them to get that position in place. Uh, and we have, Mr President, given them a further period of time to ensure that they that this uh, nominated staff member has the appropriate level of qualification, Mr President. And we've actually nominated the qualifications that they will be required to have by a certain date. Mr President, so we have actually done exactly what we said we would do in August. We said to the sector we would be requiring them to nominate the lead. Mr. President, we have made it a condition of their uh, accreditation, so they are required to do it, Mr. President. And so we've done exactly everything that we said we would do, and we gave the sector an appropriate period of time to get that position in place. Senator Pratt, supplementary question. Can the minister guarantee that as of today, the 1st of December, Every residential aged care facility has appointed an infection prevention and control clinical lead. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, as, as I've just advised the, the chamber, Mr. President, uh, I have made that appointment a condition, a condition of accreditation, Mr. President. So, as each residential aged care facility is checked for its accreditation, and we are conducting. Uh, 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 checks on infection control on aged care facilities all over the country. We have been doing that for a period of time, and we will continue to do that because this is not just a set and forget process. It's a continuous improvement process that we've asked the providers to put in place. So this will be and is a, a, a requirement, Mr. President, of their accreditation. So that fact will be checked as a part of that process. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given the minister's management of the Morrison government's broken aged care system, which continues to be characterised by dawdle and delay, isn't it clear that this minister has learned nothing from the tragedy he's overseen, the almost 700 deaths in aged care from COVID-19 and the censure of the Senate? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the senator. Uh, suffers from not having listened to the previous answers in asking the second supplementary, Mr. President, Order. because I have directly addressed every single issue that uh, Senator Pratt has raised. Uh, we've done exactly what we said we would do in the time that we said, and we've in fact made the appointment of the infection control professionals a 
factor of accreditation of aged care to ensure that we continue to improve the system and keep our senior, senior Australians safe, Mr. President. Senator Birmingham. I will now ask that further questions be placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Cash and Colbeck to the questions asked by Senators Billick, Pratt and myself. So here we have a minister who, while a pandemic raised, raged through our country and took a terrible toll, most particularly on the most vulnerable, on residents in our aged care facilities, was incapable of taking a decisive and timely uh, actions to meet the government's responsibilities to this sector. He gave every impression of not being on top of his brief and freezing on the job. From his answers today, I have no more confidence in his abilities or the ability of this government that he's part of to manage or respond to serious infectious outbreaks and pandemics uh, in aged care residential facilities. This pandemic has taken the lives of 685 residents of these government uh, facilities, leaving thousands grieving the loss of partners, husbands, wives, parents, grandparents and great-grandparents, and dear, often long life, uh, lifelong friends. It's been left in the wake of traumatised residents and traumatised staff—685 Australians dead. These are our loved ones. These are those who cared for us, loved us and deserve better. Better care from their government and better respect for the contribution that they've made to our country. They deserve act action and they deserved a government with a plan. They deserved a federal minister who could move fast, who could lead. And at very, very least, they deserved a mention, a mention, an apology, even in the government's response to this Royal Commission special report. But what did they get? A response from this minister no faster than a glacier moves. A lumbering government in denial, constantly, constantly trying to deflect and deny responsibility, constantly saying it had a plan and failing to show anything for it. I've looked through the government's uh, response to the Aged Care Royal Commission special report into COVID-19. I've listened to this minister attempt to answer the questions that I put to him in the chamber here today, and I heard nothing, nothing but self uh, And yesterday, when he was here talking to that document, I heard nothing but self-congratulation, slippery words, and hubris. The same self-congratulation and hubris that the Royal Commission itself criticised. Minister Colbeck, the truth is that your response and the response of the miserable, careless government you are a part of has been totally inadequate, glacially slow and massively disrespectful to the lives of 685 Australians and their loved ones. The truth is that you are now only putting into effect actions that you should have taken in March and April. When infections tore through the aged care facilities in Europe, this government should have taken action then. When the first COVID-19 infections occurred in, occurred in New South Wales, the government then should have taken action. It's December now. That was March, and to date 685 Australians have died. They didn't get a mention from this government in the response to the Aged Care Royal Commission special report into COVID-19. And even now, by your own admission, you've, been, you've had no way of monitoring or knowing how effective the response has been of this government. I point to you recommendation six, that the Australian government should require providers to appoint infection control officers and should arrange for the deployment of accredited infection prevention and control experts into residential aged care. Here we are, December the 1st, and the, pro and the response is that that's in progress. Infection control surely, surely should have been the number one priority of this government back in March. In August, the government promised residential aged care facilities would have, and I quote, a designated infection control officer on site. And here we, we are in December, and the minister can't tell us whether they've been appointed, how many experts, and how much training has been done. 
It's in progress, you say. That's not good enough. In fact, it's pathetic. And a great many Australians have be suffered because it's, it's not good enough. The government is not good enough, and it's a sham. For many months, months, the minister's been saying that the government has a plan for aged care. And what do we find? Now in December, accepted a recommendation that you have a plan for aged care. It beggars belief. And it leaves us quite sure that we are right to be fearful and angry because if this government can't respond in an effective and timely manner to a pandemic, then imagine how hopeless it's going to be to the response to the thank final you, report. Senator Urquhart, your time has expired. Senator Sasselja. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy President. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to what is a very important issue. Um, and of course, it's an issue that this government treats uh, with the utmost seriousness uh, and urgency and gravity. And one of the reasons that the Prime Minister, one of his first actions uh, upon becoming Prime Minister, uh, was to call a royal commission into aged care quality and safety. Uh, this is a government that takes these responsibilities seriously, and this is a minister who takes those responsibilities seriously. And uh, when we heard just just then uh, the contribution from Senator Urquhart, uh, somehow claiming that Minister Colbeck uh, doesn't care, uh, or that in fact that his answer did anything other than respond. Uh, to those serious issues, I think, is a complete misrepresentation, a complete misrepresentation uh, of this minister uh, and of the work that he has been doing, uh, and in fact, of the answers uh, that he was giving uh, in question time to uh, some of the Labor Party's uh, questions that have been put to him. Um, I, I do want to go through. I do want to go through um, uh, some of the responses uh, to the report. Um, and just to point out that the Labor Party, despite uh, all of its, all of its uh, promised tax hikes at the last election, couldn't bring itself to promise one extra dollar uh, when it came to aged care uh, in this country. Despite $387 billion of new taxes, uh, there was not one dollar uh, to show its priorities in this space. But uh, when it comes to the response, uh, the the Australian government accepted all six recommendations of the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety's Aged Care and COVID-19 a special report. Uh, the, and in response to recommendation four of the Royal Commission's report, the government has updated the National COVID-19 Aged Care Plan to its seventh edition in consultation with the AHPPC Aged Care Advisory Group. The national plan sets out. Uh, how the government has and will continue to support the aged care sector to prevent, prepare, respond and recover from COVID-19. It also provides links to guidance, information and tools to support aged care recipients, their families, the aged care workforce and providers of aged care services. Uh, the revised plan builds on and consolidates the critical and successful work already undertaken by the Commonwealth Government and allows flexibility to manage individual situations in each state and territory. It represents the seventh stage of national aged care planning. Uh, other measures uh, which have been announced include that aged care residents will now be eligible to receive up to 20 individual psychological services in line with the services available to the broader community. They will also uh, be eligible for double the allied health sessions under Medicare chronic disease management plan. In addition, uh, to the recommendations of the Royal Commission, the government is also funding group allied health sessions for residents in, uh, in facilities affected by COVID-19 outbreaks, including people who need rehabilitation after recovering from COVID-19 and people who have lost condition or mobility because of restrictions put in place to manage the outbreak. A range of actions have been undertaken uh, by the Australian government to ensure the right balance can be struck between restricting visitation in residential aged care facilities where necessary, but ensuring residents are nice, not isolated and lonely during these difficult times. Uh, so this is a government uh, that takes these issues seriously and is, is carefully uh, responding uh, to these recommendations. Uh, but uh, I would make this point in terms of the Labor Party's attacks, uh, and we saw it again today in question time. Uh, they seem to suggest uh, that even though uh, 
the deaths that we have seen, the tragic deaths which the minister again acknowledged uh, in his answers today, which wasn't acknowledged by those opposite, uh, those tragic deaths have occurred almost overwhelmingly uh, in the state of Victoria. And the Labor Party seeks to deny that for rank political opportunism and for rank political purposes, to try and ignore the fact uh, that virtually all of the deaths were happening in Victoria as a result of the huge outbreak as a result of the Victorian Labor government. Well, you're running a protection racket for the Victorian Labor government. We take this issue seriously, but by pretending, by pretending there is no issue to see in Victoria and it has nothing to do with the massive Order. community outbreak caused by the Victorian Labor government demonstrates you, your Senator motives Sussel, in this space. Your time has expired. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise this afternoon to also take note of answers given to questions by uh, Senator Colbeck and Senator Cash. And it is indeed uh, a greatly disturbing event uh, that in the Royal Commission's report that's been handed down in relation to the treatment of people with disability uh, under the COVID-19 arrangements, or should I say lack of arrangements. The Royal Commission Chair Ronald Sackville has found the government was responsible for a serious failure in its communications uh, with Australians with disability. The report noted it was the absence of consultation that led to significant failures in the responses of the Australian government. It is the most basic and fundamental tasks uh, of this government, of any government, to undertake consultation with those affected in any time of change or need, especially uh, <coughs> those who might be vulnerable uh, to those circumstances. We have seen in this time People with disability left stranded at home without meals, without being able to wash, without being able to move themselves in order to prevent bed sores, without being able to take required medication and get required support. Now, it was entirely predictable and obvious that these kinds of scenarios were likely to occur. Entirely predictable. We know that disability care workers often need to uh, work across a number of households of people with disability, and we also know they're poorly paid. We also know that those workers had their own fears and concerns at the height of COVID about uh, their own susceptibility uh, to uh, catching COVID and their own caring responsibilities. So it was little surpri of surprise to no one that disability support workers uh, fell away and that many people with disability were totally without their basic care needs being met. What we also saw was because of the suspension uh, because of the lockdowns, we also saw the usual recreational and other outing activities also suspended. And that again meant people with disability were left further isolated and alone. Australians with disability have been treated as an absolute afterthought by this government in this pandemic. These outcomes for people with disability were entirely predictable. Not only were they entirely predictable, but people with disability were picking up the phone. They certainly called my office uh, to ask for help and support, and I'm sure they would have been calling yours as well. These Australians should have been our first and top priority not to be treated as an afterthought. We also saw an appalling lack of personal protective equipment available to disability care workers. What did this mean? This means that care workers were also afraid for their own health 
and for spreading uh, COVID-19 to their own families. What did that mean? It meant in that climate of fear, many of them didn't take their shifts and didn't go to work. In many instances, because they're on casual contracts, on casual employment, frankly, they weren't required to. If you were permanent part-time or permanent full-time, then it's a requirement of your job uh, that you go to work or that you call in sick or take personal leave. But in these circumstances, where you've got high numbers of workers who are concerned for their own well-being and safety uh, and on casual contracts, it was absolutely inevitable that these workers were going to feel also vulnerable. But this government, this government— Thank you, Senator Pratt. Your time has expired. Senator MacDonald. Thank you. I find it extraordinary that I'm going to respond to these matters taken note by the Labor Party, who once again is acting as if the actions of this government could have been um, taken as if we had the benefit of 2020 hindsight, as if it was um, completely predictable, as if this wasn't the greatest pandemic that, hadn't hit, that had hit the world in the last hundred years, and with the sanctimonious a glow of being able to see what has happened, now want to lecture the government on what could have happened and what should have happened. Because when you're in a position of responsibility and in government, you have to make the difficult decisions in difficult times without the benefit of hindsight and 2020 vision. Uh, but the government has at all times acknowledged the um, and express sincere sympathy to those affected by the pandemic and our deepest condolences to those who have lost loved ones. And every time the minister stands up, he acknowledges the 693 people in aged care who have lost their lives. As one of the few people in this place who have actually had uh, COVID-19, I understand the, um, the fear of having the test, of having it come back as positive and then wondering to see what the impacts will be on you. And my heart goes out to all of those people who have not only been in that situation, but have then had contact with people who are the most vulnerable and at risk in our society. And I know the terrible t uh, price that they will have paid to be in that situation. Um, this government has prioritised the introduction of the Serious Incident Response Scheme to provide additional protection for aged care residents, with an additional funding of $11.1 .1 million, <laughs> taking the government's total investment in the scheme to $67.2 million. And our response to the Royal Commission's report and updated plan highlights our ongoing commitment to improving care for senior Australians and keeping them safe during the COVID-19 pandemic. The government has now funded more than $1.7 billion in aged care-specific measures to support the plan. And this investment directly addresses issues raised by the Aged Care Royal Commission and will improve and support the health and well-being of aged care residents most significantly impacted by COVID-19. And It must be noted that whenever there are high rates of community transmission, the risk to older people, and particularly those in residential aged care increases, and we need to remain vigilant. The government will continue to work closely with aged care providers and all states and territories to ensure the ongoing safety and care of senior Australians. Because most tragically, it was in the state of Victoria where the hotel quarantine provisions were found and are still subject to inquiry, found to be desperately desperately inadequate and failed not only the people of Victoria, not only the people of Australia, but most tragically uh, those most vulnerable and at risk in our society, our elderly um, people. And they have paid a terrible price for that government's uh, response. And I'm sure that they too wish that they had uh, this federal opposition's incredible hindsight, incredible 2020 vision to now know exactly what could have possibly been done differently. But as I've said already, this government uh, is acting at all times to protect 
and uh, and take care of those people, in particularly in aged care. The government has accepted and is acting on all six recommendations from the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety, as previously announced last month in October 2020. The Morrison government will invest a further $132.2 million in its response to the Aged Care's Royal Commission's recommendation on COVID-19. This government has also updated its aged care plan. It's been developed in close consultation with the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee's Aged Care Advisory Group, which has been made permanent, meeting another recommendation of the Royal Commission's report. And the minister has said on many occasions how carefully he has consulted, how carefully he has listened and taken into account the recommendations and views not only of that group but others right across Australia who also care about the aged in our community. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator Pulley. Too little, too late. That's the reality of the actions or the lack of actions earlier by the Minister for Aged Care, Richard Colbeck, and this government. Let's put things into context, shall we? Of these 685 older Australians who died during the pandemic, we have the government now, the senator just explaining to the chamber how it's all the Victorian government's fault. It's amazing how it's okay to shift the blame, but for this government not to accept responsibility for their failings over, not since March this year, by neglecting older Australians and some of the most vulnerable Australians in this country, but in fact, it's been seven years, and I've lost count how many ministers there's been for aged care. But I was talking to a colleague, and I said, you know, who do you think has been the worst aged care minister in this country in the last seven years? And in fact, names came to mind like Ken Wyatt, Susan Lay, uh, Greg Hunt, Mitch Fifield. But I think we all agreed in our discussion that it is this current minister who has failed older Australians. He's been censured by this uh, chamber. And what we've seen now is it's not only the 685 older Australians that have died, but it's the impact on their families, their loved ones. But during this pandemic, it's not only those who have lost their lives. But it's been the staff who have had the responsibility for caring for them, that they have not been supported by this government. Not only were they not provided with the adequate PPE and the support that they needed being on the front line, but we know this government has neglected them also for the last seven years, not ensuring that they were adequately resourced. They certainly don't get paid. Uh, the remuneration that they deserve. And what we've seen is just cuts. And why should we expect anything different from the Prime Minister when, in fact, he cut almost $2 billion when he was treasurer out of aged care and used this sector as an ATM? So the public have no confidence in this minister. They have no more confidence in him than what we do on this side of the chamber. Because we know, after the countless reports that have outlined very clearly, with days and days of evidence given to various committees and various inquiries into the aged care sector, trying to get to the bottom of why this system is so broken and to give forward to the government of the day solutions for how they can do their job better by providing the support to older Australians that they deserve. But what have we got? Absolutely no response at all from this government. Then what we saw was them bringing in uh, and, well, calling for a royal commission into the aged care sector after they'd been in government for a number of years and failed to address the concerns, having collected somewhere between 12 and 16 different reports into the failings of the aged care sector and the struggle that a lot of the providers themselves are having uh, to keep their heads above water. But what, what we haven't seen is any leadership from this government. 
We've got a minister who, quite frankly, is no more interested than when they first in, came into government and we saw Senator Fifield uh, take on that responsibility. And the only thing he was ever interested in was the arts, certainly not in older Australians. And we've seen no improvement over the seven years that they've been in government. But what we have seen now, finally, is the spotlight has been shone on the aged care sector in this country because of the Royal Commission, because of this government's failing. The media now has some interest in aged care, but this is the opportunity for this government to finally address all those concerns that the community has had, all the uh, recommendations from uh, those countless reports that have been put forward, and to finally do something so that those 685 older, vulnerable Australians in the aged care sector who die because of the failings of this government to provide the leadership and support that was needed uh, in this sector to have not died in vain. To not have died in vain. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. So the question is that um, to take note of the questions put by uh, Senator Urquhart. To answers provided by the government, those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the minister's response to my question on the climate crisis. Our Pacific neighbours and Australia honouring its climate um, commitments. Which minister, Senator Faruqi? Uh, minister Birmingham. Thank you. The climate crisis looms large in the landscape of global inequality. Those who have contributed least to the warming of the planet amongst the poorest communities on Earth will experience the worst of the climate catastrophe. Today, 15 Pacific Islander leaders published an open letter to the Prime Minister of Australia. They described their homelands and cultures as facing certain devastation from climate change. They call on Australia to honour its international climate commitments and take urgent action to combat the climate crisis. Today, former president of Kiribati, Ahnote Tong, has also written in the Sydney Morning Herald saying that without radical climate action, deadly disasters will become more intense and severe. Kiribati will become uninhabitable and there will be a wider global apocalyptic disaster. He calls for serious action on climate, including moratoriums on coal and gas. Amongst their calls are for new and additional funds for the Australian foreign aid budget to finance climate change mitigation and adaptation. Climate justice must be central to Australia's foreign aid program. The Global North, including Australia, is responsible for the overwhelming majority of excess carbon emissions causing the climate crisis. The relentless pursuit of profit and power by wealthy colonial countries and multinational corporations has put the world on track for a global temperature rise of at least 3.4 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. The climate crisis and global poverty are the results of colonialism, structural inequalities, and grossly unfair trade and debt systems. These systems can't be fixed. These systems have to be torn down. That also means totally reconfiguring the way we think about international aid in this country. The provision of international aid should not be approached as a way of geopolitical positioning or exerting our self-interest, nor can it be thought of as kindness or charity on the part of wealthy nations. That wealth was stolen through exploitation, slavery and genocide, and wealth continues to be stolen. The provision of aid must be about justice and about repaying what is owed for the crimes of the past and present. The story of the industrialization of the global north is one of violence, exploitation, and extraction. This wealth was built with the resources and labor of the colonized peoples. Australia has a bloody British colonial history and continues to perpetuate its own colonial projects. Last year, it was estimated that Australia siphoned off more money in oil revenue from Timor-Leste than it provided in aid, and more than Timor-Leste spends on health in a year. Our Pacific neighbours are paying the heavy price of Australia's 
absolute refusal to tackle the climate crisis. Communities face rising sea levels, the annual destruction caused by tropical storms, the loss of arable land and drinking water, and the enormous social and economic challenges of displacement due to the climate crisis. The injustices of slavery, colonialism, and imperialism do not just lie in the past. They are ongoing and fundamentally affect communities' capacities to survive this impending disaster. Unaddressed, the imbalance of wealth and resources across communities will result in a, in a climate apartheid, as the poor bear the brunt and the rich can afford to evade the worst. Given Australia's role in producing vast amounts of climate-changing pollution, we have a particular responsibility to compensate and work with affected communities to avoid a total climate meltdown. Australia must look at its history and the way we tell our histories. When we listen to our Pacific neighbours, we need to hear them. We have a heavy responsibility to take strong climate action, to help communities manage and survive the climate crisis. We must increase our aid budget and cancel the burden of debt. We must turn the focus of aid from Australia's narrowly defined national interests to climate reparations, resilience and justice, and to undo imperialism and colonialism. Our neighbours are asking us to show courage and leadership, and we must. Thank you. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Mr President. Um, <clears throat> I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to the Electoral Amendment Territory Re Representation Bill 2020, allowing it to be considered during this period of sittings. And I also table a statement of reasons justifying the need for this bill to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statement incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Waters, I understand you had... Yes, thank you. And my apologies, I don't appear to have the uh, prompt sheet, but I am seeking leave to withdraw. The bitterness of the Senate notice of motion number two for today. Precisely that. Thank you, is President. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank, thank you, you very Senator much. Waters. Uh, any other notices? I shall now proceed to the placing of business, and I'll call on the clerk to notify postponements and extensions. Mr. President, postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator O'Neill for today, postponed till tomorrow. General business notices numbers 874, 877, 878, 881 and 884 have also been postponed. And business of the Senate notice number one, standing in the name of Senator Thorpe for tomorrow, postponed till the 9th of December. There are no committee extensions notified. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, and if there are no other matters in the placing of business, I'll move to the discovery of formal business, and I'll commence with business of the Senate matter number three, which is in the name of Senator Ayres. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that business of the Senate no uh, notice of motion number three, proposing a reference to the Finance and Public Administration References Committee, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is that motion. Well, Senator McKim. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. <coughs> Thank you. The Australian Greens are very concerned about trends in government that include an arbitrary cap on public service staffing numbers permanent public service jobs replaced by contracting out through labour hire firms and privatisation by stealth through transfer of service delivery to the private sector. So we'll support this motion. But those things did not happen by accident. They are the inevitable end result of the neoliberalism that began under Labor four decades ago and has continued under the Liberals. The Greens will move today for a genuine and comprehensive inquiry into the failings of privatisation, and we understand Labor will not be supporting our inquiry. It's time for Labor to stop hiding from its shameful neoliberal record, including the privatisation of Qantas, the Commonwealth Bank and the final tranche of Telstra. Corporatisation and privatisation will only end when the major parties abandon neoliberalism and admit that it has not worked. The question is the motion moved by Senator Urquhart on behalf of Senator Ayres be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. 
Senator Dunning, are you handling government business motion? Matter number one. Yes, sure. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that government business notice of motion number one relating to the approval of the Health Insurance Extended Medicare Safety Net Amendment Indexation Determination 2020 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunning. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, motions number two and three, Senator Dunningham. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that government business notices of motion numbers two and three, proposing the reference of public works to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, be taken together as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the motions and I table statements in relation to the works, together with the accompanying documentation. The question is that motion be agreed to, or those motions be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham, matter number four. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that government business notice of motion number four relating to the exemption of bills from the cut-off be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now I'm going to try and deal with motions in the matter most conducive to the time of the chamber, and I'll commence with motion number 879, Senator Seward. Thank you, uh, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 879 be taken as a formal motion. Uh, is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Question, uh, Senator Dunham. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government has so, uh, shown rather considerable flexibility in adjusting mutual obligation requirements in response to the impact of COVID-19. In return for in an income support payment, job seekers must take responsibility for meeting all of their mutual obligation requirements. The government re recognises this continues to be a challenging time for those looking for work and encourages job seekers to access the full range of assistance available to them, including access to skills training, assistance for other work preparation activities and referral to relevant support services, including mental health services, if required. The government remains committed to mutual obligation requirements for job seekers as well as ensuring Australians remain connected to the workforce. The question is the motion moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. In proof of my vain attempt to manage the business of the chamber, division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 879 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes. Senator Dean Smith tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 34. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, I'm now going to jump to matter number 886 in the name of Senator Watt, and I'll give Senator Urquhart a moment. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 886 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. As the Senate is well aware, an AFP investigation is underway, and the Department has also commenced uh, two internal independent investigations. It is critical that these multiple investigations currently underway are allowed to run their full course to ensure that uh, due process is followed. The, the advice the government has received is that it would not be uh, in the public interest to table these documents for very clear reasons. These include where the Senate has recognised that where the provision of information would have the tendency to prejudice law enforcement investigations, public interest and immunity may be invoked. The question is motion number 886 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. The question is that motion number 886 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell of the ayes. Senator Smith, tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 32. The matter is therefore negatived. Senators, could I come to matter number 889? In your name, Senator Urquhart. I'll give you a moment to return to your seat. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 889 be taken as a formal Is motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government accepted and is acting on all six recommendations from the Royal Commission's special report on COVID-19. Yesterday, announcing an additional investment of $132.2 million of measures in response. Uh, this includes funding for mental and allied health support, funding to support the costs of engaging infection prevention leads in facilities, and further funding towards a serious incident response scheme in 2021. This is in addition to significant investment to support our plan to prevent and combat COVID-19 in aged care. This brings the total COVID-19 investment by the government for aged care to $1.7 billion. Question is, motion number 889 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 889 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes and Senator Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 32. The matter is therefore negatived. Senators, could I come to back to my attempt to order it for the convenience of the Senate and come to 875 in the name of Senators Patrick and Lambie. And I'll give one of you a moment to get to your seat. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 875 be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The Australian government has called on the Chinese government to live up to its commitments under the World Trade Organization and CHAFTA, which require China to not discriminate against Australia. The government has repeatedly called for dialogue to resolve current trade issues in the interest of jobs and economic recovery post-COVID in both countries and our broader region. 
Such requests have been dismissed. The government is currently considering its options and working with industry, including on possible w, uh, a possible WTO dispute. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Could I seek leave to make a short statement, Mr Leave President. is granted for one minute. Um, Labor won't be supporting this reference. We note that the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is currently undertaking a post-implementation review of CHAFTA, which parliamentarians will take great interest in. Australia's relationship with China is increasingly complex, but we cannot decouple. We must continue to engage. Australian jobs rely on it. This motion clearly reflects interest amongst senators about our bilateral relationship. It's the role of the government to provide leadership, to engage with parliamentarians, to explain our foreign policy and how the government is managing our relationships in the national interests. That's why we continue to encourage the government to provide briefings to parliamentarians. Leadership also means working with Australian exporters to diversify export markets instead of overseeing an increasing reliance on a single trading partner. question is Senator Lambie. Request leave to make a short statement, Mr President. Leave is not granted. Senator Lambie. Um, Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr President, i just ask for some clarification. I am the, mo the, the mover of this motion. It is being uh, co-sponsored by Senator Lambie. She is not the mover of the motion. And I'd just like some clarity in relation to this rule that is, uh, whereby leave is being denied on the basis uh, that someone is a co-sponsor. Um, Senator, Senator Patrick, I'll say technically you are moving a motion when your name is on it. Co-sponsoring is effectively moving a motion. One person stands up and does it in the chamber, but the name is on the motion. So on that basis, it's a matter for the whips as to the practice of this. Everyone knows my views. The question is that the motion moved by Senators Patrick and Lambie, number 875, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is motion number 875 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Patrick Teller for the ayes. Senator Urquhart Teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 13, noes 42. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Senator McKim, could I come to your matter number 888? Senator McKim. Uh, thank you very much, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 888 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator McKim. Thanks, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government doesn't see the need for another select committee to be established when there are other committees already capable of examining these matters. In relation to the proposed terms of reference, while 98 Commonwealth agencies are non-corporate, 71 are established as corporate entities and another 18 as Commonwealth companies. Uh, the scope of the proposed inquiry is excessively broad insofar as it looks at corporatised entities, potentially covering around half of all agencies, depending on how this is interpreted. Uh, the proposed inquiry could be better focused on particular services of government or better define the scope of corporatisation. The question is the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator McKim, number triple eight, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator C. What teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 11, noes 44. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Senator Lambie, could I come to your matter number 890, please? And I'll give you a moment to return to your seat. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 890 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. No decisions have yet been made with regard to the appropriate options and approaches to implement the more than 140 recommendations, as the complexity and sensitivity of the issues outlined in the report will take extensive and considered deliberation. The Chief of the Defence Force is leading the development of an implementation plan to action the recommendations made in the Brereton report and any other matters arising from the report that will require action. The government has established the Afghanistan Inquiry Implementation Oversight Panel to oversee all aspects of Defence's response to the Brereton report, and the government will have input into the proposed implementation plan and any actions as necessary. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, Labor won't be supporting this motion, but we do acknowledge it's a difficult and sensitive issue. As the Shadow Minister for Defence has said, the alleged behaviour of a few cannot be allowed to overshadow the contributions made by thousands of men and women who served our country with distinction in Afghanistan. Labor notes the statement released last night by the Chief of the Defence Force that no decisions have yet been made with regard to options and approaches to implement the recommendations of the Brereton Report and that further action in response to the report's recommendations will be considered as part of an implementation plan that is under development. The Brereton Report contains over 140 recommendations. It is entirely appropriate that Defence is given time and space to met met <laughs> methodically work through those re recommendations and its proposed responses. Senator Patrick. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, Mr President, I have a concern that removal of this citation uh, will affect uh, more than 3,000 people, most of whom serve their country extremely well, and the removal of the citation will in fact uh, perhaps uh, uh, serve as a, an implication, a wrongful implication in wrongdoing. Uh, we should target specifically those people who have done wrong in Afghanistan, uh, be very, very specific and surgical about how we do that. That includes soldiers and officers. Uh, at this stage, we should rule out removing that citation unless we get an understanding uh, that there, is, there was significant knowledge right throughout the units as to the conduct, and the Brereton report does not uh, in any way suggest that that is the case. question is, oh, Senator Steelejohn. I, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. All uh, who served in Afghanistan and did the right thing uh, deserve recognition for their service. The reality is that these uh, crimes, war crimes, are horrific and cast a shadow over everyone who served tainting their service experience. Uh, whilst the removal of the meritorious unit citation recognises this reality, the impact must not be felt uh, by the troops on the ground alone. It is so important that the chain of command, uh, the military top brass, are held to account for their failure to take action. We cannot allow defence leadership to apply one rule to their subordinates and another rule to themselves. Top levels of defence must face similar disciplinary actions whilst this investigation takes place, and Parliament MPs must be held responsible for their role in deploying our forces overseas. Order. The question is motion number 890 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Stop the bells. The question is motion number 890 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point to Senator Lambie teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 2, noes 53. The matter is resolved in the negative. Now, Senators, could I come to number 880 in the name of Senator Gallagher? Can. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 880 be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The Retirement Income Review was recommended by the Productivity Commission and comes 27 years after the establishment of compulsory superannuation. As the government has stated, it will now carefully consider the observations made in the review and will make a decision on the superannuation guarantee before its scheduled increase. The question is that motion number 880 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I come to 882, Senator Rice? President, I ask that general business Next notice of motion number 882 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rice. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I leave to make another short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, new uh, vehicle technology should be treated equitably with traditional petrol and diesel cars to ensure all motorists contribute to the upkeep of Australia's road infrastructure. 
The government is committed to enabling consumer choice for new vehicle technologies, including hybrids, hydrogen fuel cell and, of course, electric vehicles. The question is motion number 882 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could we come to 883, Senator Waters? Very much, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 883 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move the motion, which is an order for production of documents. Senator Dunham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, the report is on the public record, and I table the report. On that basis, then I assume um, are you going to seek leave to withdraw the motion, Senator Waters? No, I'm just happy it's been provided. Thank okay. you, Press. So I'll put the motion then. The question is. That motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can we come to 885, Senator O'Neill and others? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 885 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Number 887, I believe, is the last one. If I'm... Free of formal business. I, I thank senators. Order. I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 23 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Polly. Is the proposal supported? Oh, okay, thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The need for Mr Morrison to apologise for his role overseeing every aspect of the illegal robo-debt scheme as the Social Services Minister who designed it, the Treasurer who implemented it and the Prime Minister who settled the claims of victims for $1.2 billion and to establish a Royal Commission because that is the only way we need a forum with the coercive powers and broad jurisdiction necessary to properly investigate this fiasco. I've always liked numbers, so let's start with some numbers for those opposite who were all complicit in the 430,000 Australians who were illegally issued with robo-debt notices. Yes, 400,000 Australians targeted by the former Social Services Minister, former Treasurer and now Prime Minister of Australia. A $1.2 billion payout, which is the biggest class action settlement in Australian government history. How about a round of applause for those opposite? You made history, guys. Congratulations. You have cost the Australian taxpayer $1.2 billion. Then again, What's $1.2 billion to those opposite who are racking up a trillion dollars in national debt, the worst economic managers in the history of this country? We know on this side, and the Australian people know, that ministerial responsibility is dead in this country. And if there doesn't prove this, then I don't know what will. The arrogance of this government, who were forewarned that their actions were illegal. The automation process 
and the computerisation of the robo-debt was a decision made by the current government. Those opposite cannot escape that fact. As much as they would like to retry, because we know how often they come into this place and try and rewrite history, but those opposite haven't been advised that the scheme was illegal, and it took them months and months to act on this and to stop sending the debt notices out to vulnerable Australians. This could have been fixed quickly by the government, but instead they were dragged through the court process because of their ideological bent of they know best all the time and they are never wrong. Well, justice was served. The judiciary made a judgment and now the taxpayer is forced to pay because of the utter incompetence and arrogance of those opposite. Now, let's be clear here. 430,000 welfare recipients were wrongly accused by the Turnbull and Morrison governments of misreporting their income. This was an, an appalling injustice done to people who couldn't defend themselves. The callous, ruthless and impersonal way of pursuing welfare recipients was always brutal, and you can understand why it was designed by Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister, and is right up his alley. In the words of Mr Bill Shorten, who stood up for the 430,000 victims of this government, the Morrison government has been forced to give the money of those people back to them. Let's not forget that when Labor first raised the concerns of the 430,000 harassed and aggrieved Australians that received robo-debt notices, it was Stuart Roberts, the government's service minister and the prime minister who said it was merely a political stunt. Can you believe that? We know the mentality of those opposite. They want to stigmatise people on Centrelink, stigmatise people who receive money from the Commonwealth. They demonise people. They talk them down. And During this whole fiasco, the prime minister just said, there's nothing to see here. Move along. No one has been aggrieved. Well, how wrong was the Prime Minister? We knew all along that they were in the wrong. Well, Prime Minister, $1.2 billion of taxpayer money is not moving along. It's the taxpayers' money, and you, sir, cannot be trusted with the Australian Treasury anymore. This entire calamity could have been avoided if not for your philosophical hatred of people who receive welfare and at some point in their lives to make a fresh start, to be provided assistance for a short time in order to get back on their feet. The government has paid out $1.2 billion in the biggest settlement in Australian government history, and yet they argue that they are not liable. This isn't a comedy set, Mr Morrison. You take the Australian people for granted every single day. This government cannot run, around, run away from this issue like they try and run away from accountability and transparency every other day. The government is yet to explain how this scheme was so poorly administered. And the question must be asked. How do we get ourselves into a set of circumstances where ministers either knew that the law was being broken or never bothered to find out what the law was? How do we get to the situation where senior public servants, not the Centrelink staff at the counter, but the senior public service authorised a scheme which was illegal? There is a human toll to this whole fiasco. 430,000 people and their families who endured the torment and shame, and it is shame, of being hunted and victimised by their government. The government's actions did and has consequences on people's lives. I know those people on that side, they really don't give a damn. They don't. Otherwise, they would have thought before they acted. They couldn't get jobs because they had a debt finding. To families and people who had shame and stigma, a lot of people who don't want to be on Centrelink and were embarrassed about their debt. Whether they really had a debt or not, they still felt that shame. 
People were mistreated and they deserve a sincere apology from the Prime Minister, from Minister Robert and from those opposite. I want to conclude by acknowledging that the settlement is justice for the victims who have been treated terribly, shamefully by the Morrison government. For years, the Morrison government has been in denial about robo-debt's fairness and legality, even after the robo-debt scheme was proven through the courts to be illegal. What have we seen? Nothing in the way of an apology from either the Prime Minister or Minister Roberts. We know the anxiety. We know the extra poverty that was caused, and we even know that there were suicides because of the shame and for those who couldn't fight what they perceived to be the government who would have to be in the right when they couldn't prove that they didn't own a debt. Some of those people, unfortunately, took their own lives. Their families have been left devastated. devastated. It is only after the prospect of co coalition ministers, such as the former Minister for Health Services, Alan Charge, having to take the witness stand to answer questions on what they knew that the government has now agreed to pay a fair amount of compensation to these victims. What is the dirty secret about robo-debt's origins that the government doesn't want anyone to know? Were they told it was illegal and, in, and ignored that advice from the outset? Did they not check its legality at all before unleashing it on unsuspecting public? How much taxpayer money has the Morrison government wasted fighting this unwinnable case? Only a royal commission into the robo-debt will give the public the answers that they deserve. In the meantime, Mr Morrison should have sacked Minister Roberts. Everything that guy touches turns to stone. He's hopeless. He's undefensible in terms of his actions and the stupidity of the way this whole fiasco was handled. There's so many on that side of the chamber that don't deserve to be ministers. We've got Richard Colbeck, another failed minister in his responsibilities. And Stuart Roberts is almost like the gift that keeps on giving. Every single time he has his fingers in a pie, it turns to stone. This has been a national disgrace Senator and it's a scandal. Polly, your time has expired. So that's you. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the matter of importance regarding Centrelink's income compliance program raised by Senator Polly. It is important for Senator Polly and those opposite to keep in mind that in a circumstance where Australians have received money from the taxpayer to which they were not entitled, the government would seek to recover that money. The Australian public expects the government to do that, and that is what has been done and continues to be done. Our social security system requires income support recipients to meet eligibility requirements around income and assets to ensure support is being provided to those who need it most. The welfare system is an important safety net, but equally requires compliance measures to be undertaken so people receive the correct payment and meet their obligations. Such compliance includes checking discrepancies between reported income to identify potential overpayments and, as appropriate, recover debts. This is a welfare system that is sustainable and one that has integrity. However, before I speak further about debts raised via the Income Compliance Program, I wish to address a serious issue that has been repeatedly brought up in Parliament in relation to this program and has again this afternoon. I'm speaking about mental health and, specifically, the claims around suicides resulting from this Income Compliance Program. Mental health is one of the biggest challenges of our society. The Australian government takes mental health seriously, so seriously that the Prime Minister appointed Christine Morgan as the National Suicide Prevention Advisor last year. We are taking action on mental health so families, communities and people experiencing trauma can, can get the support they need. 
The Suicide Prevention Task Force briefed the Senate Community Affairs References Committee inquiry into the Centrelink compliance program. Task Force representatives told the committee, of which I am the deputy chair, that research indicates there is no single reason why someone dies by suicide. Drawing mental health into this debate does not help matters. In fact, it hinders them. It is time for par my parliamentary colleagues on all sides to treat this issue with sensitivity so as not to place undue stress and trauma on those impacted by it. In dealing with mental health at the agency level, Services Australia has an extensive social worker net network to support in such critical situations. This social, net social worker network can be reached by calling 132 850. Too much is at stake to make people's mental health a political issue. Activities and policies relating to the recovery of money from social security recipients who have been overpaid, either inadvertently or through deliberate fraud, are known as the Income Compliance Program. The specific Income Compliance Program we're discussing here today was established in 2015 through the better management of the social welfare system measure announced in the 2015-16 budget. Resolving discrepancies and errors in social security payments, including errors of overpayment, is a routine part of the administration of Australia's social security system. This has been the case for many decades, with a range of integrity measures adopted during that time, including the Income Compliance Program. As a result of feedback, the program has been through various iterations. The Income Compliance Program, built on existing income compliance previous programs and was designed to identify social security overpayments through discrepancies between the annual income reported by an individual to Centrelink up to seven years before the date of review and income assessed by the Australian Taxation Office for that same period. Discrepancies were identified by averaging lump sum income assessed by the ATO over the period the income was earned in and compared to earnings reported to and income support received from Centrelink across the same period. Data matching and income averaging processes, like the practice I have just described, have been used as a tool to help identify potential social security overpayments since at least the 1990s, with taxation information used to inform the practice since 2004. The methodology of averaging income was provided for in the Social Security Act 1991 and its predecessor, the Social Security Act 1947. The first data matching program was established under the Data Matching Program Assistance and Tax Act 1990 and involved an exchange of data about an individual's taxable income between the ATO and relevant government departments. Services Australia undertook a review of income compliance debts raised in 2009 and 2011 using a random sample of 500 cases in each year. The analysis found that 16.8 per cent of the sampled debts in 2009 were raised through the use of averaged ATO income data and 24.4 per cent in 2011. And noting that averaging of ATO income information was used when other information was not available or when people did not engage with Centrelink. Minister Stuart Robert announced changes to the Income Compliance Program in November 2019 when announcing that averaged ATO income by itself was an insufficient basis upon which to raise a debt. Further proof points were needed. Since Minister Robert's announcements about changes to the program, Services Australia has engaged with more than 35 organisations and advocacy groups. It has also undertaken 17 user research activities piloted the refund process, engaged with the Ombudsman's Office on draft refund letters and met with representatives from the Civil Society Advisory Group with further updates on the agency's progress in refunding customers. Services Australia has made a number of changes to its systems to improve the user experience, including in introducing registered mail to guarantee delivery of letters before reviews start and dedicated phone support and assistance from compliance officers to help recipients understand what will happen and is required during a review. In his April 2019 report, the Commonwealth Ombudsman commented positively on this enhanced customer experience, including improved letters and income compliance correspondence. And now simplified income reporting combined with single touch payroll means information can be accessed more easily, which will reduce errors. 
The court case to which Senator Polly refers in this matter, the Income Compliance Program Class Action, or Prigadix versus the Commonwealth, was the result of using income averaging to determine debts. We now know and acknowledge that this was not a valid method to determine debts. In June this year, the Prime Minister apologised to the people who had been impacted by that method of determining debts to be collected. The Department of Social Services and Service Australia also apologised for the harm and hurt caused by the program and committed to applying lessons learnt from it in the future. Importantly, as soon as this government became aware that this method of debt calculation was invalid, the practice was immediately stopped. Those Australians who received debt notices resulting from income averaging were paid back that money. As at the 30th of November, $707.7 million has, had been refunded to 406,889 people. This accounts for around 95 per cent of people affected and 95 per cent of refunds by value. Around 23,100 people are still to be refunded and or have their debt zeroed if they hadn't made any payments. Under the settlement, the Commonwealth will make a payment of $112 million in the nature of interest to be distributed to eligible group members. It should be noted, however, that using this method to determine debt is not something this government, current government has developed. It was actually something the Labor Party came up with and supported. Indeed, the then Minister for Human Services, Tanya Plibersek, said on the 29th of June 2011, if people fail to come to an arrangement to settle their debts, the government has a responsibility to taxpayers to recover that money. This statement was backed up by Bill Shorten, who said the automation of this process will free up resources and result in more people being referred to the tax garnishee process, retrieving more outstanding debt on behalf of taxpayers on the same day. Senator Polly has called for a Royal Commission to investigate the Income Compliance Program. A court case on this matter has already been finalised and the settlement agreed. While a Royal Commission provides a high level of investigation and inquiry, and inquiry, which is at times warranted and vital to ensure complex issues are investigated thoroughly, it is not a court and does not exercise judicial power. In the words of former Chief Justice of the High Court, Justice Gibbs, a Royal Commission is a mere inquiry which cannot lead to judgment. Further, Justice Gibbs said, Royal Commissions act in a purely inquisitorial capacity. The coronavirus pandemic has resulted in a temporary pause on debt collection activity to help ease the pressure on household budgets. However, existing income compliance debts will continue to be subject to recovery, ensuring the integrity of Australia's welfare system. The Prime Minister, the Department of Social Services and Services Australia has already apologised for the impact of the debt recovery practice during this income compliance program. The debt amounts repaid to those impacted, the court case settled and additional compensation agreed. A further inquiry in the form of a Royal Commission is unnecessary and Senator unwarranted. Askew, Thank you. Your time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Deputy Pre Acting Deputy President. I rise somewhat out of breath to contribute to this debate, which is, of course, about the need for Mr Morrison to apologise for his role overseeing every aspect of the illegal robo-debt scheme as the social service minister who designed it, the treasurer who implemented it and the prime minister who settled the claims of victims for $1.2 billion and to establish a royal commission because that is the only forum with the coercive powers and the broad jurisdiction necessary to properly investigate this fiasco. And I agree. We absolutely need a royal commission because this government settled the robo-debt, and I will always call it robo-debt, despite what the government says, because it was robo-debt and it was illegal. This fiddling around with language to say it's legally insufficient, it was illegal. And the government has settled this case because they didn't want, they didn't want public servants who knew what went on and ministers who knew what went on to be called into court to actually establish when they knew this was illegal, when they knew it was illegal. And they must have known because we established in estimates just a couple of weeks ago, we went through the process of the AAT. 
Now, either they weren't reading the reports of the AAT, and quite clearly, at estimates, we were told people had been reading them. We were told the process that you go through when an AAT process and decision is made. And there's been a number, a large number of cases that must have clearly pointed out that these debts were not legally based. So this government doesn't want people in court being asked questions that may be slightly inconvenient. So of course they settled the class action. Of course they settled it. That's why we need a Royal Commission to forensically analyse what went on, who knew what, when and where that information is held. We need to also go back before 2015, because these debts, this process isn't going back before 2015, and we can't get access through, when I say we, the Community Affairs Commi References Committee that is inquiring into the Centrelink compliance program, who has asked for various bits of information, and the government won't provide that under the claims of public interest immunity, including executive minutes, including their decision-making process for why uh, looking at debts prior to 2015. Now, that information is, in my opinion, in the public interest to release it. But no, will this government release it? No, they won't. They hide behind public interest immunity. But they think that because they're now settling, not quite settled yet, because it still, I, I know, has to go through the final approval process, but they have effectively they have agreed to settle, because they think that people will stop asking questions about when they knew it was illegal, who knew it was illegal. Why didn't the Prime Minister, who was then the Minister for Social Services when this new accelerated process of income averaging turbocharged through robo-debt, when that was introduced? The Prime Minister knew then. Then he became the Treasurer and now he's the Prime Minister. What did he know? What did he know about it? What did all the other ministers who we've had, let me remember, Christian Porter, oh yeah, he's the Attorney General. We've had Dan Tehan. We've had Alan Tudge. We've had Stuart Robert a couple of times as the Minister for Human Services and now the, ministers for, the Minister for Service Australia. What none of them asked, and now the, minister, the current minister, for social services, Minister Rustin, did they not ask, oh, is this legal? What's the legal basis for this? Of course, they must have asked those questions. We also, talk, the, the, we also need to discuss the issue around the apology. Now, would this count as an apology? I ask this question. I would apologise for any hurt or harm in the way that the government has dealt with that issue and to anybody else who has found themselves in those circumstances, situation. Of course, I would deeply regret any hardship that has been caused to people in the conduct of that activity. This is the Prime Minister's so-called apology. What, he doesn't know that there's, people were hurt by this? hundreds of thousands of people subjected to their legal, illegal robo-debt fiasco, people articulating very clearly the hurt and distress. And if he'd bothered, if he hadn't listened to any of the radio stories about it, watched any of the TV stories about it, read any of the media, media articles about it, you would have thought that one of the ministers, particularly the Prime Minister, would have had a look at the Senate inquiry and the Hansard transcripts, which clearly articulated people's deep, deep distress and anxiety. So when he says any hurt or harm, of course there's hurt and harm. We know there's the worst possible harm because we know 
because we've had evidence from families about the impact on people's mental ill health to the point and distress and anxiety to the point where we know that some people, as a result of robo-debt, did take their lives. That is the most distressing, awful thing for the people that took their lives and for their families. And we've had evidence to the Senate inquiry, and I've had it personally from families, about the impact that robo-debt had. Everybody in this country knows that it caused hurt and harm and distress. So that is not an apology. That is not a heartfelt apology that acknowledges the hurt, harm, anxiety, stress that it has caused hundreds of thousands of people. Because the government, once again, was picking and demonising people on income support and thought they could save money, in fact recoup, so-called recoup money, over the most vulnerable members of our community. This government has, and, and started in fact with the Howard government, demonising people on income support, accusing people with disability of rorting the system, saying, subjecting them to welfare to work, and that continued on. That continued on through the Howard, through, past the Howard government into the Abbott government, where he accused people of sitting, Mr. A, Mr. Abbott, as Prime Minister, accused people of on the doll sitting on the couch, accused people of rorting the disability pension or the income support system. So this was the mindset that was used to dream up robo-debt, while the now Prime Minister was the Minister for Social Services. In other words, the person entrusted to look after Australians, to support Australians who are most vulnerable and most in need. What did, what did the now Prime Minister oversee? was the start and the initiation of the robo-debt scheme to make money off the backs of those very people that, as minister, he should have been working for and to ensure got support that they needed. Not letters saying you could owe thousands of dollars. And when you get a letter or the debt collector turns up at your door, which is what happened to people, and say you own thousands of money, it has the most significant impact on you. This has caused deep hurt and trauma, and it needs a full apology and a royal commission. Thank you, Senator Seward. Well, this gives me great pleasure to welcome Senator Billick. Now, which camera do I look at? Can you hear me, Mr. Yes, Acting Senator Justice Billick. President? Okay. That Thanks, one? Mr. Sorry. Senator Billick. Thank you. I speak today about the matter of public importance, that is robo-debt, and the Prime Minister's failure to accept fault for his actions as Minister, Treasurer and Prime Minister. He's completed a trifecta that nobody would want to win on a program that was illegal and executed atrociously. He was the Minister who designed robo-debt. He was the Treasurer that cashed the money from robo-debt and the Prime Minister who refused to fix it. We can look at the numbers and they're large, but what are we dealing with? We're not dealing with numbers, we're dealing with the lives of hundreds of thousands of fellow Australians. Hundreds of thousands of Australians who have been put through unnecessary stress and heartache of having to disprove their liability for debts that they didn't owe, of being treated so badly that some of them did take their own life, and I'll come to that in a while. And they've been put through this heartache because of the callousness and the incompetence of Mr Morrison and his government. So those opposite, they can try to defend their position and deny the undeniable and talk about mental health programs implemented, but the reality is that this government caused the angst and anxiety felt by participants caught up 
in the Robo Debt Fiasco. It's all on them. Now, I'm a member of the Community Affairs Reference, References Committee. As uh, Senator Seward said, we're undertaking an inquiry into Centrelink's compliance program, as Robo Debt is formally known. And as a member of that committee, I've heard evidence and read submissions from witnesses whose lives were completely devastated by the program. And we heard some really distressing evidence. Let me tell you about Ms Kath Madwick, who believes her son Jared's robodeck contributed to him eventually taking his own life. She wrote a letter to the committee that was read into evidence during a public hearing of the committee. And I'll just quote a part of it. She says, my son Jared Madwick was an amazing, caring, intelligent boy. He was a loving and protective son. And if it were not for the automated compliance letter and the threat of a debt, Jared would have been sabotaging my cooking with cayenne pepper and giving me his cheeky giggle when he got caught that night and my son would be sitting next to me today. Instead, he was extremely distressed and it pushed him to make an impulsive decision. Jared was not planning his death. He was desperately applying for jobs and he had an interview scheduled with the Army on the 4th of June. So I'd just like to express my condolences to Miss Madwick and her family, as well as to all the families who lost a loved one because of this awful program. But what's been truly shocking to me has been the reaction of the government and some of its officials. During that same hearing of the committee, a department official refused to accept that there were suicides caused by this program. This was even after being presented with the test testimony of uh, Mrs Madwick that I've just quoted. And Ms Madwick is not the only grieving parent to have made this claim. So I really think it's time for the government to take seriously the parents and the loved ones of those who have taken their lives who are saying this program pushed them over the edge because lives were ruined by this program. Lives were lost because of this program. And yesterday in question time in the Senate, the government warned us about speaking about the lives lost, supposedly out of a sense of respect. But I say this, it's a damn shame they didn't have that same sense of respect when they were harassing people about debts they didn't owe. 430,000 people was treated as cheats and debtors by the government and they paid the government thousands of dollars when they didn't owe them a cent. The government didn't show Australians respect when instead of admitting fault, former robo-debt minister Stuart Robert denied for months that the standover scheme was unfair, inaccurate or illegal. Instead, the government spent years trying to defend the program, dragged its feet on the class action for months, and then finally, just on the cusp of the trial, but without admitting any liability, they decided to settle. And I agree with Senator Seward when she says that it's because those ministers would not want to have to stand up in a court of law and swear that what they were saying was the truth. We've got Minister Porter, the Attorney General and former Minister for Social Services. He still doesn't show respect when he continues to call the dodgy scheme legally insufficient rather than downright illegal, which it's been shown to be. And I think the government's understanding of respect needs to be seriously reconsidered. It's not showing respect to raise debts through illegal means, often for thousands of dollars, against people who are struggling to get by already. And shamefully, this program seems to have targeted particularly vulnerable people. I would like to take a few moments just to outline a case that appeared in the media. So Mr Christopher Pascoe is a 53-year-old man living with epilepsy and an intellectual disability. In July 2018, he received notice of a debt of over $15,000 from Centrelink. Now, the department alleged there was a mismatch between the income he declared to the, to the department dating from 2013 to 2016 compared to what he actually earned. Well, Mr Pascoe doesn't declare his income to Centrelink, which is a common arrangement for people who have a disability that limits their ability to handle their own finances. Mr Pascoe's mother has described the situation as, and I quote, it's really sort of disability bullying to me. Centrelink sub subsequently admitted that they made a mistake, wiping $5,000 off the debt in February 2019, before offering to waive the debt after his story was aired on the ABC show at 
Now, it shouldn't have to take going to national media to get an incorrectly raised debt wiped. This scheme has caused enormous heartache, but the government refuses to take responsibility. And under persistent questioning by Labor, in and out of the parliament, uh, the minister, uh, the former minister, Stuart Robert, has said, we will not apologise and spoke about the integrity of the welfare system. I'd like to remind the minister that an integrity isn't illegally stealing hundreds of millions of dollars from hundreds of thousands of vulnerable Australians. Robo-debt victims need and deserve an apology from Minister Robert. And we need a proper apology from the Prime Minister, who will only say he has deep regret. I mean, seriously, that was not an apology. If an apology isn't genuine, it's not worth the breath people use to say it. But more than an apology, we need to determine what went wrong and how. And the Australian people have a right to know and deserve to know who was actually responsible responsible. So we need to determine how it happened, that ministers either knew that the law was being broken and did nothing about it, or never bothered even to find out if the law, law had been broken in the first place. We need to discover how we got into the situation with senior public servants authorising a scheme which was illegal. Because if we don't know how this disaster occurred, how can we ensure that it won't happen again? So. Labor is calling for a Royal Commission into robo-debt and we will continue to do so because it is the most appropriate way to investigate this absolutely disastrous policy. Royal Commissions have broad powers to hold public hearings, call witnesses under oath and compel evidence. So I can see why the government don't want to have one. And we've seen the power of Royal Commissions recently with the Disability Royal Commission as well as the Royal Commission into aged care and quality and safety. And in both of these cases, what we already knew was shocking, but what was revealed through the Royal Commission's proceedings was even worse. So it begs the question, how bad is what we don't already know about the robo-debt debacle? How bad is it? Now, it's important to remember that robo-debt was the brainchild of Mr Morrison when he was Minister for Social Services. And he was the treasurer who announced it. And finally, he was the Prime Minister who failed to stop the implementation of his own botched policy, and now the government have to pay out $1.2 billion in refunds, debt eliminations and compensations. So that explains why we can't find out what the government knew and when. I, I really think there's a fair bit of the PM protecting his own bum going on here. Only the Royal Commission can determine what really happened and who's to blame. The fact that it took the biggest class action in Australian history before the government finally started to put things right is extremely disappointing. Because the government knew years ago that things weren't right. They had made an enormous change to the system without thinking through the practical outcomes or the legalities. And while governments had previously matched ATO data with Centrelink data, this government automated it and took out the human oversight element, moving from 20,000 cases a year to 20,000 cases a week. It was once due as the last resort, but under this government, it just turned into an extortion racket. The government unjustly enriched itself with $720 million that was stolen from vulnerable Australians, and it did so at the cost of over Order, $600 Senator million. Order, Senator time has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Madam Acting Deputy President, I love a good novel, love a good bit of creative writing, but this parliament is no place for creative writing. It's no place for rewriting history. It's no place for the weaving of fantasy novels in the context of parliamentary speeches, because Labor would have you believe that income averaging and debt recovery all had its beginnings in 2015. And the fact, I take these interjections from Senator Pratt because the very fact that she insists on yelling perpetually over me shows how much she wants to go la 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 and pretend she doesn't have to hear the truth. But the facts are these, and the Australian people have more open mindedness than we'll get from Senator Pratt. So, when it comes to the issue of when debt recovery started, it's important to understand that this government did not invent income averaging. Income averaging has been a program 
in our Centrelink compliance system for a very long time. We actually need to go back not five years, not ten years, but 26 years. So let's take a look at the evidence, but first let's put a bit of a definition around the term robo-debt, because it's used as a bit of a slogan by those opposite to cover all manner of ills. But in the minds of Australians, the, the mum and dads who might be listening at home, robo-debt means the use of computers to compare actual income with declared income to work out if there's any kind of discrepancies and to make sure that a person is getting the right amount in their welfare check. Now, I've got a letter right here sent to an Australian citizen in 1994 under the Keating Labor government about data matching pertaining to their new start allowance. And it says, if you do not reply, we will use the tax officer's information about your income and we will write to you about how much money you need to pay back. I've also got here from 1994 the Department of Social Services example letter that was used in all cases at that time to alert citizens of the fact of ATO income matching processes going on in relation to their Centrelink account. Now, these letters, these letters demonstrate that data matching, income averaging and ATO cross-checks were all commonplace under what was the last Labor government to deliver a budget surplus. Now, a far cry, I would suggest, from the allegations that are made in the text of this matter of public importance. So let's fast forward now to the next Labor government. In 2011, the Gillard government introduced an automated system of cross-matching data from two agencies. And I've done my homework. I've got a couple of documents here that prove it. First, a joint press release from 2011 by the then Human Services Minister, Ms Plibersek, and Assistant Treasurer, Mr Shorten, announcing an automated system of income matching from the Tax Office and Centrelink. Sounds an awful lot like robo-debt to me, but it's titled New Data Matching to Recover Millions in Welfare Dollars. It states, if people fail to come to an arrangement to settle their debts, the government has a responsibility to taxpayers to recover that money. Yeah, it goes on to state, the automation, there's a key word Senator Pratt won't like, the automation of this process will free up resources and result in more people being referred to the tax garnishee process, retrieving more outstanding debt on behalf of taxpayers. Now, if that's not enough for you, Madam Acting Deputy President, I've also got here a press release from the member from McMahon. Yes, Mr Bowen. And on it, he boasts, Centrelink conducted 3.8 million payment reviews resulting in the reduction of 641,000 payments, saving $2.27 billion using, you guessed it, data matching, um, robo-debt no less. And I also have right here an article from the Australian well-respected newspaper titled Labor Flip-Flops on Robo-Debt System that Shorten Plibersek pioneered. It goes on to state, in what must be devastating words for those opposite, Labor's leadership team of Bill Shorten and Tanya Plibersek pioneered the robo-debt data matching system Centrelink is using to target current and former welfare recipients for apparently not declaring their income properly, but now they argue it should be suspended. Now, that's really very interesting to me, given the um, the outrage, the confected outrage, the, the froth and bubble we get from those opposite, because you'd think from the way that they're talking, this was a recent invention. But no, no, that's not the case at all. So if you don't like the Australian or if you're inclined to say, oh, that's just some right-wing rag, don't believe them, well, the far-left publication of The Guardian decided that it also met their test and 
when you're getting the same thing published in The Australian and in The Guardian, those opposite love to quote The Guardian, then I think you can feel a little bit more comfortable that we aren't mincing things up. Now, the Guardian concedes that the automated income matching process was designed and implemented by Mr Shorten and Ms Plibersek. The Guardian article states, the former Labor government did introduce the process. You wouldn't know it from what we're hearing from those opposite. In fact, even all the way up until last year, Labor was all aboard the robo-debt train. And so, when they protest now, it's just not very convincing. So, let's do another little fact check. The policy costings that Labor took to the 2019 federal election were released by the Parliamentary Budget Office. And when you have a little dig through those, you notice they haven't made any of the changes that would be needed in their costings to reflect a reversal of the policy of robo-debt. In fact, Labor's social security policies, the ones they brought to the 2019 federal election, the very team we see opposite, did not include the reversal of the policy of using robo-debt. Labor's own budget plans from the 2019 federal election did not include that reversal. In fact, they banked the expected savings from the operation of the robo-debt program to fund their big spending election commitments. And they stand here and tell us they had nothing to do with it. It's pretty galling, if you ask me. You know, it's another one of those occasions where it's fair to say that hypocrisy by name is Labor. And so when Mr Shorten couldn't defend his own tragic record on robo-debt when interviewed last year by journalist Patricia Cavallis, even she wasn't buying the line. She said, you've spoken today about how much harm this program has done. Do you regret creating it? And do you not regret opposing it before the election? Mr Shorten said, Labor didn't create it. And Ms Cavalla said, yeah, no, Labor did create robo-debt. I know, I've watched it. I did. Mr Shorten says, Patricia, this is not government propaganda hour. And Ms Cavalla says, yeah, but you created this computer-generated system, right? And of course, the truth was a little too awkward to bear. In fact, Social welfare activist Asha Wolfe also knows Labor's hypocrisy when it comes to robo-debt. She tweeted on the 30th of May this year, quote, Shorten only jumped on board the campaign against robo-debt after he lost the 2019 election, close quote. So what can we learn from all of this? Well, we know that income averaging and the automation of data cross-checking is an intergenerational Labor scheme, invented, designed and championed by two Labor governments. It's Labor who should be apologising. They should be apologising for failing to be frank with the Australian people. It's Labor who should be apologising for their short memories or their creative writing or their looseness with the truth. Or maybe they should also apologise for their list of epic fails in boats, pink bats, cash for clunkers, Order, school halls. Senator Stoke, we can add this expired. one. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And that indeed was a very, very unfortunate contribution to this debate because it neither it neither it, it neither accepted the hurt to 400,000 Australians that this government's robo debt has impacted on, and neither did it seem to take the matter seriously. It was an absolute disgrace, that contribution, because this is indeed a very grave and serious matter of public importance. For 400,000 of Australians, this is a deeply personal and painful matter, because their own government effectively lied about them and stole from them. Now, you can only accept two things. Either that was their objective in the first place, they were 
just out there to get money back to, to bolster their bottom line, or they're just incompetent. It can only be one or the, or the other. So I'd be happy, and I'm sure the 400,000 people that they vilified would be happy if they could just fess up. But what this government did with the robo-debt, they did with a very heavy hand, meeting out pain, suffering, based on flimsy and false evidence that debts were owed. It did so in particularly galling fashion, in a patronising way, saying to everyone, to everyday Australians, pretty much like the contribution we just received, very patronising. You know, you know you owe us money. We know best. Don't challenge us. Fess up. Cough up. Only these Australians had done nothing wrong. They didn't owe the government any money. There was no debt, only a fantasy debt, dreamed up by the Social Services Minister, desperate to, to prove himself by um, preying on the weak and vulnerable, because that's the sort of thing that earns you brownie points among the Liberal Party circles of the chattering classes. As Social Services Minister Scott Morrison bragged and boasted about this illegal scheme, designed with intent to scare, intimidate and to thrash, thrash about with the big stick. Only the people on the receiving end, many hundreds of thousands of ordinary Australians, had done nothing, absolutely nothing wrong. They didn't deserve this treatment. The damage to people's mental and physical health wrought from this scheme has been profound. In the state that I represent, over 15,000 Tasmanians are estimated to be victims of this Prime Minister's botched, dodgy, dehumanising, indeed malevolent scheme. It was his scheme as Social Services Minister. He designed it. As Treasurer, Mr Morrison was the implementer and the enforcer of this scheme. And now, as Prime Minister, he has been forced to come to the biggest settlement of any Australian government in history over this illegal scheme, a $1.2 billion settlement. What a blunder, what a backflip, what a disgrace. And yes, why this settlement, as humiliating and as humbling as it must be, goes some way towards justice for everyday Australians who are victims of this illegal scheme. The fact is they deserve so much more. They deserve more from their government. Australian governments are vested with the responsibility of protecting Australian people, securing them from harm and predatory behaviour. Only in this instance, it was their own government the Australian people had to fear. The victims of this illegal scheme deserve nothing less than a royal commission, because a royal commission is the only forum vested with coercive powers and broad juris jurisdiction that can properly investigate this blight on our nation. This fa fiasco of the Prime Minister's own making, the truly extraordinary thing about this scandal is that it has, been, has followed this Prime Minister through every portfolio he's held since the coalition has come to office. It was his baby as Social Services Minister. It was, it was meant to be his cash cow as tre Treasurer, and as Prime Minister it landed him, in a, him a spot in history as the man responsible for the largest ever settlement by a government in Australian class action history. That is why he remains uninterested in getting to the bottom of this matter. He's uninterested in finding the truth, uninterested in the transparency needed to reveal just how badly this went wrong, uninterested in holding anyone to account, because the person who needs to be held to account more than any other in this sorry saga is none other than the Prime Minister himself. No wonder he hasn't held anyone to account for it. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Income Compliance Program. The term robo-debt was first used in 2016 in relation to debt raised through the Online Compliance Intervention Program. The catch-all robo-debt name has been used incorrectly for all Centrelink debts, creating confusion amongst the Australian public. Labor would have you believe that they would do things differently, but in fact, Labor created this computer-generated system while it was in what well, it was in fact in government. You might remember that because you probably won't see it again for a while. Anthony Albanese cannot escape that harsh truth. He is so disingenuous that in fact 
Labor's policy costings for the 2019 federal election released by the Parliamentary Budget Office did not include the reversal of robo-debt. Labor's social security policies that they brought to the 2019 federal election did not include the reversal of robo-debt. And Labor's own budget plan from the 2019 federal election didn't include the reversal of robo-debt and banked the savings of robo-debt to fund their election commitments. In stark contrast, the Morrison government remains committed to the continued improvement of the income compliance program. And the Prime Minister has apologised for any hurt or harm this program has caused. And if we go back to the 9th of May 2019, when Bill Shorten was directly asked about robo-debt system, he said, and I quote, we want to make sure that people aren't receiving welfare to which they're not entitled to, and no one gets a leave pass on that. The income compliance program was developed to make identifying welfare overpayments more efficient. It assisted with reviews where customers didn't respond for fully, fully engaging with requests to clarify discrepancy between income earnings reported to Centrelink and the Australian Taxation Office. Services Australia, as part of its commitment to continuous improvement, has engaged with more than 35 organisations, including advocacy groups in recent times. And it's piloted the first refund process, engaged with the Ombudsman's Office on draft refund letters, and met with the Civil Society Advisory Group with further updates on the agency's progress in refunding customers. In fact, the Commonwealth Ombudsman, in his most recent report, commented positively on the enhanced customer experience, including improved letters and income compliance correspondence. From July this year, Services Australia commenced repayments made on debts using income averaging based on ATO data. The number of debts or debt notices raised wholly or partially using income averaging of Australian Taxation Office data is approximately 525,000. The total value of refunds, including recovery fees and or interest charges, is estimated at $741.6 million. 430,000 people will have their debt zeroed, and of these, approximately 378,000 people will also receive a refund, and approximately 52,000 won't receive a refund, as no repayment was ever made. But with regards to refunds and the progress made to date, as at 30 November 2020, 406, 889 people have had their refunds completed. That means they've been processed or their debt zeroed, with a total value of $700.7 .7 million in refunds paid, about 95 per cent of people and 95 per cent of refunds by value. So approximately 134 and 50 former customers have completed the online task for a refund with payments being processed and approximately 23 100 people are still to be refunded or have their debt zeroed. Of these, 10,150 customers require tailored servicing by Service Australia due to their individual circumstances such as incarceration or bankruptcy. And then we've got 12,950 former customers need to complete their refund pending task in MyGov to trigger their refund. There's also been advances in simplifying the income reporting, with 1.2 million income support recipients who report earnings will benefit from a simpler way of reporting their employment income. From 7 December 2020, income support recipients will find it easier to report their income by using their, found on their payslip rather than trying to calculate what they've earned in a fortnightly entitlement period. Order, Senator Hughes. The time for the discussion has expired. I shall now move to the consideration of documents which are listed on page four of today's order of business. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to take note of items one and three on page four of the red and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. We will move on then to committee reports. Um, uh, Senator Davey. Thank you. On behalf of the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System, I present oh, I can't say this word, a corrigendum to the interim report of the committee. And do you seek leave to continue uh, your remarks, Senator Davey? Yes. No? 
Okay, no worries. Um, I, uh, Senator Davey again. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, I present the advisory report of the Committee on the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment ensuring fair representation of the Northern Territory Bill 2020 and move that the Senate take note of the report and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Davey. Uh, Senator Brown. Hi. I, I wish to speak on the report of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters into the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment ensuring fair representation of the Northern Territory Bill 2020. Uh, are you also I note Labor members and senators supported recommendations of this report. To reach this port of bipartisan consensus on this matter with this bill is truly gratifying, but it has not been without substantial effort and commitment from those advocating for the rights of Territorians. I want to acknowledge in this place Senators McCarthy and McMahon for their advocacy. It is also important, I think, to acknowledge the author and co-sponsor of this bill, Senator Farrell, for the hard work of placing this on the table and pursuing this matter of fairness well before the government came on board. I'd also like to thank the chair, Senator McGrath. This report and the chair's subsequent dra drafting of its own bill has, has really been the case of the, the government's um, coming on board, only following a sustained campaign by the Labor Party and, indeed, pressure from the National Party. Labor certainly welcomes the fact that the government has now agreed to legislate to guarantee a minimum two seats in the House of Representatives for both the Northern Territory and the ACT. The committee's inquiry into this bill followed its introduction into the Senate by Senator McCarthy on the 11th of June this year. I do want to particularly acknowledge Senator McCarthy's efforts on this campaign, but also the tireless way in which he fights for Territorians in this place every day. The committee's inquiry received over 60 submissions and heard from over 20 witnesses at its public hearing. It should be noted that all but a few submissions were strongly in favour of Labor's bill. As it noted, while the constitution mandates the states a minimum representation of five seats in the House of Representatives, it leaves the matter of territory representation to the in the lower house as entirely a matter for parliament. Therefore, it was more than appropriate for this place to take action to prevent one of the most remote parts of this nation, with a high proportion of First Nations people, from effectively having its representation in, the, in this place, that, that for, in the place that forms government slashed in half, should no action be taken. As ex examined, this would have been the outcome if, this re if representation were de determined based on the Australian Electoral Commission's population determined as as made on the 3rd of July this year. This was particularly concerning to the committee and had troubled Labor for some time, given competing estimates of territory population projections from the Northern Territory government vis-a-vis -vis the Australian Bureau of Statistics and ultimately other submissions to the committee. Recommendation one of this report deals with this. The key issue of this bill by recommending a floor of two seats for the territories rather than one. A recommendation that Labor has been pursuing many in the Territory had advocated for and for some considerable time. It is pleasing to see that the government has listed their bill, which will make this enhanced representation floor a reality for debate in the Senate later this week. Labor has always flagged our support for this bill. Again, I commend the efforts of the many people who have campaigned for fair representation for the Territory and I commend the report to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. Well, this is a significant moment in the history for the Northern Territory and indeed uh, for the Australian Parliament. Right now, as of July 3 this year, the geographical area of the Northern Territory and its more than 140,000 enrolled voters are so just one electoral division. Over 1.3 million square kilometres of the Northern Territory is one single seat at the moment, according to the Australian Electoral Commission. That's why this report today in the Senate, and that's why the decision of the Senate to protect the two seats of the Northern Territory is absolutely critical. If an election was to be held tomorrow, all of us in the Northern Territory, including the offshore territories of the Cocos and Christmas Islands, would be casting their vote for just one federal representative. 
It would certainly be back to the future for Territorians, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I'd like to just share a little bit of the history of the Northern Territory. And I'm going to do this over a couple of days, as I'm sure my uh, fellow uh, Senate colleague uh, Sam McMahon will also be doing. The Northern Territory was represented by just one seat between 1922 and 1998. Before this, it was a mixed bag, electorally speaking. From 1863 until 1911, Territorians were basically South Australians. No offence to the South Australian senators, but uh, we do like to be, <laughs> be Territorians. <laughs> and we did have the same voting rights for representation in both houses of the South Australian Parliament as people living in South Australia. And we qualified as South Australian voters in elections for both houses of the Commonwealth Parliament after 1901. And it's incredibly uh, fitting, I think, that it is actually a South Australian senator who's assisted the Northern Territory senator and members to actually fight uh, to protect the two seats of the Northern Territory. And can I just throw in there that when we look at the history, uh, it was actually the Surrender Act of 1907 which saw the Northern Territory transferred from South Australia to the Commonwealth. So it seemed like no one ever really wanted to have us, and so there's always been this, uh, this struggle about representation. And even prior to that, I think there was even mention of uh, making sure the North returned to Britain because they didn't seem to know what to do with us uh, even before the 1900s. So there you go. In 1911, Territorians lost all political representation for the next, years, uh, next 11 years uh, when we were transferred to the Commonwealth. In 1922, the Northern Territory gained its first representative in the House of Representatives, and in two years' time that will be 100 years ago. However, it was for a non-voting seat, so we didn't have voting rights, even though we had one representative. It stayed this way until a single NT member received full voting rights in 1968, an interesting time. It was a year after. Uh, the referendum that recognised uh, First Nations people in the population. So uh, that's when we got the actual voting rights, even though we had uh, a person in, this, in the uh, House. It certainly stayed this way until a single NT member received those voting rights. And in December 2000, the Australian Electoral Commissioner determined that the Northern Territory electorate would be divided into two seats, Solomon, which covers the Darwin area, and Lingiari which covers the remainder of the Northern Territory, as well as the territories of Christmas Island and Cocos Keeling Islands. And a big shout out to uh, uh, the residents of Christmas and Cocos Keeling Islands because you fought uh, so strongly in terms of making sure that these two seats stayed in the Northern Territory. A few years later, in 2003, a determination by the AEC removed this second seat because of further changes in relative population sizes between the states and territories. So you can see that there's been a, a complete toing and froing still uh, in terms of the status of Territorians and our voices in the Australian Parliament. Following the 2003 determination, during the 40th Parliament, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters conducted an inquiry into representation of the territories similar to this time, with JSCEM doing the same thing. But the committee recommended the 2003 determination be set aside by the passage of the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Representation in the House of Representatives Act 2004. And it restored the second NT seat, but only for the October 2004 election. The Northern Territory continued to maintain two divisions beyond the 2004 election, and now we come to 2020, when the Electoral Commissioner made a determination that sees the NT revert again back to one seat. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, the process of a federal redistribution is complex, and it relies on objective information and has the capacity to take into account the opinions of those who are affected by redistribution decisions. And importantly, the process is undertaken independently of the government and the parliament. It is transparent and accountable, and generally the outcomes of these redistributions are accepted by the parties and the public. Australia's redistribution process is certainly independent, but this does not necessarily mean it is fair in every case. 
and it's this determination, while completely correct under the present legislation, it certainly isn't fair to the residents of the Northern Territory. And Territorians, though, aren't shy about fighting for what they see as their rights for being fairly representative, are represented and doing things just a little bit differently to the rest of the country. I'll just take you back again in a little bit of history. In December 1918, the pressure from issues that arose from a lack of political representation manifested in what became known as the Darwin Rebellion, with mass protests, riots and the removal of the then NT administrator, Mr Gilruth. And the federal government of the day took the events of the rebellion very seriously and sent gunboats to monitor the situation and be ready should the protests turn violent. And the rebellion itself led to a royal commission and the creation of a seat for the Northern Territory in the federal parliament, albeit a non-voting one. So in 2020, Madam Acting Deputy President, Territorians again banded together to protest against the move to reduce our political representation. This time we did it by working together from all political sides with a petition uh, of thousands of Territorians and Australians. So we didn't need the gunboats up there this time to get the Territorians settled down as we did in 1918, but it just shows the passion of the people of the Northern Territory to be heard and also when they see something as really unfair as what this decision was. So I am enormously grateful for the bipartisan approach and people from all walks of life who have come together in a common cause here and in a very rare move and one that uh, certainly made this very possible is it that all the NT federal representatives from both parties, as I said, Senator Sam McMahon and also uh, the members from the other house, uh, Warren Snowden, the member for Ngiari, and Luke Gosling, the member for Solomon. We made uh, submissions to the JSCAM inquiry. I'd like to acknowledge the support of many across all parties, uh, in particular the national parties, the independents, the Greens, uh, especially uh, our crossbenchers, for standing strong with us on this. While the government hasn't adopted all the recommendations of the JSCM report, what it has done is guarantee Territorians two representatives in the House for the foreseeable future. Madam Acting Deputy President, I have always got so much to say about the Northern Territory, and I'll continue to do this when the bill comes before the House, uh, before the Senate here tomorrow. Uh, but I'd certainly like to commend the report uh, by the committee members of JSCM but also acknowledge the work of uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Don Farrell, uh, in pursuing this uh, so vigorously and so proudly, even if he is a South Australian, uh, for the people of the Northern Territory. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Uh, Senator McMahon. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to welcome this report from JSCM on behalf of all Territorians. Uh, now, most people probably don't know what a joint standing committee is or what it does, and Territorians are no different. Yet today, today, whether they know it or not, they are applauding the work of this committee. Because one thing that's vitally important to Territorians is their representation. Um, now, strangely, most, uh, a lot of people in other jurisdictions would probably tell you that the world will be a better place with less politicians, not more. Yet this is not the case in the Territory. And everywhere I go, travelling throughout the Northern Territory, uh, for these past six months, there's been one burning question on everybody's mind. And that is, they say to me, so what's happening with our two seats? So I'm very, very proud and happy on behalf of Territorians who are rejoicing um, over this report and the work that this committee has done on this inquiry, uh, even though they may not know what a joint standing committee does, they know that it has delivered them uh, retaining two seats in the Northern Territory, which, as I said, is vitally important to Territorians. Uh, the recommendations out of this report, recommendation one, the committee recommends that instead of the Senate proceeding with the bill, that being the private senator's bill, the government introduce a bill to provide 
for consistent floor of two seats for both the Northern Territory and the Australian Capital Territory. As a consequence, the 2004 margin of error rule for the territories should be repealed to provide consistency with the formula applying to the states. It further recommends that as part of this new bill, the two territories should also be subject to the same rules as each other in the process of redistributing boundaries between electorates under Part 4 of the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918. Recommendation 2. The committee recommends that the government review the existing provision of additional resourcing to MPs with large electorates and consider whether further targeted resourcing would assist with representation by MPs of their constituents in these electorates. That's another uh, thing that is important to the Northern Territory. Um, as, as we've heard from Senator McCarthy, um, the electorate of Lingiari also encompasses uh, Christmas and Cocos Islands. Now, for, for myself and Senator McCarthy and uh, the member for Lingiari to be able to get to those places, we actually have to fly to Perth. So we'll be one of the few jurisdictions in the world where you actually have to leave your electorate, go to another electorate to get back to your electorate. It's a week-long trip, um, so it's, it's absolutely uh, vital that um, we re remain with our representation and that we're also able to resource um, these important parts that form part of the Northern Territory. Uh, recommendation three, the committee recommends that if the parliament does not enact a two-seat floor for the territories, it considers instead either enacting a harmonic mean for allocating seats between states and territories with appropriate public explanation to build understanding for the reform, or developing options for JSCM to consider for additional Senate representative for the Northern Territory. Um, so what this does effectively is recommends guaranteeing a, a minimum of uh, two seats for the foreseeable future. This um, is vitally important to Territorians, and as I said, they are rejoicing today with the tabling of this report in the Senate. And I would like to thank Senator James McGrath and uh, his committee for the excellent work that they did, for the excellent consultation and inquiry, and for the outcomes that they have recommended in this report. Thank you, Senator McMahon. Uh, I did see Senator Waters first. Senator Waters. It's very much Acting Deputy President. And can I seek the indulgence of the Chamber? I was one minute late and I was hoping to make a very brief contribution on the family law corrigendum. So I seek leave to do that quickly now. Um, Senator Waters, we can't do that until we finish debate on the current report. So, I, Senator Farrell, were you going? You weren't going to make a contribution on that report. Then, yes, if leaves granted for a short statement, yes, of course. Thank you, Senator Waters. I thank the chamber. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, so, speaking to the uh, Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System corrigendum, which was tabled uh, today, the Greens opposed this inquiry from the outset, not because the family law system can't be improved, but because initiating another inquiry, while so many recommendations from previous inquiries remained on the shelf, would delay action and because the inquiry had been politicised by unfounded public comments made by the deputy chair regarding women allegedly abusing the system to punish men and allegedly lying about family and domestic violence. Um, now, specialist services across the women's safety sector raised the same concerns um, about this inquiry, and they reported that survivors were contacting them terrified that the inquiry would embolden their abusers and concerned that they would not be believed when they spoke about family violence. Throughout the inquiry, we heard from nearly 1,700 submitters sharing their experiences of the family law system, and this has largely re-agitated issues discussed at length in previous inquiries, highlighting the extent to which matters in the family law system are impacted by the scourge of family and domestic violence. Meanwhile, women continue to be killed. We are now at 48 women killed by violence this year. And we know that the COVID crisis has turbocharged the risks that face women and children. The Australian Institute of Criminology found that one in 10 women in a relationship this year has experienced intimate partner violence during the pandemic, uh, many either for the first time or with increased severity. 
Women are seeking refuge from abusive relationships at record rates, and it's exposing the constrained capacity of our prevention programs and support systems for housing, counselling, financial and legal advice. Without more funding, uh, services like the Women's Legal Service are currently having to turn away nearly half of the women that seek their help. The family court is overworked and underfunded. It leads to significant delays in the resolution of complex matters. We know what needs to happen. Countless recommendations from previous inquiries have set it out. The government should urgently respond to the ALRC's family law inquiry report and ensure that child safety is at the heart of family law reforms. The government should also immediately repeal the presumption of shared parental responsibility, a presumption that, despite its intentions, leads to a culture of entitlement that emboldens abusers to weaponise access to children in disputes. The government needs to implement a national accreditation scheme for family report writers and to facilitate access to superannuation in family law matters, as it promised to do in the 2018 Women's Economic Security Statement. The government must also properly fund the Family Court, the Federal Circuit Court, Legal Aid and Women's Legal Services to ensure that families have access to legal support and do not experience unnecessary delays in resolving family law disputes. The government, finally, should abandon plans to merge the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court, which of course just passed the House approximately 20 minutes ago. In light of the concerns expressed by the legal profession, by former judges, by the law council, by the women's safety sector, those concerns being that the merger will jeopardise the expertise needed to manage complex family matters, especially those involving domestic and family violence. The issues raised in this inquiry are not new. The solutions are not mysterious. The government knows what needs to be done to ensure the family law system can support families and protect those escaping family violence. Just needs to get on and do it. Thanks very much. Oh. Senator Davey. On behalf, uh, unless uh, Senator Brown is talking on this, on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Migration, I present the final report of the committee on the Working Holiday Maker Program. And do you seek leave to? Thank you, Senator Davey. Um, Senator Henderson. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm pleased to speak to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights 13th and 14th Scrutiny Reports of 2020. Um, sorry, Senator Henderson, I haven't got that document on my that's, list. That's listed. We're not at that part We're not of the there. agenda yet. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam. Acting Deputy President, on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, I present the final report of the Committee on NDIS Planning, together with documents presented to the Committee, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. And as an accessible, approachable and timely planning process is central to the success of the NDIS and with any significant piece of reform, participants service providers and the NDIA must always be alive to opportunities to reform the planning process with a view to making it an even better experience for NDIS participants. With that in mind, the committee makes several recommendations on how to address the long-standing issues in the, in the NDIS planning process. Of significant concern to the committee was the evidence we received that there is likely to be major inconsistencies in planned funding between participants with the same disability. These issues were first raised when the trial sites were operating and persist to this day. The committee was particularly concerned with the evidence we received of plans that did not include funded supports, as the presumption was that informal supports would be available through family members despite these participants having no family support or having elderly pe parents with dementia. The jurisdictional issues of responsibility for providing support also persists, with the NDIA still refusing to fund supports that they deem will be provided by health agencies. These approaches are contrary to one of the fundamental principles of the scheme, which is that it, re that it remain person-centred and that the planning process should address all the participants' needs as they relate to their disability. 
The majority of our recommendations in this final planning report relates to the NDIA's communications process. Access to timely, accessible information is key to the planning process. The committee makes a number of recommendations that we strongly believe will improve the efficiency, transparency and overall satisfaction with planning. Our leading recommendation is that the NDIA provide fully costed, detailed draft plans to participants and their nominees at least one week prior to the meeting to approve the plan. Other re recommendations go to the provision of information to caregivers where they are involved in the planning process to help ensure that they are informed about the types of support that are available and able to be included in a plan. The committee remains concerned about the NDIA's level of engagement with participants who are in custody. We have recommended that the NDIA develop, implement and report on a strategy for engaging these participants and that the Commonwealth, states and territories meet and consider and agree on the appropriate action of responsibilities for the funding or supports for participants in custody. The need for the NDIA to advertise and provide training is also covered in the report. Training needs to be readily available to planners, local area coordinators and other professionals involved in the process in accessible formats and locations. The NDIA often point to the participant satisfaction ratings to demonstrate that participants and their nominees are happy with their performance. However, the committee received evidence of planners either taking months to respond to queries from participants or not replying at all. We also heard the, wor the, words, the wording of the survey may not allow for accurate reflection of participants' views and experiences. The committee has made 42 recommendations, Madam Acting Deputy President, in this report. By making these recommendations, it is the committee's view that they would bring greater transparency, consistency and accountability to the NDIS planning process. As is noted in the executive summary of our report, the recent announcements by the government and the NDIA about joint planning improved transparency and the commitment to clear timeframes are welcome. However, the announcements do not mean that these issues have been resolved. This work, along with the committee's recommendations, should help improve the planning process. As always, we will continue to monitor the implementation of these reforms and conduct further inquiries should we need to. Finally, I would like to place on record my thanks to the many participants and their family members and supporters who have contributed to this inquiry. The time you took to provide submissions, give evidence and share your personal experiences was invaluable. I would like to also thank Bonnie Allen and her team at the Secretariat for their work on this report. As always, it was of a very high standard and captured the experiences of those accessing the planning process. I commend the report to the Senate and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I present two reports of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit as listed at item 13 of today's order of business. And I also make a report by way of a statement concerning the appointment of the Parliamentary Budget Office. I'm pleased to report to the Senate that the uh, Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit uh, ratified the appointment of uh, the Parliamentary Budget Officer, uh, Dr Stein Hegelby, uh, and he was appointed on the 18th of November 2020. Uh, prior to this, he was the Deputy Secretary of Governance and Resource Management, uh, Department of Finance. Uh, Dr Hegelby joined Finance in February 2010 as the Deputy Secretary of the former financial management group. And before this, Dr Hegelby worked in the Victorian Department of Treasury and Finance, where he was responsible for budget and financial management, uh, long-term policy research, taxation, business tax reform and intergovernmental relations. He also worked in the Department of Premier and Cabinet on national reform and climate change issues. Uh, prior to joining the Victorian uh, Public Service, he held various budget 
uh, and corporate uh, services senior executive positions within the then Commonwealth Department of Finance and Administration. Uh, we also, I'd also like to put on record uh, the committee's thanks uh, to Linda Ward and uh, Colin Brown for their work over the last 12 months uh, in acting in the role of uh, the parliamentary budget officer. Uh, the committee uh, is excited to see uh, the appointment of Dr Higgleby and uh, we look forward to his work and the service that he will bring to this parliament. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Shikoni. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I just, um, just wanted to take a few minutes today to speak on the report that was just tabled before by Senator Davey in respect to the Joint Standing Committee on Migration uh, with respect to the Working Holiday Maker Program. Uh, the Working Holiday Maker Program. Senator Shikoni, you have to seek leave. No, and to I do seek that. leave. To <laughs> Leave is granted. Thank you. Um, the Working Holiday Maker Program is uh, undoubtedly a significant contributor to many regional communities around Australia. Founded as a means to facilitate cultural exchange, the Working Holiday Maker Program has allowed millions of young people from all around the world to travel to Australia and, in many cases, establish, establish lifelong bonds with our people and our great places. Today, the program has become more than just about cultural exchange. Rather, it has turned into something which, you know, unshamedly, has become an unregulated labour scheme. Travelling throughout regional Australia and meeting with primary producers, you come to appreciate just how important this program is, particularly to horticulturalists who rely on these young travellers to ensure that our fruit and veggies are picked and packed and made ready for market in our supermarkets. This reliance, however, has come as a result of the failure of successive Liberal and National governments to systematically address labour supply issues. Madam Acting Deputy President, it is incumbent upon all of us in this place, indeed incumbent upon this government, to develop meaningful solutions to the problems that arise in our community. And we've heard many, many examples throughout the course of the last couple of years. Whilst I acknowledge that there are certainly recommendations in this report, if implemented, that will improve the circumstances of those who need labour and those who supply it, who it should, be note, it, it should be noted that too often many people who work under this program face exploitation from, unfortunately, a lot of employers and who are seeking, who are seeking help and, quite frankly, are lacking the support from many government institutions and agencies. And these people, unfortunately, are abused, and they are abused economically, physically and sexually. And I'm afraid that there is still much more to be done in this policy space. But put all that to one side, the issues that were raised by many stakeholders in the course of the committee's inquiry are real and concerning and they deserve thoughtful and considered solutions. And no doubt this place will have many more uh, you know, discussions about this, um, especially also through the inquiry uh, chaired by the opposition, by me, and uh, obviously yourself, Madam Acting Deputy President, as Deputy, but um, through the temporary migration inquiry. But those issues will be fleshed out in greater detail. Simply increasing the size of the Working Holiday Maker program isn't going to give our farmers the certainty that they need nor will it do anything to systematically address the circumstances of, of exploitation that workers still face. Nonetheless, I thank my colleagues on the committee, especially the chair, the member for Barrowa, and the deputy chair, the member for Corwell, for the good faith in which we have worked together throughout the course of the inquiry. Thank you, Senator Shikoni. Senator uh, so, so, Senator Shikoni, are you seeking leave to continue well, your remarks? Thank you. you just took the words out of my mouth. Thank you. Wonderful. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present the interim report of the Select Committee on Administration of Sports Grants, and I move that the Senate adopt the recommendation in the report to order the production of a document. Senator Chisholm, would you like to speak to that motion before I put the question? The, the question is the motion is rather that the question be agreed to, which just so I have it very straight in my mind is that the 
recommendation in the report tabled by Senator Chisholm be agreed to um, for the production of documents. All those in favour of that recommendation being adopted say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move to take note of that report. Yes. Um, so the Senate Select Committee on Administration and Sports Grants tabled the interim report to update the Senate on its efforts to get to the bottom of what really went on and what has become known as the sports fraud scandal. From the very start of this inquiry in February this year, uh, the government has been hindered, uh, has been hindering the committee from getting to the bottom uh, of this, uh, and they have found uh, numerous ways in which they have been trying to uh, stop this committee from getting uh, to the bottom of what has been an outrageous abuse of public funds, uh, whether it be the Gations report, which they have not provided in full to the committee, uh, whether it's been the release of spreadsheets that they use to base their decision-making on. Um, and indeed, it comes with uh, former Minister Mackenzie not appearing before us to answer questions, a very basis, I would have thought, uh, of democratic principles and being uh, prepared to front up and answer questions about the, her role in this. And then also, in what we dealt with just then, was the public interest immunity claims um, that they have been using to hide behind uh, and not provide advice to this committee. Um, so I'll return to that issue shortly, but it's also an opportunity to just remember uh, what is at the heart of this and what was part of this inquiry. Uh, we know that there were so many applications and that this was a, this was a program uh, where hundreds of groups applied for funding. Uh, but the, somehow the government tried to use this as an excuse uh, to pork barrel marginal and target seats in the lead up to the 2019 election. But what that popularity really shows is how bad funding for community sports infrastructure is needed and why funding should be provided for those projects that best give more Australian, that gives more Australians the opportunity to enjoy the benefits of sport. Uh, we know that hundreds of these projects, Sports Australia, are assessed as highly meritorious but missed out. Uh, and as the election approached, the number of grants approved that weren't recommended by Sports Australia increased. So it was 40% in the first round, 70% in the second round, and then 73% in the final round as the election loomed. So as we know, as the election got closer, um, the political decision-making around these grants uh, became more heightened. And the Auditor-General found that the Minister's office ran a parallel assessment process which drew upon considerations other than the assessment criteria, such as project locations, including coalition marginal electorates and targeted electorates. So that's from the Auditor-General report itself. We also know that there are 136 emails between the minister's office and the prime minister's office about these grants, which shows you the political nature of these decision making, the fact that this was being used as part of their election strategy, with versions of the colour-coded spreadsheets attached and zooming between the two offices, which identified uh, applications by electorate. Uh, we heard, we've heard compelling evidence from those clubs who missed out. Uh, one such is the Gippsland Roller Derby, Derby Club in the nationals, safe national seat of Gippsland, which missed out on funding despite attracting the highest Sport Australia merit score of 98 out of 100. Uh, so that shows you, and their uh, overwhelming need that that club in their evidence provided to us about how important it was that they received funding. But the substance of this uh, report today actually goes to the legal authority. And we've received me uh, evidence from so many eminent legal uh, scholars about uh, how they didn't think the legal authority was there for the minister to be the decision maker. And I just wanted to talk briefly about some of that evidence. We heard from uh, emeritus professor in law, Geoffrey Lindell, suggested that the then minister Mackenzie didn't have the legal authority to be authorising these grants, saying, I have serious doubts as to whether Senator Mackenzie had that authority. I certainly couldn't find it. I went through all the various possible steps that could be invoked. Professor Lindell also disagreed with what the Prime Minister and the Attorney-General had suggested, that the Minister has 
a broad direction power, saying I've indicated that's a power that would have not supplanted individual decision making. It was a power to give directions to practices and policies, not individual decision making. I looked at the power of delegation that the Commission has, and the Minister is not mentioned amongst those. And we had compelling evidence as well from Professor Toomey, an expert in constitutional law, uh, who, uh, like Professor Lindell, disagreed with the Prime Minister and the Attorney General about the broad ministerial powers, suggesting Section 11 uh, gives the Minister the power to, uh, to, direction, to direct the Commission with respect to the policies and practices to be followed by the Commission in the performance of its functions and the exercise of its powers. It does not permit the minister to exercise the commission's powers, being one of the key points. Further, Professor Toomey disagreed with the prime minister about the program guidelines, saying, you can say that the guidelines said it, that Senator Mackenzie is a decision maker, but the mere fact that the guidelines say it doesn't mean that the guidelines are valid. If the guidelines are inconsistent with the act, if the act doesn't give you the authority, the guidelines are irrelevant. Uh, so we also heard from the then chair of Sports Australia, Mr John Wiley, who told the committee uh, the board in proper execution of its role, this is in regard to the legal advice I should add, that the board in proper execution for its role has directors responsible that saw fit to obtain legal advice from a senior Queen's counsel after the issue was raised. I would be happy to provide that opinion to this committee if you would like. Um, the committee subsequently agreed to accept that uh, in camera, uh, and uh, the Sports Australia were willing to comply, but it was Minister Colbeck on July 16 who wrote to the committee claiming public interest immunity from those questions taken on notice on the grounds of legal professional privilege and prejudice to legal proceedings. The minister's letter does not cover that Sports Australia was happy to provide the legal advice in camera to the committee. Uh, so the committee had not been able to identify a case previously where a statutory office holder has been willing to provide information and then to be blocked by the responsible minister. So that is the substance of why we brought forward this interim report today, uh, because we, this committee, feels as though it is absolutely vital that we uh, have access to that information. I'm pleased that the Senate has voted in favour of that today, and we look forward to the government uh, meeting the directions of the Senate through the motion just voted on. Thank you. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I also wish to take note of this report. It is almost a year since the ANAO's explosive report revealed the corruption in the administration of these, this sports grants program, revealed how a huge amount of public money was being used by this government to try and buy votes. What's been going on since then is been attempt after attempt after attempt by this government to cover up, to not share with the Senate the information that lays out how this use of public funds to try and win votes to win the last election has been taking place. And in particular, as is outlined in this report, the fact that there was no legal authority for the minister to actually be directing how this money was spent. This is clearly a case of a absolutely appalling misuse of public funds. We've got a situation here where we had ordinary Australians, volunteers with sports clubs, who faithfully they were offered an opportunity to apply for a grant for their sports clubs. They had guidelines that were set out by Sports Australia, and so they thought that if they put in all of their information, it would be assessed by the guidelines that Sports Australia had set out. That's what they committed to doing. And as we heard during the inquiry that we've been undertaking into this. Many people have spent hundreds and clubs have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours putting their information together. And indeed, we know then that Sports Australia did do their assessment and they ranked all of the various applications. And indeed, the, the applications were oversubscribed because there was a great need for more investment into sporting infrastructure in Australia. They did their assessment, but the government didn't like the answers that turned up. They didn't like the fact that the sports that Sports Australia was actually going to be 
applying grants on merit, because that did not suit their political purposes. It didn't suit their pork barrelling purposes. So when then we had the minister, then Minister Mackenzie, intervening. And in fact, it wasn't just the minister intervening. It was clearly done in collusion with the Prime Minister and the Liberal Party. We have got the evidence of the hundreds of emails that went between then Minister Mackenzie's office and the Prime Minister's office. And we know that there was a meeting with the Prime Minister that Minister Mackenzie had, had that basically said, you know, what can we deliver if we increase the size of this grants program? How many projects in our marginal seats or in our targeted seats can we deliver on? It was clearly a program that was being rorted by the government to be trying to be getting projects that they thought that the government thought was going to help them win the election. This, you know, there it is in terms of the documents that we have been able to cobble together. But there have been critical, critical bits of evidence that the government has been sitting on, that the minister has been, the then minister has been sitting on. Then Minister Mackenzie has refused to appear before our committee. She needs to come out of witness protection. She needs to front up to our committee and actually lay out what happened in her office and the negotiations and the discussions between her office and the Prime Minister's office that led to these outrageous happenings occurring. And the other bit of information that today's interim report goes to is that it's pretty clear from the legal evidence that she actually didn't even have the authority to be intervening in this way. Because Sports Australia is meant to be an independent statutory authority. It's meant to have control over its, uh, its decisions and where the, these grants were spent. And there is no, we cannot find any legal authority as to, why, as to how the minister actually had the ability to say where the money was going to be spent. In fact, we had Sports Australia being willing to share with us on a confidential basis their legal, their legal advice, but suddenly, because of intervention, no. The, the government said, no, nah, you, you can't share that legal advice with the committee. And since then, they've been sitting on that legal advice. So today's um, OPD that we have just passed basically is giving the government the opportunity once again to be presenting that legal advice to us so that the community can see what happened so that the ex extent of the lack of legal authority can be laid clear. And I'm also hoping that Min then Minister Mackenzie, Senator Mackenzie, will see and realise that she really needs to come out of witness protection. She really needs to appear before our committee. She, we need to have the information that has been hidden, for it, hidden from us there in full view, so that the extent of the rorts, the extent of the corruption, the extent of the misuse of public money can be laid clear, laid, laid out for us. Because that is the only thing that it is only fair for ordinary Australians, these sporting clubs right across the country, to keep faith with them. Because as it stands at the moment, they know that they did their bit. They put in their hundreds of hours hours to put their grant applications together for very worthy infrastructure projects, and they were, they were done over. So they need to know what happened, and then we need to get a commitment that those clubs that should have got funded should be funded. I mean, I've had a, a private senator's bill in this place that I'm very happy to bring on for debate again to say that those clubs that scored highly that scored, you know, including clubs like the Gippsland Rangers Roller Derby Club, that scored the top amount in terms of Sports Australia's um, criteria. They scored 98 out of 100, but they missed out on funding. Those clubs deserve to be funded. And until those clubs are funded, well, then people are just, there's just going to be, continue to be a stink about this. And this realisation that there is corruption that is riddled through this government, that there is no fairness that basically if you are associated with the government, if you're living in a marginal seat, if you're living in a targeted seat, well then you get special treatment. But otherwise you just get left behind. Nothing on merit, nothing, nothing to do with fairness. People expect 
better of their politicians. But the cynicism that people have about politics is because of this type of behaviour. And I am concerned about that increasing level of cynicism and lack of trust in government. Until we get to the bottom of this, we can lay it clear and we can have an acknowledgement and basically an apology from this government as to what's gone on. Well, then we are going to continue to pursue this. We are not giving up on it. The government is hoping that, that we will just continue through, you know, give up on it because of attrition, because they just keep on saying no, 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 no. But we are not giving up because this goes to the heart of our democracy. Senator Green. Thank you. I'll keep my um, uh, comments brief on this interim report. Uh, the report sets out the reasons the committee does not accept this public interest immunity claim by the minister. And it is incredibly important that such public interest immunity claims are scrutinised and not used by ministers to avoid public transparency and accountability. The minister has not made out the grounds for the public interest immunity claim, and the Senate needs to consider whether it is in the public interest to allow the minister to claim immunity over these documents. And I'm pleased that the Senate has uh, resolved to ask the minister for these documents. This PI claim and this inquiry, this entire disgraceful sports rort saga, has demonstrated the lengths that Prime Minister Scott Morrison will go to to avoid transparency and accountability. This advice that we have asked for goes to the legal authority of the minister to make these decisions, and it is crucial that the committee considers the advice, but we have been denied these documents even on a confidential basis. The Auditor-General found that there was no legal authority for the minister to make these decisions, and instead of acting on the report of the Auditor-General, the Prime Minister sought two, uh, two separate inquiries of his own. The Gaitchen's report and advice from the Attorney-General, but we haven't received either of those documents either. The Gaitchen's report, funnily enough, says nothing to see here, and the advice from the General, uh, Gen Attorney-General, Christian Porter, says, yep, all good, there was legal basis, but we're not going to share that legal advice with you. And the question really is, why all this secrecy? Why won't this government come clean why won't the former minister appear before the committee? Why won't they give us the documents that we desperately need? Well, there's one answer to that. 136 emails. 136 emails between the Prime Minister's office and the Minister's office discussing this program, passing the spreadsheet back and forth, requests from the Minister's office to change decisions to make sure that applications got through, and as the Auditor General report found in one, one instance, the Prime Minister's office said, we need to be able to cross-check against our list and also be able to pull out individual projects to coordinate announcements with material from CCHQ. This was all about getting the government re-elected. It was all the Prime Minister's idea, and the transparency and accountability that gov the government has shown is all about protecting the Prime Minister. The Senate has a job to do, and the government needs to give the information to the Senate that it needs. That is the job that the government should do, so that this inquiry can table a final report that the public can read and understand exactly what happened in this circumstance. Thank you. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to uh, speak on this, uh, on this motion as well <coughs> and take note. And uh, I start by congratulating uh, the work uh, that the committee has uh, done uh, in uh, starting to get to the bottom of uh, what went on in what we know as the sports rorts uh, affair. And I uh, just want to thank uh, in particular uh, my two uh, uh, Senate uh, colleagues, uh, <coughs> Senator Chisholm and Senator Green, who've worked uh, so tirelessly and thoroughly um, to try and get to the bottom of what uh, continues to be uh, a terrible scandal uh, for, this, uh, for this government. Um, <coughs> I think um, you, you have to go back in time because, unfortunately, of course, we've had uh, COVID and uh, this committee has been trying to uh, get to the bottom of this matter uh, in, the, in the time of COVID and, of course, that's given the government some cover uh, which it's used to try and deflect uh, from, uh, from the inquiries. And can I tell the government and can I tell the Prime Minister in particular uh, that we're not giving up here. 
uh, we are going to continue uh, to uh, make inquiries. Um, the Senate <coughs> this afternoon passed uh, a very uh, clear and deliberate motion that makes it very clear that um, you can't behi hide behind uh, a public uh, immunity screen, uh, that the Senate expects um, all of the documents which the minister up until this point in time has been trying to, uh, <coughs> to hide uh, expects that they, they will be delivered to the, uh, to the committee so that the committee can continue its inquiries and get to the truth of what has happened here. Um, <clears throat> Mr Acting Deputy President, I'd like to go back to um, where, this, uh, where this whole um, sorry tale started. And, uh, <clears throat> it started with the, um, with the Auditor General's uh, determination on this matter. You know, a lot of people talk about uh, the need for an ICAC um, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this country. Well, I can tell you um, some excellent work has been done in the absence of an ICAC by the, uh, the Auditor General and in particular uh, Mr uh, Brian Boyd and his uh, team in the Auditor General's uh, office. And, <clears throat> and of course they've been punished for that, Mr Acting Deputy President, by losing some, uh, some important funding. But their original decision that started this inquiry uh, made this uh, comment after reviewing uh, the early documentation that was available, the so-called colour-coded uh, spreadsheet. Uh, the report said that the, uh, it reflected the approach documented by the minister's uh, office of focusing on marginal electorates held by the coalition as well as those electorates held by other parties or independents that were to be targeted by the coalition at the 2019 election. <clears throat> now, you might say to yourself, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, why has the government been so keen uh, not to release all of the documentation that's gone between the then minister's office and the prime minister's office? Uh, well, I think we know the answer. I think we know the answer. Um, the answer is in that little description there by the Auditor General. Uh, what we'll discover when we finally get to see that documentation uh, is that, that what uh, the Auditor General said uh, was going on was in fact backed up by all of those, uh, all of those emails. Um, <clears throat> this wasn't just an ordinary pork barrelling exercise, uh, Mr Acting Deputy Pre President. This was pork barrelling on an industrial scale, an industrial scale, and we still haven't had a satisfactory answer from the Prime Minister about his role in this process. Uh, we're meant to believe that uh, former Senator McKenzie, um, who took the who took the fall, who took the unfortunately took the fall uh, for for this. Um, worked this whole scheme out by herself in her own office. Uh, now, of course, we'd like to be able to <coughs> test that proposition uh, if she'd uh, do us the courtesy of turning up to the committee. Uh, she's so far decided that she's not, uh, not, not going to do that. But, but we're, hopeful, we're hopeful that um, in order to provide some transparency to the Australian people, but more particularly um, to sporting clubs around the, um, uh, the country who were diddled uh, by, this, um, uh, <coughs> by this sports rorts process, uh, that she'll come and tell us exactly what's happened. But in the meantime, uh, the Senate has made it very clear uh, that all of the documentation that's gone between the Minister's office and the Prime Minister's office needs to be released so that the committee uh, can uh, make a thorough investigation, and in that way we're going to get to the bottom of what's gone on here, Mr Acting Deputy President. And if the government thinks that um, a pandemic, a COVID pandemic, is going to give them cover for escaping responsibility and transparency for what's gone on here, they'll have to have another think, because we will get to the bottom, we will get this information, the minister will, I think, the former minister will ultimately uh, give evidence uh, to the uh, to the committee, uh, and uh, and we will get to the bottom of it. Now, Mr. Acting Deputy uh, uh, President, uh, we 
during this, the course of this process, uh, we had the advantage of all of those clubs who scored extremely well in this process. Uh, clubs that took on face value the criteria that the government had originally set out in order to, um, uh, in order to um, um, proceed with um, uh, these, uh, these grants. Uh, and we heard from those clubs and we heard what they said about it and the disappointment that these volunteers, volunteers who'd spent hours and hours and hours preparing an application which, right from the start, the Senator Farrell, would you please resume your seat? The time for the debate has expired. Oh, you will be in continuation. Oh, thank you very much. We now move to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? Minister. I table documents relating to the order for production of documents concerning the Inland Rail Interface Improvement Program. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move to take note. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I thank the government for tabling the documents and sending a copy to my office, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, is leave granted? Leave being granted. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Now we move to committee memberships. No, no committee memberships today. Do we have any messages? No messages. Uh, then I call the clerk. <coughs> Government business orders of the day. Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020 and a related bill in committee of the whole. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Wright. Oh, sorry. The committee is considering the Australian Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020 and a related bill. The question is that the bills stand as printed. Senator Rice. Thank you. Thanks, um, Acting Deputy President or well, Acting Chair. Yes. <laughs> um, Minister, I want to just continue on the discussions about the impact of this legislation on universities in particular. Um, but also local governments and other um, agencies who are going to be impacted. And what discussions? I mean, we have heard that there's been there was basically zero consultation before this legislation was being proposed with the universities. I also know that you know local governments you know were only realised after the fact that they also were going to be impacted. Um, there is a considerable concern from universities, from local governments in particular, that if they enter into um, arrangements, that they can be retrospectively deemed to be not in our foreign policy interest and then be overturned. And that this is going to have a, well, let's go to the universities, that this is going to have a chilling effect on the ability of universities to enter into arrangements, you know, re cooperative research arrangements. Sort of agreements with countries and other universities. So I'm wanting to know what discussions you have had with the universities about the potential of this chilling effect, and what you can say to assure universities, who are basically they told us during the committee hearings, that it would mean that they would not feel that they are in a position to be able to enter into these arrangements and these agreements because of the prospect that they couldn't guarantee that they would be able to be continued. Because retrospectively, at some stage in the future, it could be decided that these arrangements were not in the interests in Australia's foreign policy interests. Oh, Minister, sorry. Sorry, sorry Minister. Chair. Sorry, I was jumping the gun there. <laughs> Please Thank go you, ahead. Uh, Senator Rice. Uh, DFAT has been uh, engaging uh, in uh, a number of uh, stakeholder consultations, I think over uh, 60 in uh, total following the introduction of the bill. That includes with, um, uh, that includes with uh, local government through uh, August and, uh, and September, uh, Senator, and a number of, um, of representatives of 
local government, largely uh, the peak bodies uh, and a number of city councils themselves. Uh, in terms of uh, university consultations, they have been part of that. And, and these issues have been discussed uh, that you have raised as part of those consultations. Uh, in terms of those, um, through uh, again peak organisations uh, as well in, and as well as others who are uh, on my uh, list here, Senator. Um, Universities Australia itself, for example, uh, has met with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade on the 4th, the 9th and the 30th of September, on the 7th of October and the uh, 13th of uh, November. Group of Eight uh, has also met with uh, DFAT on uh, two occasions. Uh, there have been uh, a number of other consultations, uh, Senator, which I can um, provide to you. But I want to, uh, to really repeat uh, what I said uh, earlier in the day when we were discussing this, uh, this matter, uh, particularly in relation to the limited number of uh, arrangements uh, which will be um, captured by this legislation. So, as I said, I think in the chamber earlier today, uh, it's only arrangements between Australian public universities and foreign governments or foreign entities that um, will be required to be notified. And that includes, uh, in terms of institutional autonomy, uh, that includes um, foreign universities that are an agency or a department of a foreign government, for example, a military university that forms part of a country's Department of Defence, uh, or don't have institutional autonomy, that is, where a foreign government has substantial control over the university's uh, internal governance, uh, education uh, of academic staff. Uh, so, Senator, that is a limited group. We've defined institutional autonomy uh, in, uh, in uh, that context so as to assist with this. Uh, and the work that will be done by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade through the task force uh, will be very much focused on familiarising uh, um, governments, state, territory, local governments and, in, and universities uh, with the sorts of, uh, of issues which um, are to be captured. You asked earlier this morning uh, in relation to an example, um, Senator, if I recall correctly, that would be a, a minor issue which would not be captured. It would be exempt under the changes that I spoke about this morning. Senator Rice. Um, personnel at a workshop or a conference, that would be an exempt minor issue. Um, with the um, you talked, Minister, about the consultations that, be, that have been had with the universities, but you didn't go to my question, which was what assurances you were able to give them that to give them confidence to be able to enter into you know, arrangements, research arrangements, contracts with the other the entities that are captured. So my, I want to ask again that mm. question, but I also then following up on your response saying that there is a limited number of these you know, universities or other organisations that don't have institutional autonomy, has the department or, um, done an estimate of how many of these you know, um, universities or other um, institutions are we have that Australia universities have already got arrangements with them. How many would currently be captured, and how many of these you know, organisations globally um, are covered? I mean, if you say it's limited, you must have some some estimate or approximation of you know what that limited number is. Um, Minister, thank you very much, uh, Senator. Thank you, Chair. Um, part of the process that will be undertaken uh, if the bill is passed and uh, in terms of the implementation is this stock take process, which we've referred to, uh, that will uh, enable us to review uh, those arrangements and, and determine some of those issues that you are seeking to ask, Senator. Uh, and that is, that is something which has been discussed at length uh, between the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the universities, was raised in my meetings with Minister Tian and with the university. Uh, with the uh, with Universities of Australia and uh, the GO8 uh, as well. Um, as I said before, the bill is absolutely not intended to or expected to uh, impede the beneficial business of universities with foreign counterparts. Absolutely understand the value of that contribution uh, in uh, in uh, academic pursuit. Uh, in research uh, and in, particularly in the Australian context, absolutely expected that much of the routine business of universities will proceed uh, as normal. 
Senator, the um, uh, concerns that, uh, that you raise are most certainly issues that have been uh, discussed uh, between uh, DFAT and, uh, and uh, universities uh, in their consultations. If you look at things like scholarships, research grants, uh, universities, ex university exchange programs uh, will not be expected to be uh, impacted by the scheme, affected by the scheme, unless and until they're assessed on a case-by-case -case basis as being cons inconsistent with Australia's, for Australia's foreign policy or uh, to adversely affect Australia's foreign relations. Our expectation is, and in the consultations that we have had, we have uh, provided this information, we expect the vast majority of these arrangements will be unaffected. It is also open to the minister um, to make uh, further rules, excluding certain types of arrangements from the requirements uh, of the scheme. Uh, and as I said earlier, and you and I spoke about earlier in this uh, exchange in the chamber, um, those exempt arrangements that solely deal with minor administrative or logistical matters are an example of, uh, of that. Senator Rice. But, uh, Minister, I hear what you're saying, and you're you essentially saying trust us that it's not going to impact on too many and that most of the arrangements will be considered to be beneficial. But there is this cloud hanging over arrangements. Um, you know, just having that, you know, unless and until they're determined not to be in the foreign interest. But then it is entirely in uh, currently your hands or in future foreign ministers' hands to determine on, ba on a basis that doesn't have to be laid out, that there are no guidelines for, that there's no. Um, analysis of that something suddenly is no longer in the foreign interest. And so they, they, a university cannot have certainty or a, a state government entering into an arrangement with another you know, government agency cannot have certainty that at some stage in the future that their arrangement that they are entering into, which may be for you know, 10 years, will at some stage in the future potentially be determined to be not in the foreign interest on the basis of whatever is in the head of the foreign minister at the time on, on the basis that it's not compatible with our, with our foreign policy interests. What certainty can you give them that, you know, that means that they can confidently say, yes, they can sign a, an arrangement or a, um, agreement say that will last for the next 10 years and not potentially have that overturned at some stage in the future? Minister. Um, so, uh, Senator Rice, thank you very much for your question. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, Senator, that's one of the purposes of uh, establishing the task force in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So there is a distinct entity uh, with which uh, state and territory and local governments, universities are, are able to, uh, to work, uh, to work through these processes, to uh, provide guidance and advice. Uh, in the context of, uh, of the, the arrangements that are undertaken between state and territory and local governments and uh, universities. Senator, I'm not uh, shying away from the fact that this is a new piece of legislation and that it will require compliance uh, by relevant parties, and that includes universities and state and territory and local government, Senator. But it is in Australia's national interests to ensure that we are able to achieve this degree of consistency, and it is in my interests, in the government's interests, in the Department of Foreign Affairs' interests, to absolutely work constructively with uh, relevant entities in the process of doing that, and that is overwhelmingly our intention. And it is indeed what we have been doing through the process of 60 stakeholder consultations since the bill was introduced. Senator Rice. Okay, look, I'll, I will move on. And it is basically trust us that everything's going to be okay, and uh, that's not a good basis for, for public policy, has been my, ex my experience. But um, I want to move to the issue of the, how constitutionally sound this legislation is, given the um, opinion from Pro Professor George Williams in his appearance before our committee. Um, so, what confidence do you have that the bill is constitutionally sound and would not be able to be overturned in a High Court challenge, given that the external affairs powers are shared between the states and the Commonwealth? Minister. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Senator Rice. And I appreciate that a number of uh, views have been uh, expressed uh, on this matter, but, uh, and indeed uh, 
Professor Williams was uh, in uh, a meeting that uh, I was engaged in um, on these issues. He has been in a number of meetings with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade. But uh, in terms of the uh, the measures within the bill, which fall under the external affairs power, that what the bill does is to expressly link the discretionary powers of the minister to the management of Australia's foreign relations and therefore to the foreign relations aspect of the external affairs power uh, in, the, uh, in the Constitution, Senator. Um, and uh, in those discussions with, uh, with uh, Senator Williams, oh, Senator Williams, I've just promoted him uh, inadvertently, uh, Professor Williams, uh, the, um, the discussions around the uh, concurrent power uh, in the Constitution, which uh, of course uh, Indicate the Commonwealth doesn't have exclusive responsibility for external affairs, but external affairs. But the common, only the Commonwealth can set foreign policy on behalf of Australia. Uh, although acknowledging, of course, uh, as this bill does, uh, that both the Commonwealth and the states can legislate with respect to external affairs, uh, and states and territories can, for example, as we are contemplating in this uh, conversation, enter into relationships uh, with foreign countries. Senator Rice. Minister, have you sought advice from the Australian government solicitor on the constitutionality of the bill? Minister. Yes, Senator Rice, we have sought advice. We are confident. I'm not going to go into the contents of that advice, however. Senator Rice. When did you receive that advice? Minister. The process of uh, development of the legislation, Senator. Senator Rice. Can you be more specific than that? <laughs> Minister. Question with me right now, but I'll seek uh, some advice from um, officials. Senator Patrick. Just a supplementary to, to that. Ha, have the states expressed any concern to the government in respect of uh, cons constitutionality? Have, uh, has any, any state um, indicated to the government that they uh, see, their constitutional, uh, th see there to be constitutional problems? Minister. Uh, not that uh, I've been advised of, Senator, and I've checked with officials that that is not the case. Senator um, Patrick. Uh, Minister, I, d I just want to ask uh, some questions that relate to the judicial re review po uh, processes and, and, and uh, options under, under this bill. And in some sense, they go to amendments that are being moved by uh, either the Greens or, or Labor. And I'm really genuinely trying to get an understanding of uh, whether or not it's worthy supporting those particular amendments. So um, just to give you perhaps anyone who's listening, a common level of understanding in relation to uh, decisions made by the minister. Sorry? You're an optimist. <laughs> okay. Um, in, in relation to um, decisions made by ministers, um, that there are normally different ways in which they can be challenged. The, the most simplest one for a litigant, particularly a litigant in person, uh, an individual, is through the AAT a $930 fee and uh, they would then seek to have uh, that decision reviewed in a quasi-judicial environment. Perhaps the next level up is through a court, either a, um, the FCC or the federal court, uh, using the uh, Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act or some other provision in an act that permitted that. And then the final stage, which of course can't be uh, legislated out is a, a review by way of constitutional writ of prohibition or, or mandamus or, or, or such things. I'm just trying to work out the logic behind, well I, actually I understand the logic behind not, uh, not wanting to have a review that goes to national security matters um, or national interest matters uh, necessarily played out. Um, I just wonder, at the moment, the only option is, is, a, constitutional, is a constitutional review. Um, I wonder what the difference in terms of burden uh, it is for an entity to initiate that constitutional review versus something under the judicial, um, the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act. Um, you know, why you've sought to in some sense that will inform the Chamber as to why you sought to cut out the um, ADJR Act. Minister. Thank you, uh, 
uh, Chair and Senator Patrick, I will endeavour with the uh, advice of officials to uh, to provide you with uh, with a response on uh, some of those issues. And let me start by saying that uh, the grounds for uh, judicial review in the ADG, in ADJR, of course, largely mirror the, the common law. We see substantial overlap between the scope of judicial review under uh, the Judiciary Act and the Constitution, uh, that is, common law, which is already available, and the, and the grounds for judicial review under the ADJR Act. So there's not a great deal of meaningful difference between the, uh, the natural prospects of success of applications for review under uh, either avenue. What is a key difference, and you adverted to this in your question, in your comments, uh, is the requirement to provide reasons uh, for a decision. And the government is of the view that the provisions of reasons would adversely would have the potential to adversely affect Australia's foreign relations by potentially disclosing uh, Australia's foreign policy or position on the sensitive issue which is in question uh, in the context of uh, the arrangement that is being uh, examined. Uh, it has the potential to damage bilateral relationships, the potential to disadvantage Australia's interests in international fora uh, and negotiations. And I do think that the provision of, of reasons in that context, uh, in these circumstances, would defeat the object of the bill which is to protect and to manage Australia's foreign relations. I also want to uh, emphasise that uh, judicial review does remain available under the bill uh, by the Federal Court, Federal Circuit Court, under Section 39B of the Judiciary Act uh, 1903, by the High Court, under Section 75.5 of the Constitution. And like the ADJR, uh, these avenues of review do allow a court to do several things, including setting aside a decision which has been made unlawfully, uh, requiring the performance of a duty that a decision maker has failed to perform, ceasing proceedings where a decision maker has failed to exercise their powers properly, uh, and also to grant an injunction that can prevent or require certain actions. Uh, I think, and the government thinks, that the judicial review mechanism um, in the bill is appropriate. Uh, there are comparable schemes which also exclude the AGDAR Act uh, review on the basis that they involve complex political considerations. And there's a couple of examples of that I think it is useful for the chamber to, uh, to be aware of. Um, decisions under the FERB regime, for example. Um, and that's because those decisions are exclusively a matter of government policy. And ADJR judicial, judicial review could result in, in that case in public disclosure of classified and com commercially confidential material. Uh, certain decisions under the Passport Act fall into that category, uh, also an act which uh, I deal with. Um, extradition and prison transfer arrangements. Uh, and a range of other decisions which relate to uh, intelligence and national security, uh, some uh, in relation to taxation and corporations and to charities. Uh, so these are issues that we have considered, Senator. Uh, they're issues which we have um, examined in the context of the development of uh, the legislation, and uh, they are the, um, the determinations that we've come to. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you. That, that, was, uh, that was quite helpful. I'll, I'll um, try and digest that. Uh, I, I don't have the advantage of being a, a lawyer. As, uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, I, no, I will, Senator Wong, I will, I will actually come back to, cause, because I note your amendment deals with that. Um, so, um, I, I just want to. Those, those mechanisms you've talked about under the Judicial uh, Act and under the, uh, under the uh, Constitution, uh, normally the normal process in any um, review, judicial review is to often look at reasons. So even in those circumstances where someone wants to make application to the court, are they not fettered by the fact that they are not privy to the reasons that you've made the decision. Um, you, know, you, you might want to seek leave in the High Court, for example, and uh, you would have to at least state an argument and you would be completely blind uh, to, uh, to those reasonings. So I'm just wondering how, in effect, you are able to make uh, a, an appeal to those particular avenues without an understanding of the reasonings in, in respect of the way you've made the decision. 
Minister. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, Senator Patrick, I'd say the same way they occur in the uh, context of those uh, other comparable schemes that uh, that I outlined, and uh, it, the process works in that uh, uh, in that uh, context. Whether it is the um, examples I gave, uh, the decisions under the FERB regime, uh, certain decisions uh, under the Passport Act, uh, extradition and prison transfer. Uh, and those a range of other matters which might relate to intelligence and national security um, and even taxation corporations and, and charities. So um, they are uh, dealt with in a similar way and uh, they are able to be um, uh, assessed uh, in the context of uh, the arrangements which are provided for in this bill. Senator Patrick. So to give you a, a practical example of an issue that does raise security, it's a very publicly known example. Uh, and, I, and I raise this because you, you, you talked about the Passport Act. We know that Witness K, for example, um, has uh, had uh, an application for a passport, or, or it might have been it was revoked on the advice of ACES. That's, that's been fleshed out in, in, um, in estimates uh, through my uh, former senator, through, through former Senator Xenophon and others. Uh, that's a matter that did go to the AAT and did go to the Special um, Security Division of the AAT and seems to have played out without any harm to national security because the AAT um, Security Division does on a regular basis deal with some of those issues. So um, in your consideration of this bill and, and you know, I take it you know, genuinely you, you have a concern about national security. I wonder uh, why Senator Wong's motion, which uh, actively refers matters to that security division, be would be problematic in the context of what you've just said. Minister. Well, Senator Patrick, um, those decisions uh, are, which are reviewed by the AAT are um, in my understanding, uh, genuinely, truly uh, administrative decisions. I think the AAT is a separate question from the discussion we were uh, having previously. Um, and in relation to, um, to the AAT, Senator, the concept of, uh, of stretching merits review of what are truly administrative decisions, because that's what they broadly do, um, to ministerial policy decisions on significant public and foreign policy issues uh, is not something that I understand the AAT to be either equipped for or designed for uh, in terms of the review of, of that kind of uh, decision. Um, I do think that would undermine the bill. Uh, it would, as I said, uh, in the, uh, the context of this discussion, have the potential to undermine <clears throat> to damage our bilateral relations, to undermine our global interests. The treasurer, for example, is not required to explain his decisions on national interest of the FERB uh, applications, given the sensitivity. The same goes for, uh, for these uh, sorts of uh, decisions. What we are contemplating would be covered here in the bill in the way in which it is, um, uh, in the way in which it is uh, um, drafted senator um, is uh, is more about error of law or failure to take account of relevant factors uh, and an error which then affects uh, infects or affects the decision making uh, obvious acting outside the scope of the bill for example um, and that doesn't require reasons for the decision to uh, to be able to pursue that if a minister makes a decision that's not authorized by the act um, you can take that to court without knowing the reasons for uh, the decision. So I think the AAT is, uh, his role is for truly administrative uh, decisions and not something which is um, necessarily appropriate to apply here. Senator Patrick. So, some of those examples you just uh, uh, provided, I recall, are actually reasons under the um, 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 Administrative Deci Decisions Judicial Review Act and, in fact, are questions of law, so a question as to whether or not you uh, the, the, the decision maker uh, gave relevance to information that was irrelevant or ga didn't give rele relevance to um, um, or did give relevance to information that was irrelevant. Um, again, those sorts of things would normally require a decision. 
Just to get an understanding of how this might work, again, um, and it also goes to Senator Wong's uh, amendment, uh, if you look at, uh, th there was a series done a long time ago by, I think it was the Law Reform Commission that looked at better decision making uh, in an administrative sense. And it basically said that all decisions should be uh, set out in writing. I'm, not, I'm just differentiating this from being made public at this point. But if you make a decision, you make a better decision if you uh, write out the reasonings yourself so that you understand uh, exactly uh, what you have included in, in the information so that if you do get to a point where uh, uh, a matter is brought before a court, that might become become relevant. I, is it the case that in making decisions under this Act you will in fact, notwithstanding uh, limited review rights in the AAT, for example, no review rights in the AAT, is it the intention of government or, the, or is it the intention under this bill that you would you would record the the, the decision reasoning for file purposes, Minister? Um, well, Senator, if, I'm not sure that I understand your question. But if your question is um, that is in relation to how the process occurs, obviously the minister um, takes advice and works with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade with. Uh, um, the task force which uh, has been uh, uh, announced and uh, will be established in, uh, in the department. Um, and we would definitely have carefully considered reasons uh, in the process of, of this decision making. And what I would say, Senator, is um, one of the reasons for the stock take process is to enable government to make an assessment. I, I think I said publicly at the time of the um, uh, announcement of the legislation that a public source, open source uh, review uh, had uh, indicated just for states and territories over 130 uh, arrangements uh, with more than 30 different countries. Um, and as that, uh, as that material is returned to uh, the department uh, as part of the stock take process, um, there will, I think, become a um, uh, seeking the right word, um, it will be clear the nature of the sorts of arrangements which are made and those which fall on, on either side of the, uh, the provisions of the legislation. So there will be carefully considered, uh, considered reasons. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Senator Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, okay. So I understand. As a part, of, as 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 good process, you will you will, in effect, annotate reasons, um, and you know, that that is a good thing. Um, in Senator Wong's amendment, it's it's proposed that reasons might be given, and where you might extract out uh, some of the detail. Uh, do you see that as a as a possibility, uh, or is it just hugely problematic even to provide that level of reasoning? Thank you, Senator Patrick. Uh, I understand that um, those proposed amendments uh, do uh, propose a redaction uh, of a statement of reasons to remove information uh, that is or is likely to be protected by public interest immunity. For example, I think that in um, that in and of itself acknowledges uh, in part the complexity in, fine, in providing reasons um, under this bill. Um, any reasons uh, provided uh, will almost, in, in the government's view, almost always be subject to, to public interest immunity um, because uh, the provision of reasons has the potential to damage Australia's international relations, to damage uh, Australia's defence or national security. So, the application of public interest immunity, Senator, will play large here uh, in our view. Um, if you are going to extract detail uh, in that way and to redact in that, det in that way, I think it arguably renders this unworkable. You just end up redacting everything. Senator Patrick? Right. I think he's being uh, Senator Wong. chivalrous. <laughs> 
Uh, I was going to ask some questions, but I, I do want to make, uh, uh, and obviously when we move these amendments, which are further down the list, uh, we'll make uh, more detailed remarks. But I have to say, I think the answers in my submission or my suggestion, the answers of the minister to the regional questions of Senator Patrick really did not hold water. Uh, and it does come down to, first, I think, the, the view one takes about the extent to which executive government actually ought be accountable. Um, there's a very significant power in this legislation. It's a power to veto agreements uh, across many entities. Uh, and I, I understand uh, why the government wants to do it. I, I've been critical of process. I've been critical of um, the way in which they failed to consult and the political timetable around the announcement. But I understand the reasons for it. I also think they should just get out of the habit of trying to bash the Victorian Premier through the media and perhaps just sit down with them and try and resolve these issues. But leaving that aside, as a matter of principle, I understand uh, the um, reasons why a federal government uh, wants this power. But as a matter of principle, I, it seems to the opposition that you don't give executive government a power that, um, uh, unless in, in, in very, very important circumstances, power that has no accountability or so little accountability. And I would have thought that's something those on that side would actually think about. Uh, I have been, the Labor Party has been very careful in the amendments. Uh, and you know, I've, I've, we've asked the Minister's office on a number of occasions to provide feedback if they, do, if they don't like them. We were hoping for some bipartisan engagement on this. But the amendments at 114 that, that Senator Patrick has been working, looking to, you know what we're asking for? A notice of a decision so people can actually, if, the, if surprise, surprise, the bureaucrats get it wrong, amazing proposition, hey, that they might actually be able to say, actually, it's the wrong agreement, or actually, that's not the right point, or you've got this fact wrong. Secondly, a statement of reasons. I think it's pretty reasonable. And thirdly, the bearer protections. To avoid doubt, these sub subsections two and three don't require information to be included if the minister believes on reasonable grounds that disclosure of that information is likely to protect to be public interest immunity. So I just think the minister coming here and just airily saying in this generalised way, we don't want any requirement to give reasons or to give notice to make sure the decisions are right, because it will affect our foreign, our, our, our foreign, what was it, foreign relations. I just think is absurd, absolutely absurd, because you know you're not required even under the terms of our amendments, and we're open to a discussion about how to protect the, you know, the sorts of issues you're describing. But even under the terms of these amendments, there is no requirement to include. You have the capacity to exclude um, content on the basis of public interest immunity, which clearly includes some of the issues to which you're referring. It's that a classic thing. Oh, it's too secret, or it's too risky. Well, there's nothing in this bill that actually. For, for the exercise of what is quite a substantive power. So let's say at BRI in Victoria, which has been the subject of Senator Patterson's petition and lots of media. So leaving aside the politics on that, if the federal government decide that they want to cancel an agreement that, a, that, a, that an elected state government has undertaken, I don't think it's that unreasonable to say probably should have some reasons for decision. And as Senator Patrick correctly pointed out and reminded me, we also referred it to um, the security division of the tribunal. Well, we do this across far more sensitive issues. I've been on the PJCIS for many years. I'm quite pleased that I'm no longer on the PJCIS, <laughs> given the workload. But I mean, there are many areas, as this minister knows, and particularly in her previous portfolio, with you know highly classified decisions which are protected, where, where, the, where the principle that we have in, the, in, a, in a liberal democracy, that you don't allow executive power to go completely unchecked or, 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 or without accountability, is res uh, 
uh, and the issue of confidentiality or national security is resolved by the way in which legislation and rights of um, legal rights have been drafted. So I simply don't accept it. I think the reality is you don't want to have to give reasons for decision. And I don't quite understand that. I understand that you know Mr Newnham he's, he's probably here to advise you very conservatively, but I think if you're, you're actually, one is actually trying to explain to various entities why certain things are problematic, there is a, a you know that the guidance that comes from that process is important because, as I said at the outset in the debate, um, we shouldn't just be tell you. Know, I'll start, I'll, re I'll, start, I'll start again. As I said at the outset in the debate, what we want is our sovereignty to be resilient. Resilience doesn't just come from uh, a minister in Canberra having a power of veto. It comes from people understanding, institutions understanding what they should do and what they shouldn't do. Uh, and I think this you know, situation where there's not a requirement to provide reasons, there's not really any effective capacity for review, we all understand that. Well, you know the, the parameters of judicial review. I, I don't think provides the best outcome. Um, uh, I don't think it, it furthers the national interest that the bill is supposedly about. Now I've got plenty of material I'm, I can go to, but I did want to respond to the minister's point there. And I, I don't think that the answer to the, the substantive question, which is why has there why have there no, been no review rights included? Why did you exclude? Um, uh, uh, review rights. Why did you exclude the re requirement to, provide, to um, provide reasons to people whose agreements you were cancelling? I don't think that question has been answered adequately. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Rice. Okay, thank you. Um, Minister, there is an extraordinarily broad definition of Australia's foreign policy in this bill. So can you tell me what ensures, for the purpose of this framework, um, how that's going to be a meaningful definition and how the foreign policy, what's going to be in place to ensure that it doesn't change from you know, week to week or you know, even minute to minute? Um, you know, will there be any public guidance on what Australia's foreign policy is? Given that you know, the whole basis of the bill is, is that things, you know, these arrangements can be overturned on the basis that they are inconsistent with, with Australia's foreign policy. Minister. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I, uh, sorry, Chair, um, and uh, and I thank um, Senator Rice uh, for her question. I think there's. Uh, um, a number of aspects uh, about the question of the definition, per se, uh, that uh, of foreign policy that the, the senator raises. Uh, the government is uh, of the view uh, that it is appropriate for the Minister for Foreign Affairs um, to hold a broad discretion to determine Australian foreign policy. Australians' foreign policy and foreign relations are the prerogative of the Commonwealth government uh, to determine, and they do evolve. The change uh, in response to a range of domestic and international factors. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, as I've said uh, before, in terms of the work that it is going to do uh, in the context of the uh, task force uh, and the department itself, which of course has uh, representative, um, which has offices in uh, states and territories, work closely, very closely, with state and territory governments. Uh, they will continue that work. Uh, with states and territories and their entities on implementing the scheme, including to help them understand uh, Australia's foreign policy uh, objectives. I think there will be uh, transparency uh, provided. We didn't get to this with Senator Patrick, but transparency also provided through the establishment of uh, a public register, uh, which uh, will uh, make clear those arrangements which are the subject of uh, the minister's uh, decision, those foreign arrangements. That will assist uh, the states and territories in building uh, a picture of what kind of arrangements uh, might be deemed to be adverse to or uh, inconsistent with, uh, with Australia's uh, foreign policy. Um, as 
I have also said, uh, Senator, uh, the changing environment, current international environment, is one which is uh, ob obviously increasingly complex uh, and subject to um, rapid change. Uh, but, and that means that our foreign policy and our foreign relations don't remain static. They will also evolve and change uh, in response to a range of domestic and, and international factors. And so the Commonwealth government, the government of the day, uh, is best placed to determine that, taking the advice of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the advice of other government departments, uh, working with Prime Minister and uh, relevant ministers, as has always been the case. I don't think changes in foreign policy, though, are a, a threat uh, to, to legal certainty, if that's uh, part of your question. Uh, and uh, certainly that is a matter which has been raised in consultations with the department and I think addressed. Senator Rice. Well, can I get more information as to how that has been addressed, given that legal certainty and given that although you say that you know, you're going to be issuing you know, information that will inform people as to what sort of things will be taken into account. Um, to me, the lack of definition of foreign policy means that that certainty absolutely is going to continue to exist. And you know, what will be done to to overcome that? Will there, for example, be public guidelines issued so that people know that this, you know, even if they change, even if it's new guidelines, you know, every couple of months, as to this is what you know. Are the sorts of things, and this is what foreign policy in Australia at the moment is actually is it is is actually that. Minister. Thank you, Chair. Um, Senator, we were speaking earlier about um, information that is provided to uh, uh, affected entities, uh, including state and territory and uh, and local government uh, and universities. Uh, there will be a very significant level of engagement and consultations with the states and territories. That is a feature of the bill, uh, and it's a very significant uh, step forward, uh, Senator. Um, that uh, d those discussions uh, will be ongoing, uh, but I don't think you can presume that our positions uh, of foreign policy and foreign relations remain static. They have to change. They do change um, due to. Uh, whether it's a range of domestic or international factors. Um, I think this will provide, in fact, greater transparency than we have seen before in engagement on questions of uh, foreign policy uh, in a context of uh, constant communication, uh, as I said, considerable consultation and transparency. Uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, we have um, established the uh, Foreign Arrangements Task Force uh, within the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Their job, their role, is to work closely with the states and territories, their entities, to implement the scheme, including to assist them to understand uh, Australia's uh, foreign policy objectives. And I think that consultation uh, is demonstrated in the 60 or so stakeholder discussions, uh, which we have held um, in, uh, since, the, uh, since the bill was introduced. I was um, speaking, I think, to you earlier about uh, a number of those uh, stakeholder consultations, Senator, across local government, I think, at the time. I also think it's important to, to note in relation to the matters that the minister has to take into account. So to, to look at the bill itself, uh, and uh, in section 51.2 in particular, um, the uh, structure of that section, um, a number of clauses uh, which go into the importance of the arrangement uh, in assisting or enhancing the functioning of the state or territory, the extent of the performance of the arrangement, uh, whether the declaration would impair the continued existence of the state or territory as an independent uh, entity, whether it would sufficient, significantly curtail or interfere with the capacity of the state or territory to function as a government, whether it would have significant financial consequences whether it would impede the acquisition of goods and services, including, for example, for the purposes of infrastructure, whether it would have an effect on the capacity of the state or territory to complete an existing project that's be, that is to be delivered under the uh, arrangement. Uh, and so th that, um, that guidance, uh, Senator, on uh, matters that the minister must take into account is also 
uh, very important for the states and territories and, uh, and uh, associated entities uh, which will be subject uh, to the Act if it's passed. Senator Rice. Uh, can I seek some clarification then? So you're saying that there's that the states and territories and local governments and universities and all the people affected are going to have information to assist them to understand Australia's foreign policy objectives, but you're not willing to actually commit to issuing guidelines as to what those foreign policy objectives are. I mean, that's the fundamental thing, so that people can have got some certainty as to what the foreign policy objectives are so that they can determine whether their arrangements are going to be at risk. Minister. Sorry, Chair. Uh, there's a number of, uh, of steps under the bill uh, on implementation. Uh, they include this, the stock take, for example. Uh, they include uh, the work that will be done with the states and territories uh, to uh, examine those arrangements and to effectively engage on their implications for foreign policy uh, and foreign relations. Uh, and I think this process, which will be one the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is deeply, deeply involved in, uh, will be part of providing that support to the states and territories in relation to the implications of the arrangements that are, that are in question. Uh, we also have, in terms of the, the practical and process aspects, uh, a number of fact sheets which, uh, as I understand it, have already been um, provided on the, the DFAT uh, website and the development of uh, uh, a set of, uh, of Q&As which are also helpful for, uh, for stakeholders. Senator, there is no question, and I understand, uh, that when you seek to implement a new system such as this, uh, that it does raise concerns in affected entities about what its impact will be. But the role of the task force, the role of my department, uh, is to work uh, comprehensively with those entities to uh, seek to provide them with support and guidance uh, in bringing forward those uh, arrangements for consideration. I think the production of guidelines itself um, uh, creates a frozen-in-time judgment I don't think that that's necessarily productive uh, in this context. We have to have foreign policy uh, in a in a have to have foreign policy in a the the approach that we take is one which is responsive to evolving global developments uh, and one which uh, is not, as I said, frozen in time. Senator Rice, can I just con complete this line of questioning then? So if you know, evolving global developments, not frozen in part in time, evolving foreign policy. Do you acknowledge that this creates uncertainty that in organisations being able to plan for the long term, to enter into arrangements that they know are actually going to be able to continue over, you know, whether it's five years or ten years, because there is a risk, because of the retrospective nature of and the far-reaching nature of this legislation, that something that they an arrangement that they put in place now, in five years' time, at the whim of a foreign minister, who may not be you, who may be somebody else, can then decide that this arrangement, on the basis of they don't have to provide reasons, they don't have to provide guidelines, we just have to trust that you know a, a task force within the department is doing acceptable work, that they that their arrangements could be overturned quite arbitrarily. Do you agree? Can, can you see that this provides a, a great deal of uncertainty and, and, and concern for organisations to be able to enter into these long-term arrangements? Minister. Senator, with respect, I don't actually agree with you, no. Uh, and I do think that the implementation of the uh, legislation uh, will, in fact, provide greater certainty, greater awareness a greater communication and greater transparency in the engagement between the Commonwealth and the states and territories, for example, and in universities as well. I don't think that um, shifts or changes in foreign policy that are responsive to uh, current uh, international developments are a threat to, to legal certainty. There are contractual frameworks which uh, already account for changes to laws or changes to foreign policy. 
They would include changes to sanctions laws, Senator. They would include counter-terrorism laws or anti-money laundering obligations. Uh, but they can occur very quickly to address national security concerns. I've seen that happen myself multiple occasions in my time uh, in, the, uh, in the Senate. And so I don't agree with you, Senator, that it's a threat to, uh, to legal certainty, because I do think that the process of implementation of the bill will establish, if you like, um, a rhythm and a system uh, with which states and territory governments will be strongly engaged, deeply embedded with uh, the Department's Foreign, Foreign Arrangements Task Force, uh, and part of the stock take process will be doing absolutely that analysis which will provide that guidance, uh, that direction, if you like, uh, for arrangements that are developed in the future. Uh, I know there have been questions raised in relation to, uh, to legal certainty, but I think uh, those points that I've made around the changes uh, in law that uh, flow from, or law or foreign policy that flow from uh, changes in the international environment uh, are a good example of how uh, arrangements are able to withstand that, uh, and this will make them more robust. This will give them greater certainty and a greater underpinning that they are consistent with Australia's foreign policy and Australia's foreign relations. Senator Patrick. Uh, just following on from that, it, is, is it not the case that uh, the publications of, reason, of reasons can help people understand the policies and, the, and how they might uh, decide on courses of action, just as court cases, when published, assist the general public in, in understanding? It being uh, 720, Senator Patrick, I'm interrupting you, sorry. I shall report to the Senate. Uh, the committee reports to the Senate. I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Molan. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today, in this place and in front of all Australians, I rise to commemorate an Australian soldier, a father, a grandfather and a husband, and a man who established an intellectual reputation which was quintessentially Australian. An Australian soldier, his name was Bruce Davies, MBE. As we farewelled Bruce in front of his friends and family last week in Melbourne, uh, I read a soldier's prayer, Psalm 144. It was the same prayer uh, as I quoted in my first speech several years ago. It's the kind of prayer that robust, robust Christians, not just soldiers, have relied on for centuries when faced with the greatest challenges and not just in war. I repeat it here today in honour of Bruce, and it goes, Praise be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. He is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield in whom I take refuge. Bruce Davies was an Australian soldier of the Vietnam generation. And I know that at least later in his life he would have liked that prayer. Bruce's life was long and productive. He was 77 years old when he died. He was a historian and a distinguished veteran of the Vietnam War. When we met, Bruce and I were the only two full-time officers on the staff to run a battalion of reserve soldiers stretched halfway across southeast Queensland. At this stage in our lives, work was central. And just as in our later years we grumbled and mumbled to each other about the world, about military events, about the government, in those days we had a common focus for our frustrations, those unfortunate reservists in our, in, in, in our care. Fortunately, it was before social media, and what we said and what we did is lost forever. As you can imagine, my entry into politics gave Bruce a whole range of issues to verbally attack me on, but it was with that almost unique character characteristic that marks Australian sledging. Bruce, of course, would never miss a chance to use what little influence I might have had as a first-term backbench senator for something he wanted. And it was in this period that I heard of his good works in support of the Vietnamese community in Melbourne. He was generous to a fault. Most recently, I had most to do with Bruce over two of his many books. The smallest was a well-researched but very controversial book on a particular battle in Vietnam which contentiously involved several members of the Australian Army Training Team Vietnam. It was exhaustively researched and very well written. I found it absolutely fascinating. Bruce then asked me to write the foreword to his larger book, A History of the Vietnam War, from, this, from Australia's point of view. I read the manuscript and, once again, learned so much about the war and the context of Australia's involvement. It was a scholarly but very practical work. 
how strange it was to talk last week with Bruce's daughter, Peter, with the television on in the background, to suddenly realise that Bruce was talking to us, coincidentally, from a documentary on the AATTV, the Vietnam, Vietnam training team. I hadn't seen it before, and anyone who wants to understand the compassion of Australian soldiers, especially at a time when we had been presented with the alleged failings of certain of our soldiers in Afghanistan, should consult Bruce and others in the AATTV in this documentary. Duty was a topic that Bruce would discuss with me. He recognised we all have rights, but not unfettered ones. Uh, we all have rights that we should be free to enjoy. More importantly, he understood instinctively that each of us have, have, has commensurate, if not greater, responsibilities to exercise. We saw that when Bruce spoke to us from the AATTV documentary. Bruce might have had many motivations to be a soldier, but my impression and his approach to instructing us to be soldiers was that he believed that to protect Australia, uh, to protect what Australia is and what it stands for, soldiers need to prepare and train hard and be the best that they can be. Protecting and preserving is best achieved by preparation. A life well lived is a life worth remembering, and our good friend Bruce Davies is certainly one to remember. Bruce was a proud Australian soldier who served his country for many years. Bruce served with absolute distinction in the 1st Battalion of the Royal Australian Regiment and then twice in the highly decorated AATTV. In the period 1965 to 1970, Bruce spent all or part of every year on combat duty in Vietnam. Vale, Major Bruce Davies, you will both be missed Thank and celebrated. Thank you, Senator Molan. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, who is going to be held accountable for robo debt? Who is going to be held accountable for the harassment, for the hounding, for the stress, for the anxiety, for the lives derailed and for the lives destroyed? Because this is robo debt's legacy. It was a scheme that caused hurt and despair. It was a scheme that caused so much misery, some people even took their own lives. Despite this record of destruction and despair, no one has been held responsible. And you just have to ask yourself exactly what do you have to do in this government to get the sack? The impact of robo-debt is all too real for some Australians. Miranda from Melbourne was in hospital receiving treatment for advanced spinal cancer when she received a $4,000 robo-debt. She was unemployed and applying for disability, but Centrelink took $40 a week from her payments. Nathan from Brisbane says he lost over two years of his life to the scheme. He was served with two robo-debts totalling more than $6,000. He had to move back home and work 50 hours a week to pay it back. He says, I feel like I got put back a couple of years in life because of this. I would be closer to where I want to be at 31 years of age if it hadn't been for robo-debt. Dimity from Adelaide was handed a $4,500 robo-debt and she knew it was wrong but Centrelink made her prove it. They wanted pay slips from years back, which she no longer had. She was bluntly told to either pay the debt or the debt collectors will come. Nathan sums up this scheme well when he says this, I wanted to know why those ministers felt that it was appropriate to use this illegal system and to target the most vulnerable people. He says he wants someone to ask them, why did you think it was okay to take money from the poorest people without giving them the chance to argue their case? Nathan's question is a good one. Just how on earth did this government think it was okay? And just how on earth did the government let it go on for so long? In 2015, there was a risk assessment that raised alarm about unleashing this program without manual oversight, but no action was taken. 
because nothing was going to stop Scott Morrison from unleashing this revenue-raising scheme. And by the end of 2016, they were handing out 20,000 debts a week. And shortly after, the complaints started flooding in. Complaint after complaint of Australians being wrongly targeted by their own government. Between 2017 and 2019, the government continued with robo-debt, even though they lost hundreds of appeals and received 76 warnings from the AAT. From their first warning that the scheme was illegal, it took 1,198 days to finally suspend the scheme. They then waited a further six months to announce refunds to victims, and now they continue to dodge responsibility and accountability, despite a record-breaking settlement of $1.2 billion. So why has no one been held accountable for robo-debt and the damage that it's caused? Could it be because the Prime Minister himself is responsible? He set it up. He bragged about it. He ignored the advice. He ignored the warnings, he ignored the pain, the distress, the anxiety, and he repaid over a billion dollars to victims. But he will never accept responsibility. And this government will never voluntarily give us the truth, give victims the truth, about how this illegal scheme was allowed to go on for so long. The public want answers. They want a royal commission to uncover the truth, the truth that this government is trying to hide, the truth that Scott Morrison is trying to hide, that it was his program, that he is responsible and that the buck should stop with him. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Two weeks ago, the latest results from the Household Income and Labor Dynamics in Australia survey, otherwise known as the HILDA um, survey, was, were released. The survey results painted a picture that was devastating about the life of single parents. Unlike other family types who experienced a boom in household wealth, single parents witnessed a substantial decline in their median income between 2016 and 2018. Single-parent families also had a sharp increase in poverty rates, rising from 15 per cent in 2016 to 25 per cent in 2018. The researchers were surprised that such a large increase had occurred over such a short period of time. I was devastated to, devastated to read the poverty rate for children in single-parent families increased from 16 per cent to 28 per between 2016 and 2018. There was also a steep fall in the use of formal childcare by single parent families, possibly demonstrating that single parents can't afford childcare. I want to stress tonight that these are not just statistics. They are devastating trends about the real life impacts on single parents and their children, and these can be lifelong impacts. Many researchers have looked at the outcomes for children growing up in poverty. If poverty isn't addressed early on, children can carry the scars with them into adulthood. Children living in below the poverty line are more likely to experience deprivation in terms of their relationships with friends, yelling in the home, e enjoyment in exercise, adequate fruit and vegetables, mental health school attendance, learning at home and involvement in extracurricular activities like sport. Kids growing up in poverty too often go to bed hungry, feel left out and worry about their parents. I think we would all agree that kids growing up in Australia deserve better. The results from the HILDA survey show the consequences of decisions by the Howard government and the Gillard governments when they forced single parents on the, um, onto the job seeker payment as soon as their youngest child turns eight. The Howard government started it, and then the Gillard government um, moved those grandfathered single parents um, onto um, New Start. It w then it was New Start, not the job seeker payment. It is a clear indication that parenting payment single must be reinstated until the youngest child in the family turns 16. 
As we can see today, this political decision has condemned hundreds of thousands of children to a life of disadvantage and poor well-being, direct life consequences. The government is condemning even more single parent families to poverty by further cutting the coronavirus supplement. The original rate of the coronavirus supplement of $550 a fortnight had a transformative effect for single parents and their children. Before the pandemic, single parents were struggling to put fresh food on the table, had to borrow money from friends or payday lenders, and some found it difficult to leave abusive relationships. Single mothers have since reported being able to afford healthy food, being able to buy their kids an ice cream and help them participate in school activities. That's from single, um, the National Council of Single Mothers and Their Children. We need to do better. Single parents, especially single mothers in this country, deserve better. We have some of the solutions at our fingertips. We can act now by retaining the coronavirus supplement at the higher rate of $550 a fortnight. We can immediately increase the rate of the job seeker payment so that these families do not have to live below the poverty line. And we can reinstate the single parent payment to single parents until their child turns 16. This survey results clearly demonstrate the real life impacts of cutting payments to single parent families. Hundreds of thousands of children are growing up in poverty, their well-being and their has been damaged and their life has been scarred by the fact that they've been condemned to living in poverty as a direct result of decisions taken by the Howard government and the Gillard government. Fix it before too many children's further children's lives are damaged by this damaging policy, these damaging policy decisions. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Bragg. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you. Uh, well, I rise tonight to address one of the great opportunities of our time, uh, which is the changing geopolitical uh, environment, especially in relation to Hong Kong and China. Now, I would say that it is my view that some of the commentary on China is quite unsophisticated. But I would say in relation to Hong Kong that my sense would be, having spent quite a bit of time there before I was elected to parliament, that it will remain an important gateway to China and it will transcend any of the short-term political changes that we are living through. I don't think it will have the same resonance for companies that want to have regional headquarters in Hong Kong. Frankly, people won't want to have their executives in danger or in line uh, of the national security law. That means that there will be opportunities for Sydney and Melbourne in particular to capture some of that business that will leak out from Hong Kong. Sure, the obvious competitor may be Singapore, but it may also be Tokyo. Certainly, my experience was that the changes that Shinzo Abe made, especially in relation to the increasing role of female executives in technology and in finance, was a significant change, and that Japan is now a more open uh, financial and tech centre, which will genuinely compete with Singapore as we seek to try and win some of the business that will definitely be leaving Hong Kong. And so I wanted to congratulate and put on record my very strong support for the actions the Prime Minister has taken to establish the Peter Verwa Committee, uh, which is looking to attract talent and looking to attract new investment into Australia. Now, this is something that we should have been doing for a long time, frankly. Uh, Singapore operates in some ways like a business. It's able to go into other jurisdictions and cut deals and bring the investment and jobs back to Singapore. That is what I'm hoping we'll be able to do as a result of the, the Verwa process, which, which the Prime Minister has, has established. One of the key focuses I'm hoping that the Verwa process will take is in relation to fintech, financial technology. Now, this is an area where we have considerable expertise. We have developed 
half a dozen unicorns, which are valued over $1 billion in just the last few years. And we've developed industries like Buy Now, Pay Later here in Australia, which is a great source of na national strength. Uh, it is true that we have taken Uber from California, from the United States, but it is also true that in 2020 there are people in the US, there are Californians uh, that are using Australian-based software like Buy Now, Pay Later, which is truly a very good development. I have established a committee to support Peter Verwa, which has been led by former Macquarie banker Andrew Lowe, which brings together 15 very sound business minds so that there can be every opportunity that there will be a market focus of these efforts. I do worry, being new to Canberra in many ways, that we can be a long way away from the market here in Canberra. And certainly in terms of technology and fintech, we're a very long way from the market. So I wanted to uh, note for the record that I think that we have a great opportunity to win some business from Hong Kong as we face our first recession in almost 30 years. Uh, like everything else that we have ever done as a country, we must be competitive. And this will take a cultural shift. My sense is that the architecture and the framework that has been established in this VIRWA process is very positive. It could result in us being as ambitious and as focused as Singapore has been in attracting investment and growth into what is frankly a very small city-state. We have many more advantages uh, than Singapore has had. The culture has what, is what has dragged us down in the past, and my strong hope is that we will turn the tables with this very exciting uh, VIRWA-led process. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. COVID-19 has claimed the lives of over 900 Australians this year. Each of these lives has been a tragic loss, one that has deeply affected families and communities. Governments have mobilised to prevent that number growing, which has been an appropriate and necessary response. But it also raises the question of whether we should be doing more to prevent deaths from other causes. 3,318 Australian lives were lost to suicide last year. Over the last decade, almost 30,000 lives have been lost. 30,000. That is absolutely a national tragedy. It is even more tragic that so many Australians lost to suicide are young people. Too many of our children go through school and lose one of their peers, one of their friends, along the way. They will carry the loss for the rest of their lives. But it is not just young people. Half of Australians lost to suicide are aged 25 to 49. It is crushing to see that so many Australians are struggling with depression, with trauma, with mental illness, to the point that they decide they cannot go on. The Productivity Commission has undertaken a two-year inquiry into mental health, and the government recently released this 1,200-page report, which makes for very grim reading. It estimated there were 30,000 to 90,000 suicide attempts in 2018 alone. It is the leading cause of death for young people and disproportionately affects Indigenous Australians, males, those living in regional areas and those with mental illness. The report also estimates the economic cost of mental illness and suicide to be $600 million per day. Per day, $600 million. Despite government's significant spending on mental health, there is little evidence that things are improving. The report is clear. We can do better. We must do better. The report recommends a national mental health and suicide prevention strategy to align governments, agencies and other groups. 
It also recommends transparent evaluation of prevention strategies so we can better understand what works, just as importantly as what doesn't work. And it recommends aftercare be offered to anyone who presents to a health provider after a suicide attempt. There are many stories of people being turned away from emergency departments after acts of self-harm. Ensuring they have the appropriate support is vital to preventing future suicide attempts. Putting health workers into emergency departments will let people get the help they need when they need it. Although it has had access to the report since June, the government has yet to publish its response. The report, this report, should be an absolute priority. The delay is a reminder of why Australia should have a Minister for Mental Health. Several state governments have made mental health a ministerial responsibility. The Prime Minister should consider making it a responsibility of the Federal Ministry as well. 3,318 Australians were lost to suicide last year. Just let that sink in. 3,318 have been lost to suicide. That is too many. Our existing policies are not working, but now we have a roadmap for reform. I hope and I expect that the government will act on this report and we will see a comprehensive response soon followed by legislation and budget initiatives in the new year. The time for change has well and truly arrived. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Between 1 July 2019 and 30 June this year, the Australian Centre to Counter Child Exploitation received more than 21,000 reports of child sexual exploitation, an increase of 50 per cent on the previous year. This is, by any measure, a national emergency. Research indicates that Australia is the third largest consumer of live online child abuse. This is a disgrace. Every act of child abuse has the potential to completely ruin a child's life. As a nation, we owe it to our children to protect them from this abhorrent abuse, which in so many cases equals a life sentence from which they're unable to escape. The Australian Federal Police, State and Territory Police Forces and other partners in the Australian Centre to Counter Child Exploitation are doing fantastic work to track down offenders and rescue children from these awful situations. Just last month, a major operation with the AFP removed 16 children from harm and arrested and charged 44 Australian men from every state and territory with sharing abhorrent child abuse material online. But with the number of reports the ACCC is now receiving each year, they are facing an uphill battle. Clearly, there are tens of thousands of pedophiles and child rapists hiding in communities across Australia preying on children. Surely it should be our priority as a nation to identify these dangerous criminals and put them behind bars where they can never harm children again. After all, it's only when they're in prison that we can know for sure they're not harming children. Because we do know that a high percentage of convicted sex offenders go on to reoffend again and again. Earlier this year, I asked the AFP Commissioner about the impact of courts releasing convicted child sex offenders back into the community. Commissioner Kershaw said, I think if you asked our frontline officers, their view is that these people are not able to be rehabilitated, so it's only a matter of time before they reoffend. And we do see a lot of reoffending occurring. Very few Australians would disagree with the proposition that if you lock up known pedophiles and child rapists and keep them locked up, you're reducing the threat to children and allowing the police to focus on catching other offenders. But that's not what's happening in Australia. Instead, on a weekly basis, child rapists are walking free after being given suspended sentences or very short periods of time in prison. They're being released back into the community where we raise our children, and they're back onto the internet and the dark web looking for and commissioning child abuse material. 
The brief research uncovers hundreds of recent cases of child abuse where the offenders will be back on the street in a blink of an eye. Just a handful of examples from court decisions handed down in the last couple of months in Australia. A 35-year-old woman who produced and distributed child abuse material featuring a child known to her was given a three-month sentence, fully suspended. A 38-year-old man who repeatedly sexually assaulted a 14-year-old girl and filmed the acts, eligible for parole after just three years. A 41-year-old who raped an intoxicated and most likely unconscious 14-year-old, eligible for parole after two and a half years. A 51-year-old with previous convictions for sexual offences sentenced to just six years and eligible for parole after four years for repeated sexual assault of a 13-year-old boy with a severe intellectual disability. A 37-year-old sentenced to just two years, nine months, with parole after half that term for sexually assaulting his eight-year-old niece, boasting about it in an internet chat room and possessing a large quantity of child abuse material. A 26-year-old who searched for child abuse material on the internet and asked an, an eight-year-old girl to send him sexualised videos. A community corrections assessment reported to an above-average risk of sexual recidivism. He was given just six months on a home detention order. How is this acceptable? Instead of putting child safety first, courts are simply kicking the can down the road a few months or a couple of years. Are we seriously expected to believe that someone who rapes a 14-year-old won't be a danger to children when they're released in three years' time? Are we supposed to accept that a six-month home detention order is going to keep Australian children safe for the next 50 years from a 26-year-old child abuse enthusiast assessed as a high risk of recidivism? Who is accepting culpability when these offenders inevitably do abuse another child when they should have been in jail where they belong? If courts don't learn to prioritise community safety ahead of the interests of sex offenders, then another generation of children will be condemned to a lifetime of pain and suffering. Australia must do better. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, uh, and uh, thanks to my colleague Senator Ciccioni for letting me work my way uh, up the list this evening. I want to make a short contribution on a region that's too often neglected uh, in the parliament and in Australian public. Uh, debate, uh, that is North Africa. The ceasefire between Morocco and the Western Sahara independence movement, Frente Polisario, has been an uneasy but long-standing source of stability in the region. It's been a hard-won peace built on decades of careful negotiation and statecraft overseen by the United Nations and backed by an international peacekeeping force. In fact, more than 200 Australian military personnel have taken part in the United Nations mission for the referendum in Western Sahara. Indeed, in 1993, Army doctor Major Susan Felsher was killed, becoming the first Australian servicewoman to die on an overseas military operation since World War II. The news that the ceasefire has broken down is a source of concern, deep concern, across the entire international community. The presence of military forces in the Gurgaon area and the Buffer Strip is a clear violation of the military agreement signed by both parties in 1997 and in 1998, as is the firing of weapons over the region. A breakdown of the ceasefire in Western Sahara is a threat to both regional and global stability. Already there are concerns about a spillover effect in Mali, where the political situation is wisely, uh, widely understood to be one of the United Nations' most challenging and complex peacekeeping missions. I urge both parties to respect human rights in the territory of Western Sahara, adhere to the humanitarian law of armed conflict as outlined in the Geneva Convention, and to positively engage in negotiations towards a settlement of this situation. Urge the, I urge the United Nations Security Council to take immediate steps to restore the ceasefire and to organise a resumption of negotiations and a plan to deliver a lasting solution to the conflict in Western Sahara. Any resolution must include the right for the people of Western Sahara to choose their own future. Decades of diplomacy have failed to give what was promised to the people of Western Sahara in 1991, a referendum between independence or integration with Morocco. The vote has been delayed several times. As a country that believes 
and it has its deep abiding interest in a rules-based international order and indeed in the multilateral institutions that allow nations to resolve disputes peacefully and as a country that has sent their servicemen and women to oversee the peace in the region, Australia has a close interest in the peaceful resolution of this conflict and will be watching the situation in Western Sahara closely. We hope, I think we all hope, for a peaceful outcome that respects the will of the Sahari people, their right to self-determination and their right to peaceful coexistence in their region. Thank you, Senator. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I draw attention to the Australian Parliament's failure to protect the interests of the Australian people. In the Senate yesterday, the Liberals, Nationals and Labor Party united in standing beside big banks against the interests of everyday Australians. Together, they voted down my bill to prevent bank deposits being bailed in, meaning that when banks get into trouble, they can steal depositors' money. Their madness is simple. Australia has the world's safest banks. The only thing that could bring our banks down is a loss of confidence. And that's the very thing my bill was designed to stop. Not once has the Treasurer, the Prime Minister or APRA, the bank regulator, come out and said, we will not bail in your deposits. It's time the Australian people heard those words. The right to use a banking service without losing our money is just one of many rights that everyday Australians have lost. Another is the loss of property rights. Now, Prime Minister John Howard's government's response to the UN's Kyoto Protocol in 1996 was to use the deceitful trick of protecting junk vegetation from destruction. The carbon dioxide that this saved counted to our UN Kyoto targets, and it still does. It enabled his government to bypass its constitutional duty to compensate farmers for stealing their property rights. This is a perfect example of mad climate policies that are about bowing to unelected, unrepresentative foreign UN bureaucrats rather than showing actual environmental outcomes. The land that John Howard's capricious action supposedly protected was not something worthwhile like an old growth forest or riparian vegetation. No, it was agricultural land that was stolen. John Howard's government stole our farmers' rights to clear land, junk vegetation that grows on a field not used for a few years. It prevents farmers making productive use of their land. To this day, the general public think this ban on, clearing, on land clearing relates to actual forests. This conjures up images of evil farmers chopping down virgin forests and sending koalas to their deaths. The reality is this ban stops farmers clearing saltbush and junk vegetation that's stopping productive agriculture on land that has been farmed many times. The old parties never let the truth stand in the way of virtue signalling. The Liberal National Government, with John Howard as Treasurer, is largely to blame for banking misconduct. It was John Howard that deregulated banking. This exposed bank customers to the atrocious behaviour that was found during the Senate inquiry into rural and regional lending that I chaired. Our inquiry led to the Banking Royal Commission finding even more wrongdoing. Now, the Morrison government recently demonstrated another failure in looking after small business. Aussie company QDECO operated the Rocklands copper mine near Cloncurry in Queensland. It was driven into insolvency from the actions of the minority Chinese owners. The mine was sold to a local Chinese company who promptly onsold it to a Chinese government entity. China now owns an important Australian copper mine thanks to the ineffective Morrison government. The mine's workers will never get their missing wages and local contractors are out of pocket $60 million. The only way we will see Qdeco's copper again is if we buy that copper inside Chinese manufactured electronics. Chinese corporations continue to cherry pick their way through our resources sector. China is buying mines, real estate, farms and even our water. I do compliment Treasurer Frydenberg, though, on his recent decision to block the sale of Pura milk to the Chinese, resulting in the Australian company Bega buying Pura. After the Liberal, National and Labor parties selling Australia out for a generation, a welcome break. Since my return to the Senate last year, the Liberal, Labor and National parties have been acting together and have voted down One Nation's motions, many motions, to restore farmers' water rights. 
The 2007 Water Act takes their water rights and forces Aussie farmers, family farmers off the land. Even now, with all the rain this year, farmers are on as little as 39 per cent allocation. Who passed the 2007 Water Act? Prime Minister John Howard. Who introduced the Murray-Darling Basin Plan in 2012? Prime Minister Julia Gillard. The whole point of the Water Act was to remove family farms from the land, then to remove their water rights to new irrigation areas on cheap land belonging to corporate agriculture. Windfall profits all round, Australian farmers and local communities being gutted. The Australian Parliament must decide whether it represents the interests of big business Thank you. or the interests of everyday Australians. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to speak regarding the need for Australian corporations, organisations and institutions to proceed with caution when endorsing political movements such as Black Lives Matters or BLM. Now, the radical left knows a thing or two about effective communication and language. This is how they've sold the Australian people pup after pup. The Trojan horse of language has been used to great effect and arguably no greater example of this exists than the use of the name Black Lives Matters. Who could argue with it? Racism is deplorable, and every reasonable Australian agrees. But the name, however, tells only a fraction of the story, as BLM is a much more sinister movement, one which no reasonable Australian could support were they armed with the truth. Why, then, are we finding example after example of organisations endorsing BLM when they really don't understand what BLM truly stands for? Now, several weeks ago, I spoke publicly about my disappointment regarding the news that the Australian one-day international cricket team were planning to conduct an on-field barefoot ceremony in support of BLM before the 27 November 2020 one-day international match with India. Australian coach Justin Langer told the media Racism is wrong. That's a universal law. Simple. Well, thanks, Justin. I'm with you on that. An Australian vice captain, Pat Cummins, told the same newspaper that his team was absolutely against racism and that once you start to learn a little bit about it, it becomes a really easy decision in speaking about BLM. Well, in my respectful submission, it would pay everybody involved in this decision to have learned a little bit more about the movement because I'm fairly confident that once they know the truth about this organisation, they would run a mile. So what do we actually know about BLM? Well, one of its founders describes herself and her fellow organisers as, quote, trained Marxists. That is, they are adherents to the radical left-wing political ideology which opposes the free market and freedom of speech. And this is just one example of an organisation rushing blindly into the endorsement of BLM without properly understanding what it means. Now, earlier in the month, I was contacted by a constituent who forwarded an email addressed to all students from the acting vice-chancellor of the University of Adelaide entitled, University of Adelaide Black Lives Matters. That email stated that the University of Adelaide endorses the broad principles of Black Lives Matters movement and that the university's endorsement of Black Lives Matters is one such step and we shall stand against all manifestations of racism. Now, I wrote to the Chancellor to seek clarification and I was advised that the university indeed supported the broad principles of BLM and as a result of its ongoing uh, commitment to tackling the grand challenge of Indigenous health and wellbeing and that the university was committed to closing the gap of disadvantage, uh, uh, disadvantage faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people both in the university and the broader community. But I'm interested in which of these broad principles, as outlined in BLM's now removed What We Believe manifesto, does the university endorse? Is it the radical Marxism? Is it the anti-police rhetoric? Is it the opposition to freedom of speech? Is it the opposition to the free market? Is it the anti-West ideology? Is it the anti-nuclear family structure? These don't seem like broad principles to which a public university would want to associate themselves with, do they? Now, if this was just another example of gesture politics, I'd be far less concerned. But what we have here is different, because what this is actually doing is dragging the important institutions of sport and learning into a tacit endorsement of a political wolf in sheep's clothing. Now, with great privilege comes great responsibility, and it's time that bodies like Australian Cricket Team and the University of Adelaide start doing their homework 
rather than blindly ticking off on these projects. <coughs> Senator Polly. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on Australia's world-class superannuation system and how the government is trying to attack it to undermine Australian workers. There's been an incredibly important role play by superannuation in the lives of Australians. During this crisis, the Morrison government allowed people earlier access to their superannuation accounts, and the impacts of this will be felt for decades to come. The early release scheme has been incredibly poorly administered. It has been subject to fraud and abuse, something that should be, uh, should be seen in the full glare of an independent audit and commissioned inquiry. And now 600,000 Australians have reduced their superannuation to zero, which will help really hurt them in their retirement. This is accompanied by the fact that over 1.4 million Australians have accessed their super during this pandemic to the tune of $36 billion, hurting all Australians in retirement. Our world-class superannuation scheme may not be celebrated by all members opposite, but it's recognised around the world as one of the best in class. The Mercer Global Pension Index, an annual assessment of private pension schemes around the world, has consistently ranked Australia's superannuation system in the top two or three. Last year, it was ranked number three out of nearly 40 countries, a significant achievement. We have the fourth largest pool of superannuation retirement savings of anywhere in the world. Australian workers' own retirement savings are equal to 140 per cent of GDP. As a proportion of GDP, this is greater than the United States, whose pension fund amounts to 135 per cent of GDP, the United Kingdom, whose pension fund amounts to 104.5 per cent of GDP. But the Morrison government wants to continue to undermine superannuation. The Prime Minister wants to cut the legislated super increase guarantee and freeze your super at 9.5 per cent. This will lead to many Australians losing up to $100,000 once they retire. And those opposite want to undermine your super, and yet we all receive 14.5 per cent in super. How is that fair? We know it's those opposite. It's in their DNA to undermine super. Tim Wilson and Andrew Bragg now want young Australians to be able to raid their super so they can use it to put a deposit on a house. Housing affordability is a major issue in Australia, and it's one that we've been facing for quite some time. In the last 25 years, 17 of those have been conservative Liberal governments. And have they tried to address the real issues around housing affordability? No, they have not. This government needs to focus on creating conditions for economic development, growth and jobs instead of harebrained schemes which don't add up. The government's super reforms do not end there. The government wants to attack to industry super, which will lead to the undermining of investment in jobs, creating infrastructure, and this is why wages have flatlined over the last five years. Construction industry workers receive tailor-made life insurance as part of a construction industry super fund membership, which takes into account the dangers at work. Under the Morrison government's ill-conceived stapling changes, new entrants into the construction industry would in most cases miss out on that specific insurance. Strongly performing super funds should not be undermined because it hurts every Australian worker. Any supposed reform must be discussed and worked through instead of being kept in secret and then rushed through Parliament. Superannuation must be guarded, protected so it can thrive to ensure that individuals can retire with dignity and ensure that they have a quality of life. We should be, in fact, encouraging more savings into superannuation, not undermining it. And the fact that this government is hell-bent on attacking industry funds just goes to show that it's so entrenched in their DNA, it's another opportunity for them to attack Australian workers. 
each and every day that we sit in this chamber, we on this side will defend Australian workers. We will always defend superannuation because it's essential for equality of retirement in this country. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the plight of older women. Before this year, the fastest growing cohort of homeless people was older women aged over 55. But this year, it's now women aged over 45. There are 405,000 women aged 45 and older who are at risk of homelessness. The Retirement Income Review released last month shows that people over 65 who don't own their own home are struggling to keep a roof over their heads, with 48 per cent of them living in poverty. Women are at increased risk of homelessness if they rent on the private market, if they don't have full-time employment and if they are or have been a single parent, their risk of homelessness increases by 65 per cent. Many women sacrifice a significant amount of their working life to unpaid caring work for their children and then, as they get older, for their elderly parents. And women retire, on average, with half the superannuation of men, despite having a life expectancy of five years longer. This means, of course, that more women are relying on the full-aged pension. And currently, 40 per cent of single women in Australia aged 50 or over are living in poverty. A growing number of older people are stuck on the poverty-inducing JobSeeker payment, with 42 per cent of people on JobSeeker aged over over 45. Now, all of these statistics are worse if you are a First Nations woman. The government's COVID stimulus focus on the construction and gas sectors will do nothing to help women. And when we consider the government's failures in aged care and the disaster of privatisation, it's important to remember that two thirds of aged care residents are women and 80 per cent of aged care workers are women. At every stage of our lives, Women have been let down by this government, who have always chosen to prioritise the profits of the private sector over the lives and well-being of people. And as we are near the end of the year, we know that it's women who will be doing the heavy lifting of unpaid work to make festivities special. But there's also the unacknowledged emotional labour that women do to bring families together. There are so many policy responses that this government should be considering. Close the gender pay gap to finally boost women's financial and economic security. Permanently increase job seeker to a livable rate. Pay superannuation on parental leave. Double the low income superannuation tax offset or listo. And we know twice as many women as men would benefit from that. Remove that threshold of $450 a month income. Uh, above, uh, below which superannuation isn't payable by an employer. Again, it's women that miss out because of that threshold. Make early childhood education universal and free and build one million social homes to address the long waiting list for public housing in this country. And lastly, look at how to financially value unpaid care work, looking at both workplace and social security reforms, and for both people who take a temporary break from paid employment to fulfil caring duties such as parental leave, but also for full-time carers who are permanently out of the workforce. This should include considering things like caring credits on superannuation, but it should also consider bolder reforms like a universal basic income. We know that so often for older women, the reward for a lifetime of care is retiring to poverty, and surely in this nation we can do better than that. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. And I rise uh, today to put on the record my support for one of Australia's great pastimes, a sport that is enjoyed by many and which as an industry is a major employer across our country, in particular in my home state of Victoria. Of course, I'm talking about horse racing. While the racing industry as a whole should be praised for the economic activity and the jobs it delivers, today I wanted to focus on one particular element of the industry, jumps. Jumps racing is a unique part of the racing industry in Victoria, neighbouring South Australia, 
It is particularly popular in regional areas, with 15 of the 16 jumps tracks in Australia. Within the racing industry, jumps accounts for thousands of jobs, including over a quarter of all trainers in the two states in which it is active. Most of these jobs can be found in regional areas, where they contribute significantly to the prosperity of country towns, both big and small. In fact, over 63 per cent of racing employees, volunteers and participants in Victoria reside in regional areas. This makes racing a big employer throughout my state. Not only does it provide direct jobs, it also provides a multitude of indirect jobs as well. Jobs in transport, hospitality, tourism, just to name a few. One initiative that's been implemented by the Australian Jumping Racing Association and Country, and country Racing uh, to further enhance its economic contribution to regional areas has been the introduction of the Jumps Racing Trail. This is a series of races over winter where meets are scheduled in such a way as to allow fans to follow the jumps racing circuit throughout country towns, encouraging tourism and overnight visitors, increased per person spent and local engagement with other events being coordinated with the races. This is an example of jumps racing working with local communities to help multiply the economic activity associated with the sport. And boy, do they need it right now. I'm disappointed, though, when I hear that some seek to talk down this industry and the workers who make their livelihood from it. Whilst JUMPS has in the past had its problems, there is no doubting that the commitment that participants have for the welfare of these magnificent animals that partake in this sport. Make no mistake, no one cares for these horses more than the owners the trainers and the jockeys who work with them every single day. In particular, I note the recent decision by the industry to roll out the innovative one fit modified hurdle frame to all hurdle races and trials across Victoria and South Australia. The one fit design conceived, trialled and tested in, in the United Kingdom has already been installed at tracks both in Cranbourne and Warrnambool to great success. In the United Kingdom, it has seen falls drop to just 1.59 per cent and has also contributed to a reduction in the risk of injury to both the horse and rider when falls do unfortunately occur. There can be no doubt in the commitment of jumps to always doing more and more to further enhance safety. As we move into 2021 and with Victoria and indeed Australia moving into a post-pandemic economy, it is important that we all work together to support our regional communities who have done it tough this year. I commend the work of the Australian Jumping Racing Association in not only promoting their sport to the public, but in working to ensure that it supports the communities in which it operates. And I thoroughly look forward to visiting these regional communities next year and encourage others to do the same. Not only is it a fun day out and a great weekend away, but it is also an opportunity to support our fellow Australians post-COVID-19. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to, tonight to speak about South Australia's forestry industry, but in terms that will be of interest to everyone in the chamber, especially for the, the Minister for Employment. We have a proud history in, of uh, forestry in South Australia. In 1875, South Australia established the first government forest management organisation in the then British Empire. When first settled by Europeans, South Australia had only limited native forest of commercial interest, so it was imperative that the young community be provided with quality building and timber products. Early farming practices and the demand for timber qu quickly caused the depletion of a large proportion of the higher rainfall vegetation. So the South Australian government had to work to establish forests. And in 1876, tree nurseries and plantings were initiated in the mid-north uh, and Mount Gambier in the southeast to find suitable tree species and locations for plantations. Bundalia Forest 
Reserve near uh, Jamestown became Australia's first commercial plantation forest. And I'll come back to talk to, uh, about Bundalia shortly. Now, the forestry industry is vital for my state. Forestry exists in uh, the Mount Lofty Ranges, the Mid North, <coughs> Kangaroo Island, and the South East as part of the Green Triangle. Um, South Australia's forestry industry plants approximately 8 million, 8 million trees each year. Encompassing, it encompasses more than 170,000 hectares of softwood and hardwood plantations, and it does need to expand. It's worth $2 billion to the economy. Almost 500,000 cubic metres of hardwood logs are harvested in, in South Australia for export as logs um, or wood chip. Now, I don't have an issue with, the, with uh, exporting wood chips as we've undertaken the processing here in Australia, we've done the value add here, and it's unlikely that we would re-import wood chips at greater value than what we exported them. The forestry and wood processing industry is an icon of South, East, uh, South Australia, responsible for about 35 per cent of employment. Now, the South Australian government has been supporting the sale of forest, forest uh, uh, log to China. Two and a half weeks ago, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese government escalated its assault on Australian trade by banning imports of Australian timber due to bark beetle having been detected. Now, the convenience of that, is, uh, of, uh, of that timing is not um, uh, coincidental. No one thinks it's uh, anything other than part of a planned sequence of punitive measures by the Chinese government. But I say that brings about opportunity. A couple of points to consider. There's about 17 trees in an average house frame. A timber floor for an average house uses three trees. One pine tree can produce 2,000 rolls of toilet paper. So let's stimulate the economy and create jobs. Let's build some social housing. Let's re-fence our farms. Let's make toilet paper. And if COVID-19 hasn't taught us anything, the one thing it's taught us is that we should be making toilet paper here. Fires uh, took place in the Bundalia forest in 2013, and no uh, tree planting has occurred since. Uh, and earlier uh, this year, we saw our, uh, our sawmills were watching as South Australia burned. Uh, bushfires went through uh, plantations uh, that were necessary for their livelihood. Now, these mills need timber. In South Australia, and I have been talking to there are sawmills for, that, for, for some time that have struggled to secure timber for their mills. Not, not necessarily because they've lost uh, the, the logs in the fire, but because the South Australian government has been selling the log to the highest bidder. It's a case of best price, not best value. They have no regard to what's in the best interests of South Australia. We, uh, the risk is we lose our sawmills and we lose the ability to value add. And indeed, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security deems their wood product industry as an essential, critical uh, infrastructure workforce. Now, the Australian, South Australian government doesn't seem to care about value add because they don't pay the unemployment bill. The federal government does that, so they're just about getting the best price for the log. And if that means the log goes to China, that's what happens. Governments need to start appreciating that there is a difference between best export price and the best value to, to the nation. South Australia's government needs to wake up on this. Thank you. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, the 20th of December marks, will mark 12 months since more than 200 bushfires started burning across my home state of South Australia, part of what has now become known as the Black Summer bushfires. The devastation of these fires saw four lives tragically lost, multiple injuries to our brave firefighters combating the flames, and a damage bill in excess of 186 million. Last year, our communities endured blazes in the Murraylands during late October and on the York Peninsula in late November which saw seven houses destroyed and 5,000 hectares burnt. In the lead-up to Christmas, with temperatures in the west of the state reaching around 50 degrees Celsius and following four days of hot weather, a major fire at Cudley Creek in the Adelaide Hills spread rapidly, threatening townships ranging from Mount Pleasant, Gumbaraka, Lobethal to Woodside. 
Over 40,000 hectares would be burnt before the fires were brought under control. The devastation caused by these fires saw 84 homes and over 400 outbuildings as well as 292 vehicles destroyed. On that very same day, Kangaroo Island experienced multiple lightning strikes, which caused further fires to burn through around 200,000 hectares, destroying 56 homes and damage to hundreds of other buildings before being contained some 11 days later. The devastation and tragedy of those fires caused is still felt by those affected today. But the communities ravished by the fires have not been defeated. It is inspiring to see these communities stand together and rebuild. I commend those who worked tirelessly to protect life and property and those organisations who stepped up to provide crucial relief in the wake of these harrowing natural disasters. One such organisation is the National Not-for-Profit Disaster Relief Australia. Their mission is to unite the skills and experience of military veterans with emergency service specialists to rapidly deploy disaster relief teams in Australia and around the world in the wake of natural disasters. From the beginning of January this year through to March, DRA, as they are more commonly known, deployed 194 volunteers from all over Australia to, in three operations across the Cudley Creek and Kangaroo Island fire grounds. And that is not counting the international and sponsored volunteers who joined their ranks. Through operations named Hannaford, Tiger and Turner, DRA delivered almost $786,000 worth of services to the community at no cost to those in need. This is an impressive achievement. Importantly, DRA did not fly into South Australia and then disappear. They came and stayed. DRA's assistance to the community has continued through their ongoing Adelaide Hills service projects, which has deployed 28 volunteers to assist with further works on properties affected by the fires. They have also been further deployed on Kangaroo Island. With only the restrictions of COVID slowing down their drive to assist communities requiring assistance. DRA now have an enviable reputation of being able to deliver critical disaster relief to communities by deploying volunteers rapidly across the nation and further abroad. They utilise the unique skills of their volunteers, innovative technology solutions and their accomplished leadership team to provide the greatest impact on the ground with the singular focus to make the difference in the lives of those affected by natural disasters. Just in the 2019-20 bushfire season alone, DRA deployed 523 volunteer members on disaster relief operations, contributing over 2.2 million in support to communities. I want to pay a particular tribute to their Director of Development, Anastasia Buesis, a South Australian and volunteer for DRA. Despite her family being dramatically affected by the fires in the Adelaide Hills, she refused to think of herself and only of others. She volunteered to be the state commander for DRA in South Australia and led their damage assessment team and subsequently their bushfire relief operations. I commend her for her self-sacrifice and dedication to her community and as one of the key leaders of DRA. She is a shining light in the volunteer community in South Australia. As a consequence of the work of Ms. Ms. Buesis, we now have a state in the state, a vibrant and very active team of DRA volunteers who continue to work for our country communities and change lives. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. The WA community wants climate action. They want to see their government take advantage of the opportunity created by the urgent need to rebuild uh, in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, to address uh, what we know as a community is the urgent uh, crisis that faces us in the form of climate change. We want to see uh, the new jobs, the clean industries uh, come to our communities, and we want to see our precious places uh, cleaned up and preserved in the process. Uh, for many of us, we have waited uh, four years to see 
uh, whether Mark McGowan's Labour government would bring itself to produce a climate policy. Uh, and recently, uh, the government has uh, produced a, a document uh, headed Our Climate Policy. It was with great disappointment and profound frustration uh, that we cracked the lid on this so-called policy and found that it contained no emissions reduction target and no renewable energy target, leaving many to ask the question, well, what the hell is a climate policy without uh, such measures inside it? In addition to this question, the resounding message that has borne up from the WA community is why? Why, why, in a state so gifted uh, with natural, renewable resources that is so well positioned to take advantage of the job opportunities of the renewable energy boom, why are we the only na state in the nation to lag behind without an emissions reduction target and without a renewable energy target? Why, when there is so much support for action, does the government find itself unable to act on climate change? Well, an answer can be found. An answer can be found within this excellent report uh, produced by the organisation uh, 350.org uh, Boraloo, uh, recently released, which details in the most uh, breathtaking way the relationship that exists uh, between the gas industry in the state of Western Australia and Mark McGowan's Labor government. Entitled Captured State, it takes us on a dark journey uh, through an insidious relationship uh, of corporate influence, of donations and of a quite revolting revolving door between the gas industry, between Woodside and Chevron and the regulatory industries that are designed and created uh, to keep a check on these uh, very industries, leading right the way back uh, to the Premier's office. One of the wonderful things that it does for so many people in the community is finally take two pieces of information that have been on the public record for a long time, uh, the diaries of our uh, Premier and our Energy Minister and the donations disclosures made to the Electoral Commission and cross-reference them so that we are at last able to see uh, the link between meetings that are had and donations that are made. And I will outline just two of the most uh, worrying examples made within the report. On the 25th of July uh, 2018, Energy Minister Bill Johnson uh, took a meeting with Woodside to discuss uh, the Burrup Hub development. Uh, just uh, a few days later, Woodside made a donation to the WA Labour Party of no less than $6,600. Fast forward to the 19th of March, and the Environment Minister, Stephen Dawson, took a meeting with Chevron for an unknown reason, uh, followed quickly by a meeting uh, with Mark McGowan, and that elicited a donation of $1,700. $1,700. This level of corporate influence is repugnant to the people of Western Australia, and it shows us clearly why there is such a brokenness at the heart of the ridiculous policy that Labor has put forward. Senator Ferraventi Wells. Deputy President, in my first speech regarding Cardinal Pell, I ind indicated my intention of laying out the details of the attack against him that resulted in him being unjustly imprisoned for more than a year. The High Court of Australia looked at part of his unjust imprisonment when it determined that the implausible nature of the claims against him meant that there was a significant possibility that an innocent person had been convicted. It was a unanimous decision, 7-0. The High Court's analysis considered events in and around the days when the crimes were alleged to have occurred. 
The assaults were said to have been committed in a public place in a room where the door remained open, accessible to numerous persons engaged in functions ordinarily, ordinarily performed after mass. The two alleged victims each witnessed the assault perpetrated on the other victim. Hence, corroboration on that day, the next day or any time in the years before the second boy died, an old, untimely death ought to have been straightforward. Pell's regular practice was to remain on the steps outside of Mass, greeting people in the company of his Master of Ceremonies until his vestments were removed. They were, most importantly, of such a weight and style that committing the assaults as described was impossible. It wasn't only the events of the day that made the offending implausible. A consideration of the historical context provided by events in Victoria from 1993 to 1996 renders the committal of the alleged assaults by the newly appointed Archbishop intrinsically improbable. This broader context text is relevant to evaluating the inherent improbability of the assaults ever having occurred. This historical context has been ignored and accordingly it is important that it be placed on the public record. The announcement of Pell's appointment as Archbishop of Melbourne on 16 July 1996 did not take place in a vacuum. By then, the more notorious clerical pedophiles in Victoria had been exposed, charged and prosecuted. By 1996, the community had become well aware of the appalling breaches of trust committed by Glennon, Ridsdale, O'Donnell and Gannon, just to name a few. There was consistent media reporting of the scandal as it developed before an incredulous and dismayed Catholic community, as well as the general public. Ridsdale was first jailed in May 1993. O'Donnell and Gannon were both convicted and jailed in 1995. A Four Corners program on clerical abuse was shown in July 1996. During that year, forums on child sexual abuse were held in the Archdiocese, one of which took place at Sacred Heart Parish, Oakley. In late July 1996, a matter of days after the announcement of Pell's appointment, Brother Edward Dowlin was imprisoned for nine years and Brother Robert Best received a suspended sentence for his sexual assaults on minors. Describing this period in the history of the church in Melbourne, Pell told the Victorian parliamentary inquiry into the handling of child abuse allegations by religious and other non-government organisations of the challenges facing the archdiocese when he assumed office. He said, at this time, the media was full of accounts detailing sex abuse in the Catholic community. As an auxiliary bishop to Archbishop Little, I did not have the authority to handle these matters and had only some general impressions about the response that was being made at that time, but this was sufficient to make it clear to me that this was an issue which needed urgent attention and that we needed to do much better in our response. It was my job when I became Archbishop to address this problem within the Archdiocese of Melbourne, and address it he did. After the announcement, but prior to his appointment taking effect, then Archbishop-elect Pell announced that there would be a shift in the church's approach to payment of compensation for clerical sexual abuse claims. The new Archbishop knew his credibility in addressing historical sexual abuse would be measured by whether and how quickly he could get his program up and running. One of his first acts as Archbishop was to seek legal advice about how the church in Victoria had responded to the increasing number of claims. He was told that legal technicalities had been employed as part of taking a hard line against plaintiffs, which included the issuing of summonses seeking dismissal of plaintiffs' claims. No cases had been settled because to settle a case would have been an admission that a priest had acted disgracefully, and that such disgrace would damage the reputation of the church. Pell publicly stated that this intolerable situation would no longer be countenanced and wasted no time in acting. He spoke with then Governor of Victoria, Richard McGarvey QC, who suggested that he appoint a senior legal person who would be given independence and authority to make recommendations to the Archbishop. Pell discussed the matter in some detail with then Victorian Premier Jeff Kennett. Pell established an informal advisory group comprised of experts in diverse fields of social welfare, criminal law, civil law, personal injuries compensation, canon law, counselling and support services, and administrative and financial officers of the diocese. From July to October 1996, Pell consulted intensely 
with the group for the purpose of creating a new system of inquiry, compensation and counselling for victims of clerical sex abuse in the archdiocese. There was consultation with senior members of the Victorian Police concerning protocols to be followed when it, where investigations by the church's independent commissioner revealed conduct which may amount to a criminal offence. On 30 October 1996, within his first 100 days in office, Pell formally announced the Melbourne response. This was a new process by which justice, compensation, counselling and professional support services would be offered to victims of sexual abuse perpetrated by Catholic priests, religious and lay people under the control of the diocese. There was also a panel to oversee the administration of the Melbourne response. Membership was not confined to Catholics and included some of the state's best legal practitioners. It is important to note that the federal the Victoria Police welcomed the initiative as a positive step in tackling this very sensitive community issue and welcomed the appointment of Peter O'Callaghan, QC, as independent commissioner. On 12 August 1996, prior to the formal announcement of the response, even the editor of the Melbourne Age described Pell's undertaking that the church would negotiate settlements for genuine claims of sex abuse even if it meant putting the church into debt as an important and auspicious step forward for the Catholic Church in Australia. It would seem unthinkable now that the Premier of Victoria, Victoria Police and the Age would all be saying positive things about the Catholic Church and in particular Pell on addressing the scourge of child abuse in the church's history. However, Pell's rugged determination to show leadership was noticeable and impressive. With the backdrop of this broader context, the implausibility of the allegations against Cardinal Pell take on a whole new dimension. At the time of the alleged offending, Pell was a newly minted archbishop, publicly addressing the scandal of clerical sexual abuse and personally invested in the establishment of a church response. He was in discussion with Victoria's governor, its premier, high-ranking police, leading figures in law, medicine and social services as to the design of the program. Given all the publicity and the fact that child sexual abuse was front of mind of government, police, media and the Catholic faithful, can any reasonable person actually believe he would threaten his own reputation and credibility by engaging in criminal assaults? of a random, violent and palpably risky nature upon adolescent choir boys in a busy cathedral. This was implausibility heaped on improbability. It ought to have been clear to reasonable members of the community that the offen offence could not have happened. So why then was he convicted? We will need to continue this incredible tale because there are many parts to it. One of them, perhaps most fundamental of all, all, was that an understandably angry public wanted an identifiable villain. The church had seemingly fallen down. Someone had to pay for this, and in looking for a fall guy, Pell seemed to fit the bill. Melbourne crime journalist John Sylvester described Pell as a lightning rod in the worldwide storm of anger at a systemic cover-up of priestly abuses. Like the scapegoat of the Old Testament, he was to be punished for the sins of others. The sad irony of all of this is that instead of being the one to blame for the abuse crisis in the church, particularly in Melbourne, but even across the world, Pell was the first to address it. For all the criticisms hurled at the Melbourne response, the Royal Commission, after years of consideration and millions of dollars expended, came up with a national redress scheme which has no obvious advantages over the scheme that Pell created more than two decades prior during his first three months as Archbishop of Melbourne. This is something his more hostile critics seem incapable of acknowledging. To be continued. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to uh, uh, just pay tribute to the people of the Northern Territory and indeed all Australians as we come to the end of the year. Uh, it is December. It is a time now where we are starting to prepare for Christmas, uh, to think of those uh, who matter in our lives. It's been interesting to, to see some of the visuals in the last few days 
uh, just on uh, families wanting to connect and reconnect with uh, loved ones uh, throughout different jurisdic jurisdictions across Australia. And we're mindful still too, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, of the thousands of Australians who still wish to come home uh, from countries abroad. I think uh, when I talk about the Northern Territory in this instance, uh, it's an opportunity just to really say thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, the uh, Chief Medical Officer and the staff involved with uh, caring and protecting for the people of the Northern Territory, to the OSMAT team who uh, punch way above their weight, uh, who were the first, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, to step up uh, back in January, February to assist uh, with Australians who were caught over in China at that particular time when COVID-19 became known uh, to all Australians. To the residents on Christmas and Cocos Keeling Islands, uh, we're certainly thinking of you, in particular the residents on Christmas Island. Again, you took in those families. Uh, the very first plane loads that arrived into Australia went to Christmas Island for protection and for support. And as we come to the end of 2020, I think it's fair to say that most Australians will be pretty happy to see this year go by. It's also an opportunity to reflect, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, on what is important uh, that we as uh, not only Australians but I think as people around the globe uh, recognise that it has been an extraordinary, diff extraordinarily difficult year uh, of challenge with this uh, pandemic. And again, uh, one of the beautiful things is seeing humanity rise uh, to the core and to the fore of trying to uh, assist and help one another. Uh, yes, here in this place and certainly the other house, uh, we have to have combative moments, but we are coming towards the end of the year. And I do think there are real moments of reflection and this is one of those. In the Northern Territory, I just sincerely wish uh, every uh, family a safe and very happy Christmas, uh, wherever you are, in the remote regions of the Northern Territory, in the towns, Alice Springs, Tennant Creek, Catherine, Darwin, Palmerston, Nullanboy, Groot Island, uh, wherever you are, uh, make sure you stay safe. Make sure you still have time for one another. It is the uh, wet season in the north. Naturally, we will be preparing for the cyclones. It's what we do uh, when we live in northern Australia, uh, recognising that uh, we still have to look out for each other. When the waters rise, and the floods come in and the storms hit. I think that's uh, a resilience. It's a character of the Northern Territory that I saw come through strongly during this COVID pandemic. Uh, we punch above our weight. Uh, we certainly reached out to assist wherever we could across Australia and also to those Australians who've come from abroad and are now at Howard Springs uh, facility quarantining. It's been a strange year on other fronts as well, Madam Acting Deputy President, when we think of the issues. Uh, I reflect on the Black Lives Matter protests across the country and the passion in which uh, thousands and thousands of Australians took to the streets. And I commend them and I commend the leadership of those state and territory jurisdictions who recognise the importance of these passionate marches that did take place. And I thank them. Uh, for what they were able to achieve and to highlight and bring again the humanity uh, to the forefront of the pain of First Nations people and people of colour in terms of the high rates of incarceration and the deaths in custody uh, that are still way too high and unexplainable in Australia and that's not good enough. These are important issues to pursue vigorously as we go into 2021. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flag, Madam Acting Deputy President, and the Senate's inability to move beyond uh, a very conservative style that I think our country has outgrown. We do embrace our First Nations people and First Nations culture, and I look forward to 2021 where we can, in this Senate, uh, reflect that in flying and displaying those flags here in the Senate. I'd like to thank my staff. You can't really do this job at all, I think, and I think most senators and members would agree, 
uh, that our staff are incredible. And I would like to uh, pay tribute to those who work beside me and walk with me uh, every single day in this job as I represent the people of the Northern Territory, a senator for the Northern Territory, but indeed here in the Australian Senate as a senator for all Australians. Charlie, to you and your family, a very happy and safe Christmas. Mandy, thank you for what you do. You are just amazing. Martha, well, you're extraordinary. I'm going to get in trouble now. Uh, to Sharon, who's just joined us, it's wonderful to have you on board. And I pay tribute to two people who've worked with me throughout this year, Ella and May May, and sincerely wish, wish each and every one of you and your families a safe and happy Christmas. I'd like to uh, make mention of the First Nations Caucus and every member who works with me as chair of that caucus. In particular, I'd like to uh, uh, mention uh, Linda Burney, our Shadow Indigenous Affairs Minister, and Senator Pat Dodson, uh, whose wisdom I seek in so many areas to try and pursue the policies that we need to do, and to do so in such a collective way, but one that hopefully I think uh, continues to bring a greater sense of unity, not only in the parliament, but in our country on the issues that matter to First Nations people and all Australians. So I thank each and every member of the First Nations Caucus and wish you and your families a very safe and happy Christmas. To the National Indigenous Labor Network, uh, to all our Indigenous Labor members across uh, the Australian Labor Party in every state and territory jurisdiction, your support and all of those ministers for Indigenous Affairs as we work together through COVID, uh, through our many teleconferences, uh, thank you for what you do in trying to ensure that uh, whilst we are protecting all Australians, there was a recognition of the vulner vulnerability of First Nations people and I, I commend uh, each and every one of you. To our Aboriginal community health organisations, our Archos, Nachos, all of you, uh, the men and women who work to protect and to maintain the health and dignity of the uh, patients and people in your communities. Thank you for what you do. I'm also mindful, Madam Acting Deputy President, of the many millions of Australians uh, who've lost their jobs who don't and will not have the kind of Christmas that they uh, perhaps would have hoped that they would have. I think that uh, we as a nation must always uh, remember those who are struggling and who do need uh, to never be forgotten, and in particular at Christmas time, as we think about the things individually in terms of our own needs and desires. We also think of those uh, who are desperately in need of support and, in particular, those people who are struggling uh, with mental health illnesses and the loss of loved ones throughout this incredibly difficult year. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'd like to uh, certainly wish uh, each and every member of the Senate and your families a safe and happy Christmas, but also a time for us to reflect on how we can be better representatives uh, as we go into uh, 2021 and make sure that we don't leave any Australian behind. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I rise again tonight to speak on the issue of human rights around the world. The Australian Greens believe that human rights, are, universal human rights, are fundamental and must be respected and protected in all countries and for all peoples. I had the privilege recently of speaking at two roundtables organised by the Humanism Project on human rights in India, and particularly the concerns uh, that um, we have, my, my speech was about, about the RSS, which is a fascist organisation that openly admits admiration for Adolf Hitler and the appalling genocide that occurred under his Nazi regime. The contemporary RSS rides roughshod over people's human rights, and time and time again the RSS has attacked Indian people's right to freedom of expression, freedom of religion and safety. And their advocacy of a Hindu Rashtra is an India where, by definition, minorities are denied rights and privileges, and that they demonise and encourage persecution of some of the non-Hindu citizens of India, particularly those of Muslim background. 
And at, these forum, at the second of these forums, I particularly raised my concerns that Australia's High Commissioner to India, Barry O'Farrell, has recently met with the RSS, and he is only the second senior diplomat from any country to meet the RSS at their offices in recent times. This is a disgrace, and we believe that the High Commissioner should resign. And I'm seeking further information about what advice the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade pri provided to him before that meeting. There were a range of speakers um, from around the world at these two roundtables, including at the second, Mr Raju Rajagopalan, Professor Anjali Arundeka and Peter Friedrich. And they impri provided important perspectives on human rights in India, on international connections and particularly on what we can do next work together globally to be championing human rights in India. Now, I'm keen to continue this discussion here in this parliament in the new year because I believe that issues related to the erosion of human rights and democracy are something that needs to be drawn to the attention and for us to discuss here in this national parliament. Today is the 59th anniversary of the first raising of West Papua's symbol of independence the Morning Star flag. And the Australian Greens have long advocated for West Papuan independence. It was former Australian Greens leader Richard Di Natale who in 2012 launched Australia's chapter of the, of the International Parliamentarians for West Papua. And when the Indonesian president visited here last year, we took the opportunity to raise the issue of human rights in West Papua with him. So today we support the people of West Papua and we call on the Indonesian government to withdraw its combat troops from West Papua and to allow the UN Human Rights Commissioner to visit West Papua. We are incredibly concerned at the likelihood of violence by Indonesian police, military and militias against protesters who are marking this day today. And this concern is particularly important for us here in Australia because we have provided training and support to Indonesian police. And when Indonesian police commit brutalities and human rights violations in West Papua, that is of a real concern to us here as Australians. And we must examine whether we are enabling these violations and take serious, urgent action if we are. And this is, again, something that I'll be seeking further information on. We must not, as Australians, be enabling human rights abuses in West Papua. Another crisis point for human rights is occurring right now, of course, in Ethiopia. And this is a tragic situation. The crisis has been ongoing for some time now and has reached a point where devastating impacts are displacing thousands of people. We are calling for an immediate ceasefire including protection for civilians. And the international community must provide support to negotiate a political solution to this conflict. And the United Nations must have full access to provide humanitarian support and address this crisis. And here in Australia, the Greens believe that the Australian government should be doing everything it can to address this crisis, including supporting a peaceful re resolution and humanitarian aid, and providing assistance to bring home Australians who are stranded in the conflict zone. It should urge the Ethiopian government to lift the telecommunications blackout, which has had devastating impacts on many who are seeking news of their loved ones. And the tragic reality is that this crisis is going to result in more deaths, in more impacts on vulnerable communities and prolonged conflict unless the international community steps in. And the Australian government should be advocating for and providing international support to help this occur. Of course, human rights often intersect with environmental crises in profound and important ways. And I want to thank the writers from the Pacific nations of the open letter in the Sydney Morning Herald today for their courage in calling out our Liberal National Party government's inaction on climate. And what that then means for their communities. They called for Australians to work together with Pacific Island peoples, and they had five key requests. They wanted us to commit to zero net emissions by 2050 and to develop a long-term low greenhouse gas emissions strategy by next year, 2021. They want us to cancel Australia's leftover Kyoto Protocol credits, which legally cannot and morally should not be used to meet our 2030 Paris Agreement targets. 
They want Australia to double our net current nationally determined contribution in line with the 2014 advice from the Independent Climate Change Authority. They want to maximise the opportunities associated with the COVID-19 recovery package to boost the renewable energy sector and the low emissions transport sector. And they want us to provide new and additional funds beyond the current aid budget to finance climate mitigation adaptation under the Paris Agreement, including contributing to the Green Climate Fund. These are all very important things that Australia should be doing. But of course, we actually should be going much further, because the truth is that the Liberal Party's inaction on the climate crisis doesn't just hurt Australians. It's devastating our regional neighbours, who deserve so much better from us. Australia must do its part, and that means taking urgent, serious action on our climate crisis. I want to conclude tonight mentioning a particular case of Samoan Australia. Australian Talalele Pauga, who is in custody in Brisbane, awaiting extradition to Samoa. It's important, of course, that there is an independent, fair process to examine any allegations against him. However, it's a concern where we believe that an individual may potentially not receive a fair and independent process. And in this instance, I am particularly concerned at reports that the Prime Minister of Samoa has intervened by writing and criticising bail decisions in Samoa by the Ministry of Justice in relation to two individuals who also charged the case associated with Mr Pauga. Amnesty International Pacific researcher has said the concern here with the extradition charges is that we don't know what evidence they have to allege this person has been in involved in any crime in Samoa and yet he's been detained and held in custody. Talalele Pauga has been a critic of the Samoan Prime Minister, and we think it's incredible, incredibly important that a person's political activities should not result in political inter interference in what should be a fair and independent judicial process. Amnesty International has particularly raised concerns about this political in potential political interference. And they said, we've seen the UN Special Rapporteur on the independence of judges and lawyers communicate with the Samoan government this year around some of their concerns about the lack of separation of power. So, In conclusion, I want to be very clear. We are asking that the government pay very close attention to this case and to ensure that there will be an independent and fair process to examine the allegations that are being alleged against Mr Pauga and to make sure that this process is not being influenced by political considerations before allowing Mr Pauga's extradition to proceed. Thank you. Senator Scar. Mr Acting Deputy President, I'm delighted to rise this evening to speak about a memorable day I had on 3 November uh, earlier this year attending Staines Memorial College in Red Bank Plains and opening some new facilities, a student amenities block and four primary general learning areas. The coalition government provided $950,000 in funding through the capital grants program. and That's a program where the coalition government supports schools on a needs basis. And This is a school in one of the uh, growing areas in southeast Queensland, the Western Corridor, which is growing at an exponential rate. And this is a school where 31 per cent of the students come from a non-English background. I'm a passionate believer in our system of education where we have both public and private schools and both receive support from the federal government. Staines Memorial College in Red Bank Plains is a non-denominational Christian college and is part of the Christian Community School Ministry School Network. It is a great educational institution and I pay tribute to the whole school community, the Christian Community School Ministry leadership, the teachers, the parents and the students. Its values are relationships, respect and responsibility. Now I'll come back and speak more about my day at the school and all the fun I had on the school on, on 3 November. But first, 
I want to make some comments in relation to the name of the school, the Staines Memorial College. And before attending the school, I did some research with respect to how the school came by, came by its name. The school is named in honour of Mr Graham Staines and his sons Philip and Timothy. Mr Graham Staines had worked in India for 30 years as a missionary. He and his wife Gladys, sons Philip and Timothy and daughter Esther lived in India and helped people suffering from lep leprosy in Orissa province. Graham and his two sons were murdered on 23 January 1999 in the, in the Indian province of Orissa by religious extremists. They were literally burned alive in their car. An awful, awful, evil act. Just awful. On 11 March 1999, in this place, Senator Brian Harradine moved a motion of condolence in relation to Graeme Staines and his sons, Philip and Timothy. After this awful event, Graeme's widow Gladys and daughter Esther kept working in India, helping people suffering from leprosy. They actually kept working in their community, helping people suffering from leprosy. And Gladys Staines received a great uh, honour in receiving one of India's highest civilian honours uh, from the Indian government for her social work helping people with leprosy after her husband and her two sons, Philip and Timoth Timothy, were killed in those tragic circumstances. Just an absolute inspiration. And so on 3 November, I had the honour of attending this school, the Staines Memorial College in Red Bank Plains, to open these new facilities. And as I sometimes do here, I read the run sheet to give you a feel for the nature of the event. So after our arrival, uh, there was an opening prayer by Deputy Adam Marsh, and this was followed by a wonderful rendition of the na national anthem sung, sung by the junior choir of Staines Memorial College. The primary captain, Soraya Okini, and primary captain, Dante Monteforte, then gave a welcome to all the guests. And they spoke tremendously well, tremendously well. I really do congratulate them on their presentations. The then acting principal, Mr Nick Macon, spoke uh, to those who were gathered. And I'm delighted to say that Mr Macon has now been, has now been appointed as permanent principal. And at the time I attended the school, he was waiting to be interviewed for that permanent position. So I'm absolutely delighted. Mr Macon, that uh, through you, Acting Deputy President, that uh, Mr Macon was appointed to that permanent position. There were then some student responses to the Acting Principal's address, and these were absolutely delightful. I was blown away by how articulate these young students were. Sophia Amos from Year 5, Peter Jose Year 5, Abigail Robinson Year 1, and Jasper Orgate. Year one. It was hard to believe that these were year one students. They were articulate, they thought about what they were going to say, and they presented their remarks extremely well. They would not be out of place in this place. We then had the lower primary choir give a rendition of a beautiful music composition called Our Beautiful World. And I note that that was composed by the music teacher, Ms. Naomi Murphy, and written for 2020. A dedication of the buildings was then made by Mr Norton Sands, the executive principal, and Mr Sands afterwards told me how he had walked across the site where the Memorial College is built and that the grass was shoulder high when he first walked through this site and now there's a great school there providing education to over 500 students. Just tremendous. A senator then gave a speech, but you've heard many of those before, so we'll skip straight after that. And there was then a closing prayer from the Deputy Principal, Melissa Colocchio. We then had an opportunity to actually tour the facilities. And it was really then that I gave an appreciation of what a wonderful place this is. And think about it, 31 per cent of the students coming from non-education, non-English speaking background. And there was a great atmosphere in the school. And I'll, I'll make three reflections. First, the standards. I went into the grade five classroom and on the door 
there was this guide to the meaning of words like alliteration and hyperbole. And I was just so impressed that they were learning this. Uh, they didn't have to come into politics or come into the Senate to know about hyperbole. They were learning it in grade five. It's just a tremendous thing. The atmosphere, the students were just so well behaved. They were so polite and courteous and well behaved. It was a credit to all of you. And then I want to talk about the culture of the school and how, in an inclusive manner, they include the parents of some of the students from these non-English speaking backgrounds in the school community. And one of the examples that was given to me is that they celebrate the birthdays of each of the students. And they sat down, the teacher sat down with the mother uh, who came from a non-English speaking background who wasn't sure what she should do in order to celebrate, celebrate the birthday of one of the students. And they came up with the idea that she would cook some cupcakes and she would bring those to the school. And that was a significant event, a significant event for that lady to be included in the school community in that way. So that comes back to those three values I spoke about, which Staines Memorial College is represented by relationships, respect, and responsibility. I pay tribute to the leadership of the school. I pay tribute to the teaching staff and indeed all of the staff. The school has beautiful grounds. I pay tribute to the students and to their parents. And I say to you, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the school community brings honour to the Staines name. They bring honour to Mr Graham Staines and his two sons, who in that tragic incident back in 1999 lost their lives. The two sons, Philip and Timothy, who lost their lives in India in 1999. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The Queensland State Government released their budget today. And because I was raised to find the good in everything, I want to express in my chamber how pleased I am to see the Queensland State Labor Government come to the party and deliver on a commitment to match the federal government's funding of $3.5 million for the establishment of a Queensland Holocaust Museum in Brisbane. I had the pleasure of announcing the federal contribution to that on behalf of Ministers Tien and Frydenberg a few months ago. And it is great news to see the state government come on board in circumstances where both the federal government and the Brisbane City Council team, led by Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner are already such great supporters of this important project for making sure that we educate particularly young Queenslanders about this important and tragic chapter of history to make sure that something so horrific never happens again. But I'm sorry to say that's about where the good news in the Queensland state budget stops. Around about four weeks ago, Queensland went to a state election. And during that election, one that Queenslanders were asked to go to without the benefit of seeing the budget that had been due a few months earlier from Labor, in that campaign, it was promised that the government would borrow $4 billion on top of its already existing $102 billion worth of state debt, and that that was all that would be required to fund their spending and promises and operational commitments. You'd expect that figure to be accurate because, of course, they have access to all of the um, departments and data and um, treasury modelling that's necessary to try and get that pretty close to right. Well, we're four weeks down the road. And that promise has not even lasted that period. How much? How much is it? The extra $4 billion that they promised to borrow in the names of every Queenslander has not blown out twofold. It hasn't blown out threefold. Fourfold. Senator Scar, it has not blown out fourfold. Fivefold. Would you believe, Senator Scar, it has blown out sevenfold? Sevenfold. Twenty-eight billion dollars, not four billion dollars, 
promised just four weeks ago, knowing all of the complications of COVID and the impact that that was having on the economy, particularly in light of border closures. No, just four weeks and their promises, the most important of their promises, broken and out the window. But perhaps the worst part, the knowing that they are borrowing against your children and my children, their future, is knowing that they're not even borrowing to fund anything that lasts. They're not borrowing to build the great infrastructure that will set up the economic recovery of Queensland for the next 50 years. They're not borrowing to build great water projects that will sustain agriculture. They're not borrowing to invest in the growth of regional Queensland to help it reach its potential. No, nope. they are borrowing to pay a public service that has ballooned by 40,000 people since 2015 without delivering any measurable improvement in service delivery. Indeed, you'll be horrified to know, Mr Acting Deputy President, that in some departments, like the Department of Environment, well, they're more cantankerous and ineffective than they have ever been. The public service wage bill in Queensland will now top $26 billion a year. Let that sink in for a moment. They even in Queensland Labor have now abandoned the self-imposed constraint they once announced of capping public service job growth to population growth. Remember that promise, Senator Scar? I remember that promise. One of many. One of many abandoned, broken, left behind. Well, maybe their union bosses told them to do otherwise. Maybe they just gave up on any charade of fiscal responsibility. But it begs an important question. If we have so many public servants, and I tell you, that is one statistic on which Queensland leads the country, why do we still fork out so much for consultants? Because I assure you, that too is a record that Queensland is breaking. Just the Department of Premier and Cabinet alone spent over $5.5 million on consultants last year. They borrowed to pay for millions of dollars of taxpayer-funded pre-election propaganda. They've borrowed to pay for more ministers and assistant ministers than ever before. Do they have anyone who isn't a minister? No, I don't think so. I think everybody gets a prize in this government. It's a bit like going to the fair with your children. Every child gets a prize. And they are overseeing—and this is perhaps the most horrific part—the least productive executive in Queensland's history. Let that sink in for a moment. By every possible measure, by economic output, by unemployment rate, by state GDP, by every possible measure, this is the least productive executive in Queensland's history. The parliament barely sits. Assistant ministers have empty diaries. And estimates has been reduced to a sideshow. Maybe that's what they need. I'd be a fan of that. But Queensland Labor have not aspired in any way to use this record borrowing to return Queensland to the top of the national economic ladder as it is their duty, as Queenslanders expect them to. New South Wales are forecasting unemployment of 5.25 per cent in 2024. Queensland Labor? They're happy for us to keep running last in the country. They've set the underwhelming target of 6.5 per cent. In the 21 to 22 financial year, New South Wales will see revenue growth of 6.7 per cent. Well, Queensland is also happy again to settle, and they really only want to aspire in the Queensland Labor government to 4.7 per cent. The only growth we are assured in Queensland, the only growth, Mr Acting Deputy President, is in the operating deficit. Queenslanders can count on that growing, not by 10 per cent, not by 20 per cent. How much by do you think, Senator Scar? 50 per cent. The operating deficit will grow by 50 per cent in the financial year 20 to 21. It is a succession of great disappointments. 
Queensland Labor refused, flatly refused, to release a budget before the election. Well, now we Queenslanders know why. They went to the election promising to borrow $4 billion and to spend that just on jobs and infrastructure. Well, today we find out what they were really about. They will borrow seven times that amount, $28 billion, but not for more jobs, not for more roads, not for more schools, not for more dams, but just to keep the lights on. And I think that is probably the saddest part of their addiction to waste, their largesse and the economic ineptitude that characterises everything we have come to know and depend day in, day out upon from Queensland Labor. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.